Preface and Introduction of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Preface In the preparation of this volume, the aim in view has been to tell the story of Jesus Christ in a manner that will be attractive to both young and old, to children and their teachers, while the purpose of the writer has been to adapt the narrative to the understanding of a child of ten years, so that he will not need to ask the meaning of a sentence or a word, yet it has also been his desire to make it not childish, but simple, so that older readers may find it interesting and profitable. In order that this book may not lead its younger readers or listeners away from the Bible, but directly toward it, no imaginary scenes or conversations have been introduced. The design has been to write the biography of Jesus, not a romance founded upon his life. The order of events has been carefully considered, and follows that of the best authorities, accepting as historical all the four Gospels and all their contents raising no questions concerning miracles or the relative values of different portions of the record. The first purpose of every student or reader of the Bible, whether young or old, should be to become thoroughly familiar with its contents. Without a full knowledge of the scriptures as they are, he is absolutely unfit to cope with the questions of authorship or the credibility of the sacred writings. No attempt has been made to formulate from the record of Christ's life a doctrinal system. Theology is the loftiest study for the human intellect, but it belongs to the mature mind, not to the realm of childhood. Nor has it been the writer's aim to find in this story moral lessons for the young. The works and words of Jesus will make their own application to their reader, whether they be children or adults. The typography, the illustrations, and the mechanical execution of such a work as this are of almost equal importance with its literary material. All that diligent effort, artistic taste, and abundant resources can do to make this book attractive and helpful to its readers has been done by the publishers. That this volume may awaken a new interest in that life of lives which has brought the light of life to untold millions since it was lived upon the earth. That the children of this generation, who are to become the pillars of the coming years, may learn to love and follow him who is the elder brother and saviour of us all, is the prayer of the author of these pages. August 28, 1915. Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Why Everybody Should Know the Life of Christ. There have been many famous men in this world, and everyone wishes to know who they were and why they are called great. In almost every city in America may be seen a statue of George Washington, or Abraham Lincoln, or Benjamin Franklin, or General Lee, or General Grant. Whenever you see one of these statues, you ask, if you do not know already, who this man was, and why his statue has been set up. In Canada, every house has on the wall a portrait of the great and good Queen Victoria, and when a child sees it, he wishes to know something of her life and her greatness. You see pictures of man standing on the deck of a ship, or going ashore under palm trees on an island, and are told that he is Christopher Columbus, and every child in America knows something of his story. Men like Napoleon Bonaparte, and Julius Caesar, and Alexander the Great, are written about and talked about, and every child should know who these men were and why they are famous. Did you ever think that there is one man who has been talked about, and written about, and sung about, more than any other man in all the world, and that man is Jesus? For one book telling of Washington, or Napoleon, or Columbus, there are hundreds of books telling of Jesus. Every year, at least 15 million copies of the Bible are printed and sent out into the world, in every language spoken on this earth. Why does everybody wish to have a Bible in his house? It is because that book tells of Jesus. If the pages that tell of Jesus should be torn out of the Bible, few people would care to have it or to read it. There are more portraits of Jesus Christ, painted and drawn and printed, than of any other man who has ever lived. Everybody knows the picture of Jesus as soon as he sees it, whether it be of the baby Jesus in his mother's arms, or the boy Jesus in the temple, or the Savior teaching, or dying upon the cross. You do not need to be told which one in any picture is Jesus. 
His face is so well known that you know it at once. No other face among all the men who have ever lived, from Adam the first man, down to today, is known to as many people as the face of Jesus. Then, too, look in the hymn books of the churches and the song books of the Sunday schools, and see how many of the hymns and songs are in praise of Jesus Christ. You do not find songs in praise of Julius Caesar, nor of Christopher Columbus, nor even of George Washington. No one who gives it thought doubts that the most famous man in all the world is Jesus Christ. And because he is so famous and so great, everyone should know something of his life. Then, too, everybody likes to hear stories of wonderful things. Even though we know that they are not true stories, everyone listens to fairy tales and the stories of the Arabian Nights. But how often, when the story is ended, the child looks up to the storyteller's face and says, Is it all true? Now the story of Jesus is full of wonders. You read of his turning water into wine when the guests at the feast needed it, of his touching the eyes of a blind man and giving him sight, of his speaking to the storm and bringing peace, of his walking upon the waters in another storm to help his friends in danger, and most wonderful of all, of his coming out of his own tomb living after he had died. Wonderful indeed are the stories told of Jesus, and the greatest wonder is that they are all true. You would like to hear those stories, I am sure, and every child should know them and be able to tell them to others. Let me give you another reason why everyone should know the story of Jesus. He came to show us who God is, what God is to us, and how God feels toward us. Everyone, even every child, thinks of God and in his heart wishes to know about God. How terribly some people have mistaken God, they have thought of him as an enemy, not as a friend. You can see in some countries images of a person with forty arms, and on every hand something to kill a man with, a sword, a spear, an arrow, a club, a cup of poison, or some other fearful thing. And that is the thought of God in that land, a mighty being who hates men. In old times, many people thought that their gods were pleased when men killed their own children and burned their bodies on an altar as an offering to God. God saw all over the earth that men had wrong and cruel thoughts of him, and he sent his son Jesus Christ to teach men by his words, and to show men in his life what God is, how God feels toward us, and how we should feel toward God. If Jesus had done no more for us than to teach us the Lord's Prayer, beginning with the words, Our Father who art in heaven, he would have done enough to make us love him. He showed people that God is their Father, the Father of everyone in all the world, and that as a father we may call upon him, just as any child can go to his father for whatever he needs. There was once an artist who was called upon to paint the portrait of a good man, but the man had died ten years before. The artist had never seen him, and there was no picture of him to be used as a copy. At first the artist did not know what to do. Then a thought occurred to him. Is there no one, he said, who looks like this man, so that I can see him? and know something of the man's face? Why, yes, they answered. He has left a son, a man grown, who looks exactly like his father. The artist studied the face of the son, and from it painted a likeness of the father, whom he had never seen. No one has ever seen God, but if we would know not his face, which we cannot know, but his nature, how kind and loving and helpful and willing God is, we have only to think of Christ. And if we know Christ, the Son of God, we know God, his Father and our Father. For this reason, because in Jesus we may know God, everybody should know about Jesus. But Jesus came to this world not only to show us what God is, but to show us what we should be and how we should live. Whatever his work may be, everyone needs a copy which he can look at and follow. The child who is learning to write must have a copy so that he may know how to shape his letters. The boy or girl learning to draw has a copy or a model to guide him in his drawing. When a man is about to build a ship, he first makes a model, and then shapes his great ship exactly like it. Perhaps you have heard the lines in Longfellow's poem, The Building of the Ship. In the shipyard stood the master with the model of the vessel that should laugh at all disaster and with wave and whirlwind wrestle. Well, we are all builders. Each one of us, 
boy or girl, man or woman, is building for himself what no one else can build for him, his character, what he is to be, whether good or bad, whether wise or ignorant, whether noble or selfish. And in building up ourselves we need a model, one perfect man, on whom we can look and whose life we can copy. That model we can find in Jesus. He lived our life, and in living showed us how we should live. Even a little child may say, Jesus was once a little child, and I will try my best to be just such a child as he was. A boy of twelve may think of Jesus as a boy, and resolve to live as Jesus lived. The young man working in a shop or office or in the field may take Jesus the working man for his pattern. When Jesus was on the earth, he said many times, and to different people, Follow me. He says it to every one of us. But if we are to follow Jesus and to be like him, the best man that ever lived, we must study him, must know about his life, must have every story of him in our mind and in our heart. And that is another reason why everyone should know the story of Jesus. It is now almost two thousand years since Jesus lived on the earth and walked among men. Since he came, the world has become a different world, just as far as they have heard the story of Jesus and have learned to follow him. People have become less selfish and more thoughtful of others, more willing to help others, more generous in giving to others. Think of all the homes for the poor, of all the hospitals for the sick, of all the places where little children are cared for, of the playgrounds, of the love shown at Christmas time of ten thousand ways in which the world is better. And then remember that all these good things come from Jesus Christ and his love in the hearts of men. But for Jesus this would have been a dark world. The proof of this is that these good things are to be seen only in the lands where Jesus is known and loved and followed. Look at the lands where Christ is unknown, and you find them dark and sad. There is still much to be done to make this a perfect world, we see terrible wars, and the poor still suffering wrong, and many people still selfish and cruel to their fellow men. What can we do to make this a better and a brighter world? We can do as Jesus did. It was said of him, he went about doing good, and that may be said of us if we will follow Christ. But to make this world good, we must know him who is its power for goodness. And that is another reason why everyone should know the story of Jesus. Let me name only one reason more why we should know the story of Jesus. Through him we have what we need most of all, the forgiveness of our sins. Suppose that someone who watches us all the time should keep a list of every wrongdoing, of every fiery temper, of every angry word, of every blow struck, of every time that one of us failed to do what is right, of every time that one let pass a chance to do some good act to another. What a long list it would be. There is such a list kept. An eye that never sleeps sees every act, the eye of God. And he remembers all our deeds, and the things left undone which we ought to have done. Is there any way to have that list against us taken away, blotted out, and forgotten? Yes, there is one who can take our sins away, and make the black story of our life as white as snow. That one is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He can forgive our sins as he forgave the sins of men while he was on the earth, and he longs to have us ask him for forgiveness. Should we not love him for this? And should we not wish to hear about him and to know all the tender story of his love? These, then, are some of the reasons why we should all seek to know the story of Jesus because he is the greatest and most famous man that ever lived, because his story is full of interest and full of wonders, and is true, because he came to show us how kind and loving God is, and how willing to have us call upon him, because his life shows us a pattern of what we may be, and tells us how we may be like him, because Jesus has made and is still making the world better and brighter and happier wherever he is known, and best of all, because through Jesus our Saviour our sins may be forgiven and taken away, and we may be pure and holy, as Jesus was upon the earth. With these thoughts and aims, this story of Jesus has been written. May it help many, young and old, to know Jesus better, to love him more, and to follow him more closely. 
End of Preface and Introduction Chapter One of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lord's Land, Chapter One. First of all, let us take a journey to the land where Jesus lived. We will sail in one of the big ocean steamers across the Atlantic heading our prow a little to the south, and in eight days we'll pause at the Rock of Gibraltar, which stands on guard at the gate of the Mediterranean Sea. Do you know what Mediterranean means? It means among the lands. And when you look at the sea on the map, you see that it has lands around it on every side, with only a narrow opening at Gibraltar, where its blue waters pour into the Atlantic Ocean. We will enter the Mediterranean Sea and sell its entire length, past Spain and France and Italy on the left. We just miss touching the toe of Italy, for you know Italy runs into the sea like a great leg with a high-heeled boot upon its foot. And just beyond Italy we sail by Greece, which looks somewhat like a hand with fingers wide apart. While we are passing by these lands on the left, we are also sailing past Morocco and Algiers and Tunis and Tripoli on the right. We stop at Alexandria in Egypt, at one of the mouths of the River Nile, and soon after we leave the big steamer at Port Said, where the Great Suez Canal begins. There in the afternoon, about ten days after our leaving America, we go on board a smaller ship and sail northward past the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, the next morning we awake to find our ship at anchor in front of a city on a hillside, rising up in terraces from the water. That city is now called Jaffa, or Yaffa, and it is the place where the steamer stopped to send ashore those who are about to visit the Holy Land, for that is the name given to the land where Jesus lived. Do you remember the Old Testament, the story of Jonah, the prophet who tried to run away from God's call to preach in the city of Nineveh? Well, it was from this city called Jaffa, then called Joppa, that Jonah started on his voyage, which ended inside the big fish. Perhaps you remember also the story of Dorcas in the New Testament, that good woman who helped the poor, and after dying was raised to life through the prayer of the Apostle Peter. Dorcas, too, lived at Joppa, and they show the house where, it is said, Peter stayed while he was visiting in that city. Here at Jaffa, or Joppa, we end our long sea voyage of about 6,000 miles. We go ashore in a small boat, tossing up and down on the waves, for there is no wharf where a steamer can land its passengers. And now we are standing on the soil of the Holy Land, where Jesus lived. In Christ's time, this land was called Judea. In our day, its name is Palestine. It is a small country. If you will turn to the map of the United States and look at New Hampshire, you will see a state in form quite like Palestine, and only a little smaller in size. For Palestine, or the Holy Land, contains about 12,000 square miles, and New Hampshire a little more than 9,000. From Joppa we must go across Palestine if we look at the part of the land among the mountains where Jesus lived. We can now ride in a railroad train, something that Jesus never saw while he lived on the earth, or we can go in a carriage or on a horse or on the back of a camel, as you will see some people riding, or in what they call a palanquin, which is something like a coach body set not on wheels, but between two pair of shafts, one in front, the other behind, and a mule harnessed in each pair so that the rider has one mule in front and the other back of him. As we ride over the land, we notice that at first it is very level. This part of the country is called the Seacoast Plain, and a plain it surely is, almost as level as a floor. All around you see gardens and farms, orange trees and fig trees. If you could pluck one of these golden oranges and taste it, you would find that it is one of the sweetest and richest and juiciest that you have ever eaten, for the Jaffa oranges are famous for their flavor. You ride between great fields of wheat and rye and barley, for this seacoast plain is a rich farming land. But after a few miles, 10 or 15, 
we notice that we have left the plain and are winding and climbing among hills. In place of the farmlands, we see here and there flocks of sheep, with shepherds guarding them just as the boy David watched over his flock 3,000 years ago. Indeed, in our journey we might pass over the very brook where David found the round, smooth stones, one of which he hurled with a sling into the giant Goliath's forehead. This is the region of low hills, the foothills of the higher mountains beyond. It is called the Chapella, a name not easy to remember. In the Old Testament days, many battles were fought on these hills between the Israelites and the Philistines, their fierce enemies. These foothills of the Chapella are not many miles wide, and beyond them we come to the real mountain region of Palestine. Mountains rise on every hand, bare, stony, with scarcely any soil upon their steep sides, and with not a tree to be seen for miles. They are rocky crags, with here and there a village perched on their summits or clinging to their walls. This mountain land, more than the hills and plains below, was the home of the Israelites, the people from whom Jesus came. We wonder how they could ever have found a living in such a desolate land. But everywhere we see the ruins of old cities, showing that once the land was filled with people. In those times, 2,000 or more years ago, all these mountainsides, now bleak and rock-bound, were covered with terraces where grew olive trees, fig trees, and vineyards, where gardens blossomed and great crops were raised to feed the people. Even now in the spring and early summer, the valleys between these mountains are covered with flowers of every color. Scarcely another land on earth has as many wild flowers as this land of Palestine. This mountain belt running from the north to the south throughout the land was the part of Palestine where nearly all the great men of Israel lived and died. Here among the mountains in the south is Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. In a mountain village in the north, Nazareth, was the home of Jesus during nearly all his life. And over these mountains everywhere in the land, Jesus walked in the three years of his preaching and teaching. We pass over these mountains from east to west, and then from the heights we look down to a valley which runs north and south, the deepest in all the world where we can see a little river with many windings and rapids and falls, rolling onward to drop at last into a blue lake in the south. This river, as you know, is the Jordan, crossed by the Israelites when they first came to this land, the river where Naam and washed away his leprosy, where Elijah struck the waves with his mantle and parted them, and in whose water Jesus was baptized. We journey across this Jordan Valley from 10 to 20 miles wide, and then we climb again high and steep mountains. This region is called the Eastern Tableland because the mountains gradually sink down to a great desert plain on the east. Here we see the ruins of once great cities, where now only a few wandering Arabs pitch their tents. We have now crossed the land of Palestine, and we have found that it contains five parts lying in a line. First, the seacoast plain. Second, the chapella or foothills. Third, the mountain region. Fourth, the Jordan Valley. And fifth, the eastern tableland. But we must keep in mind that the land when Jesus lived there was very different from the land as we see it. Now it is a poor land, then it was rich. Now its villages are made of miserable mud houses, where live people who look half starved. Then it was a land of well built towns and happy people. Now we find roads that are mere tracks over the stones. Then there were good roads everywhere. Now the hills rise bare and rocky. Then they were covered with gardens. Now scarcely a tree can be seen in miles of travel. Then the olive and the vine and the palm grew everywhere. We see the land in its ruin. Jesus saw it in its riches. End of chapter Chapter 2 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cy Young, Jr. 
Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old, Chapter 2, The People in the Lord's Land. Nearly all the people living in Palestine in the time of Jesus were of the Jewish race. Two thousand years before Jesus came, a great man was living in that land named Abraham. To this man, God gave a promise that his children and their children after them for many ages should live in that land and own it. Abraham's son was named Isaac, and Isaac's son was named Jacob. All the people of Palestine had sprung from the family of Jacob, and by the time Jesus came, these descendants of Jacob, as they were called, were in number many millions and were to be found in other lands besides Palestine, although more of them lived in Palestine than in any other land. Jacob, Abraham's grandson, was also named Israel, and on that account, all the people sprung from him were called the Israelites. Jacob, or Israel, had twelve sons, from whom came the twelve tribes of Israel. But one son, named Judah, had more descendants or people springing from him than any other. And as most of the people in Palestine were of Judah's family, all of them were spoken of as Jews, a word which means sprung or descended from Judah. So the people to whom Jesus belonged were sometimes called Israelites, but more often Jews. They had another name, Hebrews, but that was not used as often as the two names Israelites and Jews. For many years, long before Jesus came, the Jews were rulers in the land of Palestine with kings of their own race as David and Solomon in the early times and King Jeroboam and King Hezekiah later. But in the time of Jesus, the Jews were no longer rulers in their own land. Palestine was then a small part of the vast Roman Empire which ruled all the lands around the Mediterranean Sea. Its chief was an emperor who lived in Rome in Italy. At the time when Jesus was born, the emperor was Augustus. He was then an old man and died very soon after the birth of Jesus. The emperor who followed him was named Tiberius, and he ruled most of the years that Jesus was living in Palestine. But there was another king ruling the land of Palestine under the Roman emperor at the time when Jesus came. His name was Herod, and because he was a very wise and strong man, although a very wicked man, he was called Herod the Great. He ruled the land of Palestine, but in his turn obeyed the orders of the Emperor Augustus at Rome. Herod also was a very old man at the time of Jesus' birth and died soon afterward. When Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four parts. Each of these parts had a king of its own, and three of these kings were Herod's sons. Herod Antipas ruled over Galilee in the northwest and Perea in the southeast. Herod Philip was over the country in the northeast, and Herod Archelaus ruled the largest portion in the south. None of these little kings were good men. They had their father's wickedness, but did not have his ability to rule. One of them, Archelaus, was so bad that all the people asked the emperor at Rome to take his rule away. This the emperor did, and sent a man from Rome to govern the land in his place. You have heard of the Roman governor who was over this part of the land while Jesus was teaching. His name was Pontius Pilate, and he it was, you remember, who sent Jesus to die upon the cross. The land of Palestine at that time was divided into five parts, which were called provinces. The largest of these provinces was Judea, the one on the south, between the Dead Sea and the River Jordan on the east, and the Mediterranean Sea on the west. North of Judea was a small province called Samaria, where lived a people who were not Jews, but Samaritans. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans, in turn, hated the Jews. Samaria was governed as a part of Judea, not with a separate ruler. These were the two provinces at first under Archelaus, and then under the Roman governor. In the north of Palestine, west of the River Jordan and the Sea of Galilee, was the province of Galilee, a country full of mountains where Jesus dwelt for nearly all his life. The ruler of this province was Herod Antipas. He lived most of the time at a city which he had built beside the Sea of Galilee and had named Tiberias 
after the Roman Emperor Tiberius. Across the Jordan on the east, opposite to Galilee, was another province. In the Old Testament times, this land had been called Bashan, which means woodland, because it was a land of many forests. In the New Testament time, it was generally spoken of as Philip's province, because his ruler was Herod Philip, the best of Herod's sons, and none too good either. South of Philip's province and east of the River Jordan was a province named Perea, a word meaning beyond, because this region was beyond or across the River Jordan. At the time of Jesus' life, Perea was like Galilee, ruled by Herod Antipas. Once, at least, Jesus visited this province, and here he told the parable of the prodigal son, which everybody has heard. Although the mighty Roman Empire gave to the Jews in Palestine a government that was just and fair, it was not a Jewish rule, and the Jews were not contented under the power of foreigners. They felt that they, more than other nations, were the people of God, and that they had a right to rule themselves under kings of their own race. Also, they read in their Bible the promises of the prophets that from Israel should come forth a king out of David's line who should rule the world. This great king, whom the Jews hoped for and looked for, they called Messiah, a word in the Jews' language meaning the same as the word Christ, which is a Greek word meaning the anointed one, that is, the king. You remember that in the Old Testament story, the prophet Samuel anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel. That is, he poured oil on his head. And that afterward, he chose the boy David to be the next king by the same sign. When we say Jesus Christ, Jesus is his name and Christ is his title. And we mean Jesus the king. We know that this promised king, whom the Jews call Messiah, was Jesus Christ, who rules over the hearts of men everywhere. But the Jews thought that it meant a king like Herod or the Emperor Tiberius, only better and wiser, who should live in a palace at Jerusalem, their chief city, and make all lands obey his will. This hope made the Jews very restless and unhappy under the Roman power. They were always looking for the coming of this mighty king of the Jews, who should lead them to conquer the earth. In their worship, the Jews were different from all the rest of the world. Every other people had gods of wood and stone, images before which they bowed and to which they gave offerings. In all the cities of that world were temples and altars to these idols made by the hands of men. But in the land of the Jews were no images, no idol temples, and no offerings to man-made gods. The Jews, whether in Palestine or in other lands, Worship the one God who was unseen, the God to whom we also pray. In their chief city, Jerusalem, was a splendid temple where God was worshipped. And in every Jewish city and town were churches where the people met to read the Bible, to sing the Psalms of David, to offer prayer to God, and to talk together about God's laws. These churches were called synagogues, and wherever Jews lived, synagogues were to be found. The Jews looked with great contempt upon the idol worship of other nations and were proud of the fact that ever since the days of their father Abraham, they had worshiped only the Lord God. End of chapter two, recording by Cy Young, Jr. Chapter three of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cy Young, Jr. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old, Chapter 3, The Stranger by the Golden Altar. In the land of Palestine, one city was loved by the Jews above all other places, that was Jerusalem, the largest city in the land, in the province of Judea. It was to the Jews everywhere, not only in Palestine, but over all the earth, wherever Jews lived, the holy city. 
From all parts of the land, the people came at least once in every year, and many families three times each year, to worship God in Jerusalem. At these great feasts, as they were called, all the roads leading to Jerusalem were thronged with travelers going up to Jerusalem for worship. And the Jews in other lands, many hundreds of miles away, even as far as Rome itself, tried at least once in their lives to visit the city. They sang about Jerusalem songs such as, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I remember thee not. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. That which made Jerusalem a holy city was its temple, a magnificent building on Mount Moriah, just across the valley from Mount Zion, where the larger part of the city stood. The temple they called the House of God, for in it the Jews believed their God made his home. In front of this temple stood an altar which was like a great box made of stone, hollow inside, and covered with a metal grating. Upon this altar a fire was kept burning night and day, and on the fire the priests, who led in the worship of God, laid offerings of sheep and oxen, which were burned as gifts to God. While around the altar the people stood and prayed to God as the offering, which they called a sacrifice, was burning. Inside the temple building were two rooms. The room in front was called the Holy Place, and in it stood, on one side, a table covered with gold, on which lay twelve loaves of bread as an offering to God, one loaf for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. On the other side of the room stood a golden lampstand with seven branches called the golden candlestick. At the farther end of the room stood another altar made of gold, smaller than the great altar in front of the temple. On this golden altar the priest offered, twice each day, a bowl of incense, which was made by mixing some sweet-smelling gums, frankincense and myrrh, and burning them so that they formed a fragrant white cloud, filling the holy place. Beyond the holy place was another room called the Holy of Holies. Into this room no one entered except the high priest, and he on only one day in the year. For this inner room was set apart for the dwelling place of God, and the Jews believed that in this room the light of God was shining so brightly that no one could endure it. In the first temple built by King Solomon, the Ark of the Covenant stood in the Holy of Holies. This was a chest covered with gold, within which lay the two stone tables on which the Ten Commandments were written. But the Ark of the Covenant had been lost, and in the time of which we are speaking, nothing was in the Holy of Holies except a block of marble. One day an old priest named Zacharias was offering incense upon the golden altar in the holy place. He had filled the bowl, which they called a censer, with the frankincense and myrrh, and had placed in it some coals of fire from the great altar in front of the temple. He had come into the holy place, bringing his censer of incense, which sent its white cloud into the air, and was just about to lay it upon the altar when he was startled at suddenly seeing someone standing by the golden altar on the right side. Zacharias was surprised to see anyone in the room, for he knew that no one but himself had a right to be there. But he was still more surprised and filled with fear when he looked at this stranger standing by the altar. He seemed like a young man, and his face and body and clothes were bright and shining like the sun, so glorious that the old priest could not bear to look upon him. At once Zacharias knew that this glorious person was an angel sent from God. He trembled with fear. His knees shook, and he could scarcely keep from falling on the floor. The angel spoke to him gently and kindly. Zacharias, do not be frightened. You have nothing to fear. I have come to you with good news. God has heard the prayers that you and your good wife Elizabeth have been sending up to heaven for these many years. You shall have a son and shall call his name John. Your son, when he becomes a man, will bring joy and gladness to many people, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And it shall be his work to make his people ready for the coming of the King, for whom they have been looking so long. 
You must see that your son never drinks any wine or strong drink, for he is to be set apart for God, to serve God only, and to speak the word of God to the people, telling them that their king and savior is at hand. The priest was so filled with surprise and fear that he could scarcely believe what he heard. How can these wonderful words be true, he said. I am an old man, and my wife is also old. We are too old now to have children. How can I believe all this? The angel was not pleased when he saw that Zacharias doubted his word, and he said, I am the angel Gabriel that stands before God, and I have been sent from God to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Now, because you did not believe God's word, you shall be stricken dumb and shall not be able to speak until my words come true and your child is born. And then the angel vanished out of sight as suddenly as he had come, and Zacharias was left alone. All this time a great crowd of people was standing outside the temple, worshiping God, while the offering was made. They wondered that Zacharias was waiting so long in the temple, and they wondered more when he came out and they found that he could not speak. He made signs to them trying to show them he had seen an angel, but he did not tell them what the angel had said, for that was meant for himself only and not for others. Each priest stayed for one week in the temple and then went to his house. So after a few days, Zacharias left Jerusalem and returned to his house in the southern part of the land, not far from the old city of Hebron, the place where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the early fathers of the Israelites, were buried. How happy Elizabeth was when her husband, by signs and by writing, told her of the angel in his promise that she should be the mother of one who was to bear the word of the Lord to the people. Such men to whom God spoke and who spoke for God were called prophets. Many great prophets in past years had spoken the word of God to the Israelites, men like Samuel and Elijah and Isaiah. But more than 400 years had passed away since the voice of a prophet had been heard in the land. Their promised son was to rise up and speak once more God's will to his people. Zacharias and Elizabeth might not live long enough to hear his voice as a prophet, but they had God's promise, and in that promise they were happy waiting for their child to come and grow up to his great work. End of chapter 3, recording by Cy Young, Jr. Chapter 4 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old By Jesse Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 4 The Angel Visits Nazareth For our next story, we visit Nazareth, a village in Galilee nearly seventy miles north of Jerusalem. Galilee, as we have seen, was the northern province or division of the land, lying between the River Jordan and the Great Sea. The lower part of Galilee is a great plain, called the Plain of Estralon, or the Plain of Jezreel, where many battles have been fought in past times. The upper part of Galilee is everywhere mountains and valleys, with villages perched on the mountain tops or clinging to their sides, and sometimes nestled in the valleys. Just where the plain ends and the mountains begin, we find a long range of steep hills. If we climb to the top of this range, on one side we see the plain stretched out, and far in the distance the Mediterranean Sea, and on the other, or northern slope of the hills, we come to the city of Nazareth, there the mother of Jesus lived as a young girl before her son was born, and there Jesus lived during most of his life. Nazareth is there still, although many of the old towns in that land have passed away, and now it is quite a city, but in the time of which we are telling it was only a village. All around it are hills. One can stand in the town and count fifteen hills and mountains all in sight. 
its narrow streets climbed the hills between rows of one-story white houses many of them having a little dome on the roof around each roof in those times of which we are telling was a rail with posts on the corners to prevent any one on the roof from falling off for the flat roof was used as a place of visiting and of rest since the house inside was dark having no glass windows but instead only one small hole in the wall none of these houses had a door opening upon the street beside the road was a high wall and in it a gate leading to an open court at one end of which stood the house in the village was one fountain to which all the women went for water there were no wells or pumps or pipes with water in the houses and around the fountain might be seen in the morning a crowd of women bringing water jars empty and carrying them home full of water balanced on their heads no one often saw a man carrying a jar of water for this was looked upon as a woman's work in one of those small white houses of nazareth lived a young jewish girl named mary we do not know how she looked for although many artists have made pictures of her all have drawn or painted her as they imagined her to be not as she was all that we really know of mary we read in two of the four gospels matthew and luke and neither of these tell us anything about her early life or her family it has been said that her father's name was Joachim, and her mother's name was anna but this is not found in either of the gospels and we do not know whether it is true we do know however that she was a pure-hearted lovely girl who served the god of israel with all her heart and lived a holy life she knew her bible well we are sure for its words came readily to her lips and she was a girl who thought much and talked but little in those years she might have been seen often going with the other girls of the village to the fountain for water or sitting in the women's gallery in the church listening thoughtfully to the reading from the bible and with her rich young voice joining in the chanting of david's psalms in that land girls are promised in marriage while very young and mary was at this time promised to be married to a man named joseph who was a carpenter or as he is called in the gospels a worker in wood the two families joseph's and mary's were not rich they belonged to the working class of people but they were not like many wretchedly poor they were just plain honest working people able to earn a comfortable living although joseph and mary were of the common people they came from the noblest blood in all the land both were sprung from the royal line of david the greatest of the kings of israel and the singer of many beautiful psalms they lived in little one-room houses and their hands were hard from work but they could trace their line back to the palace where david the founder of their family dwelt on one day mary was alone it may have been in her own little home or upon its roof where she often went for prayer or perhaps under a tree on the hillside near the village just as zacharias a few months before had seen a heavenly gloriously shining being in the temple so now mary beheld the same angel gabriel suddenly beaming upon her in a sweet voice he said peace be with you mary you are in high favor and love for the lord is with you the voice was gentle but the sight of the shining form filled the young girl with alarm she knew not what to think nor why this glorious being had come to her but after a moment the angel went on speaking and said do not be afraid mary for god has chosen you among all women for his special favor you shall have a son and you shall give him the name jesus because he shall save his people from their sins he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest god god shall give to him the throne and the kingdom of his father david he shall reign forever over the people of israel and of his kingdom there shall be no end the angel paused and mary found words to speak tremblingly and with fear how can all this come to me i do not understand what it all means 
then the angel spoke again to the troubled and frightened girl the holy spirit of god shall come to you and the power of god shall be upon you and therefore that holy child that is to be given you shall be called the son of god also let me tell you that your cousin elizabeth is soon to have a son in her old age this may seem strange to you but no word of god is without power every promise of god shall surely come to pass then mary said i am the lord's servant and i can trust him let it be to me as you have spoken i will rest without fear in the will of the lord then as suddenly as he had come the angel vanished out of sight and mary was left alone she was filled with wonder at what she had seen and heard any young jewish girl to whom came the news that the words of the prophets in the bible were now to come true that the long-promised king of israel was soon to be born and that she would be his mother would be amazed and perhaps alarmed at the message some girls would have talked about it and might even be proud at such an expectation but mary's was a quiet nature not apt to speak of her deepest thoughts she felt in some way that there was no one in her home or in her village with whom she could speak of these things she hid them silently in her heart but thought about them day and night End of chapter four recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter five of hurlbut's life of christ for young and old this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 5 A Young Girl's Journey. After the visit of the angel and the message which he had brought, Mary's mind was filled with many thoughts and her heart was full. She was only a young girl not older than sixteen years perhaps as young as fifteen for if she were older she should have been already married in that land nearly all young women are married as soon as they are sixteen years old and very few stay unmarried mary felt that she must talk with somebody of all these wonderful things that had been spoken to her we would think that her mother was the one with whom she could open her heart most freely but we are not sure that her mother was living and is it not true that a young girl can sometimes tell to a dear grandmother or some other old lady who is her friend the deep things of the heart that she may hesitate to mention even to her own mother she thought of one who was not her grandmother but who from her age and sweetness seemed like one her mind turned to elizabeth living far away in the south the angel you know had told her that elizabeth was also to have a child and perhaps she would be able to understand mary's feelings better than any other woman elizabeth was related to mary she is named in the gospel of st luke as mary's cousin though very likely they were not near but distant relatives mary knew that she was wise and good that she loved her and being old could give her advice mary made up her mind to visit elizabeth and open her heart with her fully about what the angel had spoken to her from nazareth to elizabeth's house was a long distance in a straight line more than eighty miles but much farther by the road which travellers from galilee generally followed in going from the north to the south of the land very soon after the angel's visit mary left her home and began her journey southward of course a young girl could not take a journey so long alone but there were always caravans or parties going from galilee to jerusalem and mary would travel with one of those companies a soldier would ride on a horse a general in his chariot 
and an Arab on his camel. But most men in those times walked, even on long journeys. A woman would ride on an ass, which was the animal preferred by the Jews for travel. We may think of Mary with a beating heart, leaving her home in Nazareth, in company with a caravan or party of people journeying to Jerusalem to attend one of the great feasts held every year in that city. Their most direct way would be over the mountains, but it would be rough and stony, up one mountain, down another, and around a third mountain, nearly all the way. Besides, this way would lead them through the country of the Samaritans, which lay between Galilee and Judea, and such was the hatred between Jews and Samaritans, that it was scarcely safe for a company of Jews to go through their land. A large company would need to stop by night at some inn, and the Samaritans often shut their inns against those who were going to Jerusalem. The line of travel from Nazareth would be to go over the steep hill on the south of their village, and follow a well-trodden way eastward down to the river Jordan. There they would find a very good road built by the Romans, straight down the Jordan Valley, with mountains on either side. This they would follow about sixty miles, until they came to Jericho. There they might rest for a few days, and then climb the steep path up the mountains to Jerusalem. This Jericho road was a hiding place for robbers, and it was never safe for anyone to travel it alone. But in a large company, with many men, and often a guard of soldiers, the travelers need not fear. They would easily reach Jerusalem in a week or ten days after leaving Nazareth, and might make the journey in five days if they were in haste. In Jerusalem, Mary would visit with some friend. All the families in the land had friends in Jerusalem, with whom they stayed while attending the great feasts, of which three were held each year. And the dwellers in Jerusalem opened their houses to the same families year after year. After the feast, Mary would find another caravan or party going home to Hebron, and the villages near it, and she would travel the rest of her journey, about twenty miles, with this party. Altogether, Mary's journey from Nazareth to Hebron was nearly one hundred and twenty miles long. Although many people were with her all the way, she was alone in spirit, for she could speak to no one of the great thoughts which burdened her mind and her heart. At last, her long journey was over. She stopped at the door of the house of Zacharias, and in a moment was clasped in the arms of Elizabeth. In some strange way, God had given to Elizabeth to know all that had come to Mary. In a loud voice she said, Blessed, most blessed are you among women, and blessed among men shall be the son born to you. High indeed is the honor mine today, when the mother of my Lord comes to my home. Blessed is she that believed the angel's word, for that word shall surely come true. In that moment, Mary's feelings, long held in, broke out in song. For this young woman's soul was not only pure and tender and devout, it was the soul of a poet whose thoughts shaped themselves into verse. Mary spoke and sung a song, which has become famous. Someone wrote it down, and St. Luke, who wrote the Gospel, found a copy of it and gave it to the world. Everyone should read it. We give it here. Mary's Song My soul beholds the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath looked upon his servant in my lowly state, and from this time people in all ages shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the vain thoughts of their heart. He hath put down princes from their thrones, and hath lifted up those of humble state. The hungry he hath filled with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath given help to Israel his servant, that he might remember mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, toward Abraham and his children forever. 
For three months Mary stayed with Elizabeth in that quiet home. The old woman and the young woman, both soon to be mothers, talked together day after day. Perhaps by this time people were going to another feast in Jerusalem, and Mary found again a party of pilgrims, for that was the name that they gave to people going to Jerusalem to worship, who were returning to Galilee. She went home, comforted in spirit, and made strong by her visit with Elizabeth. It was either while Mary was visiting with Elizabeth, or soon after her return to her home, that Joseph, her promised husband, began to question in his mind whether he ought to marry her. There was a strange look in her face, and he saw that she had thoughts in her mind of which she could not speak to him. He loved her deeply, and it was with sorrow that he asked himself whether they would be happy together. But one night, while he was sleeping, a dream came to Joseph. In his dream he saw an angel standing by his side. The angel said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary for your wife. She shall have a son, and his name shall be Jesus, for it is he that shall save his people from their sins. The word Jesus in the language of that people means Savior, and often Jesus is spoken of as our Savior, because he came to take away our sins. After this message, Joseph hesitated no longer. He did as the angel had bidden him. He was married to Mary, and led her to his own home, in which was also the shop where he followed his trade as a carpenter. End of chapter 5 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 6 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jane Manning. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. Chapter 6. THE BOY WHO NEVER TASTED WINE Not long after Mary's visit, the child promised to Zacharias and Elizabeth was born. In Jewish families, the coming of a child into the home was always the cause of great gladness, and the gladness was greater at the birth of this baby because this was the first child, and the father and mother were old. All the friends of Zacharias and Elizabeth came to see them and to rejoice with them over the boy whom God had given them. He must be named Zacharias after his father, said the visitors. Not so, answered the mother. He shall be named John. Why should you give him that name, they said. None of your family has ever been called John. But Elizabeth insisted that her boy should bear the name John. You remember that Zacharias had been stricken dumb at the time when the angel spoke to him in the temple. In all the months since, he had not spoken a word, nor could he hear what was said. For now they made signs to ask him what should be the child's name. They brought him a writing table, and on it he wrote, his name is John. So that was the name of this child of promise, just as the angel Gabriel had said. You may ask, what was a writing table? In those times, paper was very scarce and high in its cost. It was used only for writing down matters that were important. For common uses, each family had a writing table, which was a board over which was spread a thin layer of wax. On this wax, they marked what they wished to write with a sharp-pointed pen of iron or steel. This kind of a pen was called a stylus. The other end of the pen was flat, like an ivory paper cutter. After writing, they could smooth it all out again 
and the wax was then ready to be used once more. Just as soon as Zacharias had written the words, His name is John, the power to hear and to speak came back to him. He began to praise God in a loud voice and gave forth a song of rejoicing. This song was afterward written and may be read in the Gospel by St. Luke near the end of the first chapter. In this song, Zacharias gave thanks to God for having blessed his people and kept the promises that had been made in God's name by all the prophets of old time. The prophets, as you may know, were the good men who listened to God's words and then gave them to the people, speaking with God's power and sometimes telling long before the time of great events that were to take place. They were men like Moses, who saw God face to face, and Samuel, the wise ruler, and Elijah, the prophet of fire, and Isaiah, who declared Christ's coming long before his day. In the Old Testament times, there was always a prophet to tell the people the will of God. But since the Old Testament had been finished almost 500 years before this time, no prophet had stood up in Israel with the word of the Lord. Zacharias knew that this newly born child should grow up to give God's message to the people. He said in his song, And you, O child, shall be called the prophet of God, for you shall go before the Lord Christ to make ready a way for him. You shall give to his people the good news of a Savior and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of God. In the home of Zacharias and Elizabeth, the baby John grew up a strong, noble boy. Very early they told him of the angel's visit and of the command that throughout his life he was not to taste wine nor any strong drink. He was under a vow or pledge of special service for God. And one sign of his pledge was to be his not tasting wine nor even eating grapes. Another sign was in leaving his hair to grow long and never cutting it. Everyone who saw him would know by these signs that he was pledged to a life of peculiar service to God. When John became a young man, he went away from his home and lived in the desert, alone with his own thoughts and with God. Very likely, his father and mother died before he went to live alone, for at the time of his birth, they were old people and could not live many years. John lived upon the plainest of food, the locusts that could be gathered in the field and were boiled to be eaten by the poorest people. He ate also the honey made by the wild bees and stored by them in hollow trees and holes in the rocks. All those years of his young manhood, John was thinking upon the work to which God had called him, talking with God and learning God's will, so that when the time came, he could give God's message to the people. End of chapter 6. Recording by Jane Manning. Chapter 7 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse. Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 7 The Child King in His Cradle For a few months after their marriage, Joseph and Mary lived in their little house at Nazareth. Joseph worked at his trade as a carpenter, while Mary cared for the home and carried the water for the needs of the house from the well in the middle of the village, walking with her jar full of water on her head. One day Joseph came home 
and told his wife that he had been called to go on a journey to Bethlehem, which was the town from which their family had come. Both Joseph and Mary, as we have seen, had sprung from the line of the great King David, who had been born in Bethlehem more than a thousand years before. Everyone who belonged to the line of David, wherever he might be living, looked upon Bethlehem as the home town of his family. The Emperor Augustus at Rome, who ruled over all the lands, and was above Herod, the king of Judea, had given orders that a list should be made of all the families in his wide empire. He wished to lay a tax upon every family, that is, to call upon every family to pay money for the support of his officers, his army, his court, and in order to fix this tax, he must have written down the names of all the people. In our land, such a list is made every ten years and is called a census. With us, men are chosen in every city and town to go to the people where they live and make the list of their names. From all the states throughout the land, these lists are sent to one office, and there the names are arranged in order. But the Romans, who were ruling the world at that time, chose a plan for making this great list, which would give themselves the least trouble, even though it gave to the people under them much more trouble, and compelled them to make long journeys. Instead of appointing in each place an officer to take the names of the people at the places where they were living, they made a law that every family must go to the city or town from which they or their fathers had come, and there give their names to the officers who were making the role of the people. Those who were living in Jerusalem and had come from Shechem or Joppa or Caesarea must journey to one of these places and there make their report. Those who were living in Nazareth and had come, or their parents before them had come, from any other place must go to their home town, however far it might be, and in that place be enrolled or written upon the list of names. There is no reason to suppose that Mary, although herself sprung from the family of David, was compelled to make this journey to Bethlehem with her husband. The Roman laws took very little notice of women, unless they were rich women who could be taxed. Joseph could go alone to Bethlehem, and there have both their names written upon the list. But at once a thought came to Mary, and she said to her husband, You shall not make the journey to Bethlehem alone. I will go with you. We are not told why the young wife was resolved to go with her husband on the long journey. But the reason may have been this. Mary knew that she was to have a son, and the time for his coming was now near at hand. She knew, too, that her child should be the son of David and the king of Israel, that he was to sit on David's throne. She wished him to be born, not in the village of Nazareth in Galilee, but in David's own town of Bethlehem. He was to spring from the royal line, and she was willing to endure a hard, trying journey, and even to suffer, that her son might come from the royal city where David lived. Mary had read the books of the Old Testament and she knew that in those books it had been written by the prophets to whom God had spoken, that this king, whom they called Messiah and Christ, should be born in Bethlehem. These were the reasons that made Mary decide so quickly to go with her husband on his journey to Bethlehem, the city of their fathers. So Joseph locked up his carpenter's shop, and set his wife upon an ass, and with a staff walked beside her over the mountain and down the valley to the river Jordan, and thence following the river, over the Roman road, the same long road that Mary had taken in the caravan or company of pilgrims some months before. Joseph had been over that road many times, going up every year to the feasts at Jerusalem, so that he knew all the places which they passed, and could tell Mary stories of their people, and the great events which had taken place on the mountains, were in the cities as they came into view in their journey. They stopped at Jericho, near the head of the Dead Sea, and there turned westward, climbing the mountains over the robber-haunted road, and reaching Jerusalem. Perhaps they rested a day or two in the city, and then went over to the Mount of Olives, past the village of Bethany, and six miles south of Jerusalem, where they entered the gate of Bethlehem. They had no friends with whom they could stay in Bethlehem, 
and so they sought out the inn, or the con, as it was called. This was a large building with rooms around an open court. In this court the animals and the baggage were placed, and the guests of the inn were in the rooms around it. But Joseph and Mary were not the only people who had come to Bethlehem to have their names enrolled or written upon the lists for the taxing. Others had reached the inn or con before them. When they came, the courtyard was filled with asses and camels and chariots and baggage, and all the rooms around the court were crowded with visitors. Joseph found within the walls of the con no place where his wife could rest after her long and wearisome ride. But at last Joseph learned of a place where they might stay through the night and for a few days. It was only a cave, hollowed out on the hillside, used as a stable for cattle. But miserable as it was, Mary was glad to lie down upon the straw and rest. And in that cave stable, Mary's child was born. She wrapped her little baby in such clothes as she could find at hand, and laid him for his first sleep in the manger where the oxen had fed. This was the lowly cradle of the son of David, the king who was to rule over all the earth. King Herod, in his palace, did not know, and the emperor Augustus at Rome did not dream that in the humble stable at Bethlehem was lying a prince who should reign over a realm vastly greater than Judea or the Roman Empire, that all the world should date their years from the year when that baby was born, and that his name would be praised long after their names had been forgotten. But although neither King Herod nor the Emperor Augustus nor the high priests and rulers in Jerusalem were there to welcome their newborn king, there were some visitors at his manger cradle. In the open fields around Bethlehem were shepherds, watching at night over their flocks of sheep, just as, a thousand years before in the same fields, the young shepherd David had cared for his sheep, guarding them from wild beasts of the wilderness and from robbers. Suddenly a great, dazzling light flashed upon these shepherds, and they saw, as Zacharias had seen by the altar, and as Mary had seen in Nazareth, a glorious angel standing before them. The shepherds were filled with fear and fell upon their faces on the ground, not daring to look up at the shining form. But the angel spoke to them kindly and graciously, saying, Do not be afraid, for I come with good news, which will make you glad, news for all God's people. On this very night is born, in yonder city of David, one who shall be the Saviour, even Christ your Lord and King. Would you wish to go and see this child? I will tell you how you can find him. Look for a newly born baby, wrapped in such clothes as babies wear, and lying, not in a cradle in a house, but in the manger of a stable, where the oxen and the asses are kept. There you will find the child, who is to be the king of all the earth. While shepherds were listening to the words of this angel, they saw that the entire midnight sky over them was filled with a multitude of heavenly beings. The shepherds heard them sing, Glory to God in the highest! and on earth peace among men in whom God is well pleased. Then the vision faded away, the angelic host passed out of sight, and in the dark sky only the stars were shining above them. Then the shepherds said to each other, Let us leave our sheep here for a little while, and go to the village and see this wonderful thing that has come to pass. How good it is that the Lord has given this word to us, that we may be the first to look upon our king. It did not take the shepherds a long time to find the right stable and the manger, for Bethlehem was then only a small village. They came, opened the door, and found just what the angel had said they would see, a tiny baby lying in the manger, his mother hovering near, and Joseph watching over them both in tenderness. They saw the royal little one, and bowed low around his manger cradle. They went again to their flocks in the field, praising God for his goodness, and sending the long-promised king. The people to whom the shepherds told the story wondered at it, hardly knowing whether to believe it or not. For this was not the way in which they looked for the king of Israel to come. 
they were expecting a prince to be born in a palace, not a working woman's child in a dark cave where cattle were kept. But Mary, happy with her little one, clasped him to her heart, and said nothing to any one of the angel that had come to her in Nazareth, and of the promises given her about this child. When the day came to name the child, she simply said, His name shall be Jesus. But she told no one why the name was given. It was a common name among the Jews, so no one was surprised at the name. But no word could tell better than his name, Jesus, what this child should become, for the word Jesus means Savior. End of chapter 7 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 8 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jane Manning Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old, Chapter 8 The Baby Brought to the Temple Although Jesus was born in a stable and slept in a manger, he did not stay in that place long. After a few days, Joseph was able to find a more comfortable home where the young mother and her baby were taken. The Jews were very kind to strangers of their own people and welcomed them to their houses when passing through their towns. Joseph and his family were in Bethlehem for some weeks, perhaps for some months. It may have been their purpose to make Bethlehem their home and to bring up this child, the son of David, in David's own city where he could have a better training for his coming life whatever that life might be, than in the country village of Nazareth. On the day when Jesus was 40 days old, he was brought with his mother to Jerusalem, which was only six miles from Bethlehem. There he was taken to the temple for a service which showed that he was given to God and to be brought up as God's child. It was the rule of the Jews that after the first child had come to a family, an offering should be made on the altar in the temple for him, and prayers should be said. A family that was rich would offer for their first child a sheep, which was killed and burned on the altar as a gift to God in place of the child. If the family was poor, or of the working class of people, the parents offered a pair of doves or pigeons. Joseph and Mary brought a pair of doves and stood by while these were burned on the altar, Mary holding her baby in her arms. At that moment there was in the temple an old man named Simeon. He was a good man and very earnest in his prayers to God that he might live to see the Messiah king of Israel, the Christ of God, who had been promised through the prophets of old. And God had said to Simeon that he should not die until he had seen Christ. On that morning, a voice had seemed to say to him, go to the temple. He obeyed it, not knowing why he had been sent to that place on that day. As Joseph and Mary brought the baby Jesus into the temple, the voice of the Lord spoke again to Simeon, saying, This child is David's son, the king of Israel. The old man came forward, held out his arms, and took the child into them, folded him to his bosom, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, said in Hebrew verse, now, Lord, thou mayest let thy servant go according to thy word in peace. For these eyes of mine have seen thy Savior, whom thou hast sent to all the people, a light to shine upon the nations, and the glory of thine own people Israel. 
Joseph and Mary were filled with wonder at the act and words of the old man, whom they had never seen before and did not know. But as he placed the child in their arms again, he prayed for God's blessing upon both Joseph and Mary. Listen, he said, this child would become a cause for many to fall and to rise again in Israel. He shall be God's sign of mercy, but many shall speak against him. Also, sorrow like a sword shall pierce through your soul, O mother, and the thoughts out of many hearts shall be made known. Those words seemed very strange at the time, but long afterward, when Jesus had grown to be a man, Mary found how true they were as she saw enemies gathered against her son and at last looked at him dying upon the cross. Then, indeed, a sword went through Mary's soul. Just at that moment, a woman came up to the little group. She was very old, more than 90 years of age. And being a widow and a devout worshiper of God, she stayed nearly all her days in the temple praying. God has spoken to her also with the promise of a coming Christ, the Savior and King. She too saw in this little baby the promised Messiah and in a loud voice gave thanks and praise to God. All who heard her wondered at her words and wondered all the more as they looked on this plainly clad father and mother with their baby, all evidently from the country, and the speech of Joseph and Mary showing they had come from Galilee in the far north. Thus, even while Jesus was a very young baby, only 40 days old, here in Jerusalem, a few people had looked upon him and spoken of him as the coming king of Israel. Joseph and Mary carried the child back to their new home in Bethlehem, and Mary had more thoughts to hide within her silent heart long after that day in the temple. End of chapter 8. Recording by Jane Manning. Chapter 9 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 9 The Followers of the Star While Joseph and Mary, with the child Jesus, were still staying in Bethlehem, the city of Jerusalem was stirred by the coming of some men from a land far away, with a strange question. These men were not Jews, but were Gentiles, which was the name that the Jews gave to all people except themselves. All Romans and Greeks and Egyptians and all others who were not of their own race, the Jews called by the name Gentiles. These Gentile strangers who came to Jerusalem were asking of everybody whom they met this question. Can you tell us where is to be found the little child who was born to be the king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east, and we have come to do him honor. Who were these men, and what was the star that they had seen? We are not certain as to their land, but it is generally thought to have been the country now called Persia, then known as Parthia, a land about a thousand miles to the east of Judea. Although some Jews lived in that land, for Jews were to be found then as now in all lands, especially in large cities, the people of Parthia were not Jews, but, as the Jews called them, Gentiles. Although not of the Jewish race, these people were like the Jews in one respect. They never bowed down to worship images which men had made. They worshipped the one God of all the earth, 
and they prayed with their faces toward the sun. They said they did not worship the sun, but the one God who was like the sun, the light of the world. Among these Parthian people were many men who at night studied the stars in the sky. They did not have telescopes, as those who look at the stars now have, to bring the heavenly bodies, the moon, the planets, and the stars, nearer to them. They could only use their own eyes, but by long study they had learned much about the stars, could tell of their movements and where in the sky to find each one of them. The men who gave their lives to the study of the stars were called magi, a word meaning wise men, and these strangers who were seeking the child king in Jerusalem are sometimes spoken of as the wise men, sometimes as the magi. The people of that time believed that when great kings were born, or before they died, strange stars suddenly appeared in the heavens, shone for a time, and then as suddenly passed out of sight. A year or perhaps two years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, such a star, very bright, that had never before been seen, began to shine. In some way it came to the minds of these men that this star pointed to the coming of a great king who was to rule over all the lands, and who was to be found in the land of Judea. These wise men at once made up their minds to go to the land of Judea and see this child king. It was a long and hard journey of more than a thousand miles. They must pass from the high plains of Parthia down to the low lands of Babylonia, must find some way to cross two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Then they would come to a vast, trackless desert, where nothing grew and there was no water. If they went around this desert, they must follow up the Euphrates River far to the north, and then traveling southward under the shadow of lofty mountains, they would come at last to Judea and to Jerusalem, its largest city. Through all that long and trying journey, which would last a year, traveling most of the way on camels, they saw the wonderful star in the sky seeming to lead the way. From the story as told in the Gospel by St. Matthew, it appears that when these men came to Jerusalem, the star was no longer shining. However, the loss of the star would not matter so much, now that they were in the king's own land. For they supposed that everybody in that country, and especially in the city of Jerusalem, would know that their prince was born. But to their surprise, nobody seemed to have heard about the newly born king. They did not meet the shepherds of Bethlehem, who had seen the angel on the night of Jesus' birth. Nor did they hear of old Simeon and Anna, who a month or more before had seen the Christ child. Very, very few were those who knew that the king had come, and none of these few people did these strangers chance to meet. They thought that at one place they could surely learn where to look for this young prince. That was the king's palace in Jerusalem. Herod was still living although old and very feeble, yet as fierce and cruel as ever. Perhaps they thought that this prince for whom they were looking might be a son or a grandson of the king. Herod did not live in Jerusalem, for he did not like its people, and he knew how greatly its people hated him. But he had a palace in the city, and he came to it often for short visits. He may have been in Jerusalem when the wise men came, or they may have sought Herod down at Jericho, twenty miles away where most of the time he lived. As soon as the old king heard the question of these strangers, and learned that they had been led by a star to his land, he was filled with alarm. A child born to be king of the Jews? If there was such a child, what would become of Herod's own throne and crown? If he could find where this child was, he would send his soldiers to the place and soon kill him, as he had killed many others whom he suspected of seeking to take away his kingdom. But Herod hid his cruel purpose, and spoke kindly to these strangers about their errand. He asked them when the star appeared, how it looked, and how they knew that it showed that a king had been born. Then Herod sent for the wisest men in his land, the teachers of the law who lived in Jerusalem. He knew that all the people were looking for the coming of their Messiah king, whom they also called the Christ. "'Can you tell me?' asked Herod. In what place this great king, the Messiah, or Christ, is to be born? The scholars were ready with their answer. They said, In Bethlehem of Judea, 
the city of David. This king who springs from David's line shall be born. This is what the old prophets have said. And they read to him one of the promises of the prophets that the king should come out of Bethlehem. Then Herod sent again for the wise men, and asked them to give him the exact time when they first saw the star. When he had learned the time, he thought at once that this long-looked-for king must have been born in Bethlehem less than two years before. Go to Bethlehem, said Herod to the wise men, and search through the town until you find this child. And when you have found him, come and tell me, for I wish to do honor to this king. That was what Herod said, but what he meant to do was a very different thing, as we shall see. The wise men at once started for Bethlehem, which was only six miles from Jerusalem. They went over one of the mountains, and then one said to another, Look, there is the star once more. See it in the sky just before us? The star stood over the road leading to Bethlehem, and again they followed it rejoicing. It led them straight to the city, and then to a house, over which it seemed to pause. They knocked at the door, and when it was opened, they went into a room, where they found a baby lying in his young mother's arms. These wise men knew at once that here was the king for whom they had sought so long and traveled so far. They bowed before him to the ground to show the high honor in which they held him. Then they opened the treasures which they had brought from their own land and gave to him rich gifts, such as were presented to kings. They gave him gold and frankincense and myrrh, the fragrant gums that were used in offerings and were very costly. Thus, while in his own land only a few people showed their gladness at the coming of their king, the strangers from a distant country came to pay him honor. We would have thought that some of the learned Jews, who could tell King Herod where the king was born, might have come with the wise men to see him, but these great scholars really cared very little about Jesus. They stayed at home and soon forgot the men of the East, their journey, and their question. End of chapter 9. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 10 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jane Manning. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old, Chapter 10, Safe in Egypt. On the night after their visit to Mary and her child, the wise men had a dream. In their dream, they heard the voice of God saying to them, do not go to meet King Herod again. He is no friend to this princely child. Return to your own land by some other way, and do not let Herod know it. The wise men obeyed the voice of the Lord. They left Bethlehem very quietly, telling no one the road that they were taking, and without going through Herod's city, went back to their own land, far distant Parthia. As soon as the wise men had left, on that night Joseph also had a dream. He saw an angel by his bed who said to Joseph, Rise up at once, take the little child and his mother, and go as quickly as you can down to the land of Egypt. Stay in that country until I tell you to leave it. For very soon King Herod will try to kill this child. Without waiting a moment, Joseph awaked Mary from her sleep, and in the night they left the house, taking the sleeping baby with them. They passed silently through the dark streets of Bethlehem and found the road that would lead them to Egypt. At times, Mary rode upon an ass, holding her precious child. At others, she walked while Joseph guided the animal which carried their possessions. It was a journey of more than a hundred miles to Egypt, but they went in safety, unknown to King Herod. 
In Egypt, they could dwell safely, for that land was not a part of Herod's kingdom. Many Jews were dwelling there, and among them, Joseph could live by his trade, for he was a skillful worker in wood. How long they stayed in Egypt, we do not know. It may have been either a few months or a few years. Herod waited for some time to see the wise men again and to find where the child king was living. But as the days passed and he heard nothing from them and finally learned that they had left for their homeland without obeying his command to come and see him, he was very angry. But he was resolved to kill this child who, if he should live, might take the kingdom from him or from his family. Herod planned and carried out a fearfully wicked deed, but not more wicked than many deeds they had already done. He sent a troop of his soldiers to Bethlehem with orders to go into every house in the village to find every child that was two years old or under that age and to kill them all. This terrible thing the soldiers did, and a great cry went up to heaven from the mothers and fathers whose little ones had been slain by the wicked king's command. But Herod's slaughter of the little children was all in vain, as must be every attempt to fight against God. Herod thought that surely this royal child must be among those little dead bodies in Bethlehem and that his throne was safe. But by that time, the little Jesus was in Egypt, sleeping under one of its palm trees beside the River Nile or looking with wide open baby eyes upon the pyramids and the Sphinx, the wonderful works of ancient time carved in stone. Herod did not live long after this. He died full of years, full of wickedness, and suffering great pain. Then Joseph in Egypt dreamed again. The angel, whom he had seen so many times before, came once more and said to him, Joseph, you may now take the young child and his mother and go back to the land of the Jews, for those who sought to kill the child are dead and can do him no harm. Then Joseph, as before, fastened a saddle on the ass and placed their possessions upon its back. The little family then set out upon its journey back to the land of Judea. The purpose of Joseph and Mary was to go back to Bethlehem, David's city, and there bring up this child whom they expected one day to sit on David's throne as king of Israel. But on the way they met other travelers and asked them, Who is now the king in Judea since Herod is dead? They said to Joseph, The king over Jerusalem and Judea is now Archelaus, the son of the old king Herod, and he is as wicked and as cruel as his father was before him. This news made Joseph and Mary afraid to go to Bethlehem. They thought, Perhaps King Archelaus may have heard of the child Jesus and is watching for the chance to kill him. They made up their mind not to go near Bethlehem or Jerusalem, but keeping away from the land ruled by Archelaus to return to Nazareth, where both had lived before their marriage. So it came to pass that Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem of Judea, was brought up in Nazareth of Galilee. End of chapter 10 Recording by Jane Manning. Chapter 11 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Holland. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 11 A Child's Life in Nazareth. The little Jesus must have been between two and five years old when he was brought to Nazareth, just coming out of babyhood and growing into a little boy. And Nazareth was his home for at least twenty five years. All through his childhood, his boyhood, and his young manhood, Jesus was not the only child living in that little white house of one story in one room on the side of the hill. Soon another baby boy came, who was named James, who grew up to become a great man, and many years after wrote one of the books in the Bible, the Epistle of James. Then, one after another, came three more boys, Joseph and Simon and Judas. When we read that name Judas, we are apt to think of the wicked Judas who sold the Lord Jesus for a few pieces of silver, but that was a different Judas. This Judas, like his brother James, long afterward, wrote another book in the New Testament, the Epistle of Jude. Somewhere in the list of children were two girls. There may have been more than two, but the number and names of the girls have not been kept. After a few years, that little house must often have been crowded with children coming one after another, and always a baby to be cared for. And much of the time, it was the shop where Father Joseph did his work as a carpenter. The floor of brick or of clay was often littered with shavings, and the workmen's tools were on the table. The house had very little furniture, no chairs, no bedstead with a mattress upon it, no stove, and no pictures upon the walls. In one corner, a little fire was lighted for cooking the meals, and the smoke went up through a hole in the roof unless the wind blew it back into the room. They never made a fire to keep the house warm in winter, but when it was cold, just waited for the sun to come out. Sometimes a snowstorm came, but the snow seldom stayed more than two or three days. The children of Joseph never took a sleigh ride and never coasted on sleds down the steep hills. If there was a table for their meals, it was very low, less than two feet high, and they sat around it on little cushions, dipping their hands or pieces of bread into one common dish for food. Sometimes the table was just a round measure turned upside down, and sometimes the meal was served on the floor, as we serve meals on the grass at a picnic. When night came, they unrolled some mats, which through the day were rolled up and stood against the wall, spread them on the floor, and lay down upon them to sleep, throwing over themselves the long mantle which had been their outside garment through the day. When the door was shut, the house was dark, for its only window was a little hole in the wall, and they lighted it by an oil lamp which stood either on a tall stand or on a little shelf. But the house was used little in the daytime, for everybody lived out of doors, in the open court, in the front, in the streets, and on the hills around. On pleasant days, Joseph took his tools in the court and worked in wood. We are apt to think of Joseph as building houses, as in our time that is the chief work of a carpenter. But the houses were made of clay or rough stone, and the carpenter did very little work upon them. His chief business was in making wooden plows, yokes for the oxen, the little tables, and the peck or bushel measure, which was to be found in every house and was also used in place of a table. One very useful article was either in the house or in the court, the hand mill for grinding grain, made of two round flat stones. Our flour comes to us from great factories, but in that land each family had its own little mill. They poured the grain into a hole in the upper millstone and then turned the stone round and round by a handle until the grain was ground into flour. This was hard work, but it was always done by the women. Often two women helped each other to turn the handle of the upper millstone. Mary's arms often ached in making the flour needed for her large family. When her daughters grew strong, they helped her in this work. When Jesus became a boy six years old, he was sent to school with the other boys. There were no schools for girls among the Jews, so far as we know. The school was held in the village church, which they called the synagogue. The teacher was always a man and he was generally the janitor of the church, who kept the building in order. The Jews had a pretty name for the village school. They called it the vineyard, as though the children were bunches of little grapes growing up to ripen in the sun. In this vineyard school, there was only one book for study. That was the Bible. The Jews had only the Old Testament, for the New Testament had not yet been written. 
Each of the larger books was in a separate volume in the form of a long roll of parchment. That is a sheet made of sheepskin which had been made smooth on which the words were written. Several of the smaller books were written on one roll. In the school there was only one copy of the Bible for all the scholars. But each boy had a board and a piece of chalk with which he wrote sentences from the Bible and then learned them by heart. When his text had been learned, each pupil cleaned off his board like a slate and wrote on it a new lesson. All the teaching in a Jewish school was in the Old Testament. The copy of the Bible in the school was generally one that had been used in the church until it had grown old and worn out. When they obtained a new set of the books for the service in the church, they gave the old copies to the school. You can see in that same land now a school of children just like those in the time when Jesus was a boy. The children sit on the floor in a circle, the teacher being one of the ring. When they repeat their verses and learning them, all are talking aloud at the same time, so that the school is very noisy. We could not study in such a den, but they do not seem to mind it. School is not very hard in that country. Our children have one holiday in each week free from school, but in the school where Jesus was taught, they had two holidays in every week, besides the Sabbath. In addition to these holidays, there was a long recess of three hours in the middle of each day, and no school at all if the day was very hot. When Jesus was a small boy, he was taken by Father Joseph to the church, which you remember they call the synagogue. The men and boys sat on the floor upon rugs or mats, while the women and girls were in a gallery looking down upon them. All the men and boys wore their hats in the church. Their hats were turbans of cloth wrapped around their heads. But each one, as he entered the door, slipped off his shoes or slippers and was barefooted in the church at the hour of worship. If at the hour of worship you go to a Mohammedan church in that country, which they call a mosque, you will see all the shoes standing outside the door. In the church they had no minister to lead the service and to preach a sermon. The men took turns in charge of the worship. One read from one part of the Old Testament, another from another part. If they found a boy who was a good reader, he was often called upon to read the Bible in the church service. They had prayers always read from a book. They sang together from the Psalms, and whoever wished to speak could do so. But we are not to think of the child Jesus as always at school or at church. He was a strong, hearty, healthy boy. He loved outdoor life. He knew the flowers that grew in the fields and the birds flying in the air. He played with other boys and knew all their games. Two of these games he once happened to mention long after, while he was teaching. One game was the wedding, when they sang and danced. The other was the funeral, when they cried with loud voices, making a mournful wail. We know, too, that in those times the boys played ball and marbles, and a game somewhat like ten pins. Jesus was not a lonely boy living apart. He was always fond of having others around him. When he was a man traveling and teaching over all the land, he had his twelve chosen friends who were always with him, and we may be sure that as a boy he liked to be with other boys, and in turn was liked by the boys of his village. We may be sure, too, that he grew up a good boy, one who always tried to do right, at home, at school, or in play. At home he would help Joseph in his shop, and his mother in her work, or in caring for the smaller children. In school we know that he learned his verses in the Bible, because in after years he could always call them to his mind and speak them, and in play he was always fair and good-hearted and willing. We are told that he grew in knowledge and in the favor of God and of all people. In other words, he was a boy that everybody liked. End of chapter 11、chapter、12、of、Hurlbut's、Life of Christ for Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Holland. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 12 The Boy Lost and Found. Jesus stayed at the school in the village church until he was twelve years old. By that time he could read and write and could also repeat many verses. But as his reading book and spelling book and copy book and memory verses were all in the Bible, 
and as he heard long recordings from its books at the church service we may be sure that he knew quite well all the best things in that best of all books the bible one proof of this is that in later years when any one tried to puzzle him with a hard question he often answered promptly with a sentence from the bible a jewish boy generally left school at the age of twelve unless he wished to become a rabbi which was the name among the jews for a teacher of their law if that was his wish or the purpose of his parents he was sent up to jerusalem to study in the college held by the scribes or teachers in the temple saul of tarsus a boy about four years younger than jesus whom we know as paul the apostle was a student in the temple college but jesus was not while the young saul was studying in jerusalem jesus as a young man was working in the carpenter shop at nazareth when jesus was twelve years old he was taken on his first journey from nazareth up to jerusalem to attend the great feast of the passover three great feasts were held during the year the feast of the passover was in the early spring and kept in mind the great day when the israelites went out of egypt no longer slaves but free men the feast of the pentecost was held in the late spring just fifty days after the passover the word pentecost meaning fifty days and reminded the people that fifty days after their fathers went out of egypt god gave them their law amid lightning and thunder on mount sinai the feast of the tabernacles or feast of tents for that is the meaning of the word tabernacles was held in the fall and at this time the people built for themselves huts of green branches ate in them and slept in them for a week to show the outdoor life of the early days in the wilderness while they were marching to canaan the promised land these three great feasts were held in jerusalem and from every part of the land the people came up to the city to attend them it was a great event when the boy jesus for the first time went on this journey to jerusalem the younger children were left at home under the care of some friend for a boy did not begin attending these feasts until he was twelve years old of course joseph and mary knew all about this journey for they had made it many times they went in the caravan or company from nazareth following the road that joseph and mary had taken on their way to bethlehem twelve years before as they journeyed mary seated on the ass joseph and the boy jesus walking beside her they would talk about the places which they passed and the stories of old times told about them jesus knew all those stories for every jewish boy had heard them over and over as they paused on the top of the hill beside nazareth below them was spread out the great plain of esdraelon and they would say that mountain by the great sea on the west is mount carmel where elijah built his altar and made his great offering when in answer to his prayer the fire came down from heaven and burned up the bullock laid on the altar do you see that road running across the plain on that road elijah ran in front of king ahab's chariot after the long drought when the rain was coming and then this plain over it from mount tabor there on the left deborah and barak chased the flying canaanites across the plain do you see that second mountain beyond tabor that is mount gilboa and at its foot gideon with his brave three hundred frightened at night the midianite host and won a great victory they went down into the jordan valley and walked southward by the roman road following the jordan river at one place the mountains on either side came down close to the river and there was barely room for the road between the foaming stream on one side and the steep rocks on the other look said joseph this is the place where the waters rose up and stood in a heap when our fathers under joshua were about to cross the river thirty miles below they crossed a brook which fell into the river and joseph said do you see this brook up there among the mountains was the place where the prophet elijah was fed by the ravens for this is the brook cherith they came to the place just above jericho where under joshua the israelites walked across the dry bed of the river the holy ark carried by the priest in front and the people following in a long procession there the river is very wide and quite shallow so that people walk across except in the early spring when it is swollen by the rains and the melting snow on the high mountains far to the north there they would point out across the river mount nebo where moses stood looking upon the land and then all alone lay down and died they stopped for a rest at jericho where were stories to tell of the walls that fell down when the israelites marched around them and the priests blew their ram's horn trumpets 
Perhaps they stopped and drank at the great spring near Jericho, where the water was made pure by Elisha the prophet. And after a climb up the mountains, at the end of six days or a week, they came to Jerusalem, the end of their journey, and the place called by the people the holy city. And then there was the splendid temple of God. How the boy's heart was stirred as he walked over the bridge leading from Mount Zion to Mount Moriah. They went into the great outside court, the court of the Gentiles, the only place in the temple where foreigners were allowed to enter. And the boy Jesus was shocked to see that it had been turned into a market where cattle and sheep and doves were sold and where tables stood around for the men who changed foreign money into Jewish shekels. Over the eastern wall and the golden gate they saw the Mount of Olives, then covered to the top with vineyards and olive trees and gardens. They climbed up a flight of steps and passed through a gate called the Beautiful Gate into a smaller court, like the outer court open to the sky. This was named the Court of the Women, because from its lattice-covered gallery the women looked down on the altar and the services of worship. Jesus noticed that in this Court of the Women were many classes of young men studying, seated in a circle, listening to their teachers. How he longed to sit down among them and listen to these wise scholars, for though only a boy, he had thought deeply on many things which he had read and many questions had come to his mind which he greatly desired to have answered. He saw the sacrifice offerings laid on the altar and burned, while trumpets sounded and censers of incense were waved and the priests chanted the Psalms of David. While the family were in Jerusalem, they found friends with whom they stayed, and in their house the Passover feast was eaten. It was a very simple meal, just a roasted lamb, some vegetables and bread made without yeast, in thin cakes like soda biscuit, only larger. They ate the meal lying down on couches around the table, their heads toward the table, their feet away from it. It was the custom or rule of the Jews at this feast to have the story of the first Passover. Perhaps Joseph said to Jesus, My son, you know what took place when this Passover was eaten for the first time. Tell us the story. Then the boy Jesus told of the terrible plagues that fell upon the land of Egypt, of the last and greatest sorrow, the death of the oldest son in every house, how the Israelites sprinkled their doorpost with the blood of the slain lamb and were passed over by this death angel, how they ate the lamb on that night, dressed for their journey, and how they went out of Egypt and marched through the Red Sea. The family were in Jerusalem for a week, and every day Jesus went up to the temple to worship in its services and to learn what he could from its teachers. The last day of their visit came, and at its close the families going to Galilee met together for their homeward journey. A horn was blown, and the caravan or company started northward. Mary missed her son, but thought that he was somewhere in the crowd, talking with other boys of his own age. But when night came, the company stopped to rest, and Jesus did not appear. Mary was alarmed. They looked through all the crowd, but no Jesus was to be found. Then, in great trouble, Joseph and Mary hastened back to Jerusalem, looking for their boy. They asked for him among the friends at whose house they had stayed, but he had not been there. They wandered up and down the narrow streets, but while they saw many groups of boys, their boy was not among them. At last, on the third day, they looked for him in the temple. In one of its courts, a crowd of people were listening to the teachers who seemed to be talking with someone. They drew near, and Mary's heart began to beat as she suddenly heard a boy's voice sounding from the middle of the throng. She knew that voice in its clear, rich, honest tone. She pressed her way in, and there stood her boy, the center of a company of the learned scholars. He was asking questions of these men, and they, in their answers, were asking him questions in turn, while all around were people listening and wondering at this boy's deep knowledge of the truth. Mary hastily rushed up to Jesus and said, My son, why have you treated us so unkindly? Your father and I have been looking for you in great trouble for three days. Jesus looked up at his mother's face with surprise and said, why should you look for me? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Evidently, on the last day of their stay, he had slipped away for one more visit to the temple, and once there his mind and heart had been so full that no thought of the home-going had come to him. 
he had just stayed there in the courts of the lord's house without a thought of the outside world where had he slept on those two nights who had given him food during those three days he might have lain down as thousands did during the feast under the olive trees on the mount of olives some stranger may have seen him and invited him to a meal but it would not be strange if in his deep whole-souled interest he had never thought of food and had eaten nothing during those three days but without a word he took his mother's hand and walked out of the temple he made the journey home to nazareth saying little but thinking much of all that he had seen and heard one great precious truth at least had come to his heart he felt that the lord god of israel was his own father and he could trust fully the father god end of chapter twelve Chapter 13 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. In Wasega Beach, February 2019. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. By Jesse Lyman Hurlbut, Chapter Thirteen, The Young Woodworker. For eighteen years after the visit to the temple, Jesus was living in Nazareth, growing up from a boy to a young man. A Jewish boy generally left his school at about thirteen years of age, and began working at some trade or business. Jesus went into Joseph's shop and helped in the work, making plows and axe handles and rakes and the plain furniture for the houses. Whatever Jesus did was done well, and we cannot doubt that in his trade he soon became a skillful worker. His axe handles and plows were as good as the best, and if he made a bushel measure, it was a true one, for Jesus was a boy that could be trusted. As a boy, he was like other boys, playing happily in playtime and working heartily in work time. Some boys liked to be alone, reading and thinking and dreaming, but Jesus was not one of that kind. All through his life, he liked to have people around him, and as a boy, we may be sure, he had many friends among other boys. He was strong, in good health, could run and jump and climb trees. With his boy friends, he wandered among the mountains and upon the great plain just over the hills from his town. The Sea of Galilee was only twenty miles away, and we do not doubt that Jesus, with his friends, went fishing in its blue waters, and brought home to his mother the fish which he had caught. After a time, Joseph, the husband of Mary, died, and Jesus was left to care for his mother and her large family of children. It is no light load for one just coming out of boyhood and just beginning to be a man to have laid upon him the earning of enough money to buy food for a mother and at least six younger brothers and sisters. And this was the load which the young Jesus took up. But although Joseph, who had been a father to him, was gone, Jesus knew that his heavenly Father was still with him, and he could call upon him for help in every need. Jesus worked hard all the long days, but when the Sabbath day came, which among the Jews was Saturday, his shop was shut up, and he sat on the floor of the village church, listening to the readings of the Old Testament, and joining in the songs of praise. He took his turn as reader at the desk, and as he read the lesson in Isaiah, or Micah, or Hosea, he saw meanings in the verses that others could not see. For in the long hours in the workshop, he was thinking and praying, and listening to the voice of God. While Jesus was living this quiet life in the home and shop, some changes were going on in the land. The ruler in Galilee was Herod Antipas, the son of that wicked Herod who killed all the babies in Bethlehem. And he was very little better than his father. In Judea, the part of the land around Jerusalem, Archelaus, another son of Herod, ruled so badly 
that all the people sent to the Emperor Tiberius at Rome asking to have him taken away. The Jews hoped that they might then have rulers of their own people. But the Emperor sent them a Roman governor, whom they did not like, but dared not make angry. In many places throughout the land, especially in Galilee, where Jesus was living, some of the people refused to pay their taxes to the Roman Empire, and began fighting against the rulers. They could not battle with the Roman armies, and hid in the woods and caves and mountains, but came out in bands and robbed the people on the road. All through the land, north and south, were fear and trouble. The people were not contented with their rulers, and all hoped that the time was near when the kingdom of God would come, and their Roman officers and tax-gatherers would be driven away. They looked for a kingdom like the one over which David reigned a thousand years before, a kingdom with armies and victories over its enemies, and a palace for the king. But they did not know that in that little one-room house on the hillside of Nazareth, the king was waiting for his call to go forth and bring in the true kingdom of God. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Holland. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter Fourteen The Voice by the River. While Jesus was still living in Nazareth and working in his carpenter shop, suddenly the news went through all the land that a strange man was preaching in the desert country of Judea, not far from Jerusalem, and that all the people were going out of the cities and villages to hear him. This man was John, the son of the old priest Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. You remember that an angel came to Zacharias while he was standing by the altar in the temple and told him that he should have a son, and that his name should be John. John had now grown up and was a young man about thirty years old. He had lived out in the desert places away from the cities and their crowds so that he could be alone and think and pray and listen to the voice of God. And God had spoken to him in the desert, and he had told him to preach to the people and tell them how to get ready for the kingdom of God, which was soon to come. John was preaching beside the river Jordan at the foot of the mountains, and from the cities and villages everywhere the people went to listen to his words. John did not look like the men of his time. He had never cut his hair, and it hung upon his shoulders in a long black mass. His black beard, too, was very long, for it had never been trimmed. His clothing was a skin torn from a beast or a mantle woven from the rough, shaggy hair of the camel, fastened by a leather belt around the waist. He had lived out of doors in the sun, and the winds and the rain said that his face and arms and legs and his bare feet were all brown and hard. He ate for his food the locust which he could pick up in the fields, and the woods, and the honey to be found in the hollow trees. When the people looked at him, they thought of the great prophet Elijah, who many hundred years before had gone up to heaven in a chariot of fire near that very place where John was preaching, and they said wonderingly to each other, This must be Elijah, the fiery prophet who has come back to earth. A prophet among the Israelites was a man who brought to the people the word which God had given him to speak. The books of the Old Testament, which all the people knew almost by heart, told of many prophets, such as Moses, who brought water for his people by striking the rock, Samuel, whose prayers saved the people from their enemies, Nathan, who spoke bold words to David the king, and Elisha, who had made the bitter waters of a spring sweet had cured the leper Naaman, and wrought many wonderful works. Of all the prophets, they thought Elijah the greatest, and they remembered that in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Malachi, it was written, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great day of the Lord shall come. And when the people looked at the strange man who was preaching by the river, they thought that the day of the Lord was surely coming, and that here was the prophet Elijah as had been promised. John said to the people in his preaching that the kingdom of God was near at hand, and that every man must be ready for it. 
to make themselves ready they were to confess their sins to stop doing wrong and to begin to do right as a sign of their willingness to cease from evil and to serve the lord they were baptized by john in the river jordan john said to them i baptize you with water but there is one among you of your own people one whom you do not know who is greater than i so much above me that i am not worthy to stoop down and tie his shoestrings he will come soon and when he comes he will not baptize you with water as i do he will baptize you with fire and with the spirit of god he spoke further about this greater one who was coming so soon and said he shall deal with the people as the farmer deals with his grain on the threshing floor he will sweep the floor most carefully the wheat he will put in his barn and the chaff he will burn up with a fire that cannot be put out the people came to john and said to him what shall we do to make ready for the coming of this great king john answered them let every one do what he can to help those who are in need if any of you have two coats give one of them to some poor man that has no garments and those of you who have wheat and barley give to those who are hungry something to eat some of the men who gathered the taxes from the people for the roman rulers came to john and said what would you have us do to make ready for the coming of the king shall we tell the people that they are to pay no more taxes no answered john let the people pay their taxes as before but see that you do not make them pay more than is right and do not rob them for many of these tax collectors who were called publicans took from the people more than they had a right to take and use the people's money for themselves they made themselves rich by robbing the people everywhere the people hated these tax collectors and called them sinners the soldiers and policemen came to john and said and what shall we do john said to them do not be harsh and rough with the people treat every one kindly be contented with your pay and do not make the people give you money that you have no right to ask these were some of the many things that john said to the people all his words came to this if you are doing wrong stop it and begin to do right do not be selfish but love your fellow men and do good to them and be ready when the king comes to obey him john was called john the baptist because he baptized in the river jordan all those who promised to follow his teachings the leaders of the people in jerusalem did not believe the words of john and were not baptized by him they did not know exactly what to think of him and they sent some priests and others to see him these men came and asked him who are you are you the christ the promised king no answered john i am not the christ what then said they are you elijah the prophet come to earth again as some people say you are no answered john again i am not elijah well then they said tell us who you are so that we can give an answer to the rulers who have sent us and john said in the book of the prophet isaiah it is written the voice of him that cries in the desert prepare ye the way of the lord make a straight path before him i am that voice to speak to the people and make them ready for the king who is even now among you although you do not know him and who will soon make himself known end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of hurlbut's life of christ for young and old this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano hurlbut's life of christ for young and old by jesse lyman hurlbut chapter fifteen the carpenter leaves his shop after some months the news was brought to nazareth that john the baptist had come up the river jordan and was now preaching at a place about twelve miles south of the sea of galilee the place where john was preaching had two names it was called bethany beyond jordan there being another bethany quite near jerusalem and it was also called bethabara a word which means the place where one can walk across the river for there the river jordan was so shallow that people waded across it john had chosen this place because the sloping shore beside the river was fitted for the crowds to listen to his preaching and the shallow water was near at hand for baptizing the people 
Bethabara, or Bethany, was about twenty-five miles from Nazareth, and over the plain, just across the hill, was a road leading down to the river of that place, where people used to cross the Jordan on their way to the land of Decapolis and Perea beyond. Nearly all the people had heard John preach, and most of them had been baptized by him as a sign that they promised to turn from evil and do good and look for the king who was soon to come. Jesus felt that the time had now come for him to begin the work to which God had called him. He told no one of his purpose, not even his mother, but one day he left his carpenter shop to his younger brothers, who were now young men and able to care for their mother. He walked down the valleys, came to the river Jordan, waded the stream, and at Bethabara, in front of a crowd of people from every part of the land, for the first time he saw John the Baptist. No doubt Mary had told her son all the story of the angel by the altar, of John's birth, and of his early life, but in all the years Jesus and John had never met. Jesus listened to the words of John, and then with the others he came forward to be baptized. John looked at this strange young man who was drawing near, and as he looked, the voice within him said, The long-promised king has come. This man is he. John felt that here was one who needed no baptism, for he knew that this man had no sins to give up, and was already doing God's will perfectly. He felt unwilling to baptize him and said, it is not fitting that I should baptize one so good and so great in the sight of God as you are. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, It is best that it should be so. Whatever is right for other men is right also for me. Let me do this as my duty to God. Then John yielded to the will of Jesus and baptized him. Just as Jesus rose out of the water, a strange thing happened. While he was praying, a light flashed from the sky and seemed to rest upon the head of Jesus like a white, shining dove coming down upon him, and a voice was heard somewhat like a peal of thunder. Those standing on the shore felt that some words were spoken, but they could not understand them. John alone heard and understood. It was the voice of God, and John afterward told the people but these were the words spoken. This is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. At that instant a mighty power came upon Jesus. The Spirit of God had always been with him, and had caused him to feel that the Lord was fitting him to do some great work. But in that moment, when the light from heaven fell upon him, and the voice of God was heard, Jesus was filled with the Spirit of God as no man. Not even the greatest of the prophets had been filled before. He knew now that he was not only a prophet, one who hears God's voice and speaks God's words, but more than a prophet, he himself was the Son of God. He saw as in a flash what was God's plan for his kingdom on the earth, that it was a kingdom far different from that expected by the Jewish people. He knew that he, who up to that moment had been the woodworker of Nazareth, was from that hour to be the prince of the heavenly kingdom. He was to lead the people to God, and to show in his own life how men should live. He was to bring God down to men, and to bring men to God. All this and more that we cannot understand came to the soul of Jesus, as he stood on the brink of Jordan with the light of God upon his face. End of chapter 15. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 16 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut 
Chapter Sixteen Alone in the Desert. After his baptism, Jesus felt that for a time he must be alone to think over the great change that had come upon him. Only yesterday he had been the carpenter in Nazareth, and now he knew that he was the Son of God and the King of Israel. So sudden and mighty a change as this made him feel that he must go to some quiet, lonely place, where he could think and pray and find out his Father's will for himself and the work that he was to do. Without speaking even a word with John, Jesus slipped out of the crowd upon the bank of the river. He walked toward the south, not following the well-known road beside the Jordan, over which he had walked many times while attending the feasts in Jerusalem, but choosing the paths along the mountainside, where he would not meet people, for he wished not to talk with men, but with God. He came at last to a very lonely place, between Jericho and Jerusalem, a place where no man lived, and where even the Arabs of the desert scarcely ever wandered. The only living creatures in the desolate land were the wild beasts, the wolves and the foxes, whose howls could be heard at night. There upon the top of a hill, with rocks all around, he sat down to rest. His mind had been in such a whirl of excitement, and his heart was beating with such strong feeling, that he had never thought of taking with him any food to eat. For many days and nights he was alone, praying and talking with God, and never once thinking of eating. More than a month passed away, even forty days, before the feeling of hunger came upon him. Then suddenly he felt a sharp gnawing in his body, and he knew that he was famishing for food. He felt that he must have something to eat, or he would die there in the desert, with the great work to which God had called him all left undone. Around him were the rough stones of the wilderness, and as he looked on them, this thought came to his mind. There is no need for me to starve in this desert. If I am the Son of God, as the voice from heaven said, then I need only to speak a word, and these stones will be turned to bread. Then Jesus thought again and said to himself, Yes, I am the Son of God, and I have the power to make these stones turn into bread for me to eat. But that power was given me by my heavenly Father, and it was given, not that I should use it for myself, but for the help of others who are in need. It is not God's will that I should make bread out of stones for myself. And then a sentence out of the Bible came to the mind of Jesus, and he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus seemed to be alone in the desert, but there was one who was watching him, all unseen. That one was the evil spirit Satan, who hated Jesus, knowing that he was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. He had put into the mind of Jesus the thought of turning stones to bread, and using the power which God had given him for himself alone. Jesus was quick to see the purpose of Satan, and to turn away from it. Then another thought came to the mind of Jesus. He said to himself, I know that I am the King of Israel, the Messiah, whom the people have been looking for so long. But how shall I cause the people to know that I am their king? What can I do to make them believe in me? At that moment, while Jesus was trying to think out the best plan for beginning his work and making himself, as the Son of God, known to the people, Satan, the evil spirit, was ready with another word. He said, Here is a good plan. Go to the temple in Jerusalem at some feast time, when it is crowded with people, and in the sight of all the crowd, leap off one of the towers. You will not fall to the ground, but will come sailing down through the air, for all power is yours. And when the people see you, they will fall on their faces before you, and will believe in you as the king so long promised. You know that you are the Son of God, and that God will take care of you. Don't you remember that in one of the Psalms it is written, 
he shall give his angels charge over thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up so that thou shalt not dash thy foot against a stone jesus saw at once that this was not god's plan but satan's plan it would not be trusting god but would be putting god's power and god's care to a trial to show what jesus himself could do he would not perform this foolish act nor anything like it of his own accord he would wait until god told him what to do and would do nothing until he was sure that it was the will of god again a sentence out of the bible came to his mind and he said it is written again thou shalt not put the lord thy god to trial that means that we should never make a show of our trust in god or let others see by some act that it is not needed what god can do to help us we must not venture into danger to show how god can bring us out of danger jesus had now settled two great questions he would not use his wonder-working powers for himself even to save his own life and he would do nothing merely as a show but would in all things work only the will of his father there was one more question to be met he was to become the king of israel but what kind of a kingdom would he have he knew well that all the israelite people not only in judea and galilee but in all the lands were looking for a king who should rule in jerusalem somewhat as the emperor tiberius was ruling in rome they hoped for a king who should gather an army should drive out the romans should fight battles win victories and make his kingdom the ruling power in the world they looked for the time when the romans should be under their feet and when all other lands should pay taxes and serve their king in jerusalem all this jesus knew and satan the wicked spirit was at his side though unseen to say to him take my advice and i will give you all the kingdoms of the world for they are mine and i can give them to whom i please jesus knew that what the people wanted was just what satan wanted a worldly wicked kingdom built out of war and blood and the killing of all who would not submit to it that would not be the kingdom of god it would be the kingdom of satan as so many kingdoms and nations have been in the past to do as satan wished him to do would be just the same as if you bowed down before satan and worshipped him as his lord and master this he would not do and his last words to the tempter were go away from me satan it is written thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shalt thou serve jesus saw plainly that in making this great choice to please god he would not please his own people the jews he knew that the rulers and the priests and the scribes those who were the leading men of the time would be against him would refuse to follow him would try to stir up the people against him and would try to kill him but jesus was ready to die in serving god rather than to live in doing the will of satan when satan the wicked spirit found that he could not persuade jesus to do his will he left him and afterward angels from heaven sent by his father came to him in the desert and gave him all the food that he needed the gospels of matthew and luke which tell the story of this meeting with satan and of jesus's victory do not say just where it took place all we know is that it was in the desert or the wilderness but near jericho stands a mountain where it is thought by some that jesus stayed during those forty days this mountain on that account is called by a name which means forty days mount quarantania end of chapter sixteen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Chapter 17 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Holland Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 17 The Earliest Followers of Jesus After his forty days in the desert, Jesus began his work of winning men to the kingdom of God. This plan was, at first, to talk to men one by one until he could gather around him a little company of those who would believe in his words as a teacher and follow him as their leader. The men who would be best fitted to become his first followers were some of those who had been already taught by John the Baptist. So from the wilderness, Jesus turned his steps northward once more and walked up the well-trodden road toward Bethabara, where nearly two months ago he had been baptized. At Bethabara with John the Baptist was a group or company of young men who were known as John's disciples, that is, men who stayed with him to learn his teachings after the crowds had gone home. Some of these were fishermen from the Sea of Galilee who had left their nets and their work that they might listen to John. John was standing with some of these men around him when at some distance a stranger was seen walking up the road. These disciples of John did not know who this man was, but John remembered him, for the light flashing from the sky upon his face at the moment of his baptism and the voice from the heavens had stamped Jesus upon his memory. He pointed to Jesus and said, Look, yonder is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one of whom I spoke when I said, After me shall come a man who is greater than I, and who shall baptize not in water, but in the Holy Spirit. Upon this man I saw the Spirit coming down like a dove and resting upon him, and I tell you all that this man is the Son of God. While John was speaking these words, Jesus passed out of sight, and John and his disciples saw no more of him that day. But on the next day, when John was standing with two of his followers, Jesus again walked by, and John again looked at him and said to the young men, Look, the Lamb of God! The two young men, when they heard these words, at once left John and walked toward Jesus. As they drew near, Jesus turned and said to them, Why do you follow me? What is it that you wish? They said to him, Teacher, we wish to know where you are staying, so that we can see you and talk with you. Come and see, said Jesus, and he led them to the house where he was staying as a guest. In those times the Jews welcomed to their homes those who were on a journey, and for a few days needed a resting place. It was about ten o'clock in the morning when those two men sat down in the house with Jesus, and they stayed with him all the rest of the day until the sun went down, listening as he talked to them about the kingdom of God. His words went straight to their hearts, and on that day those two young men believed in Jesus as their Messiah Christ, that is, the King of Israel, long promised by the prophets of the Old Testament, and long looked for by the Israelite people. The two words, Messiah and Christ, mean the same. One is in the Hebrew language, the other in the Greek, and both words mean the Anointed One, or the King of Israel. Thus, on the first day of his teaching, Jesus found two followers. Both of these men were fishermen from the Sea of Galilee, not many miles away. One was a man named John, who was afterward called the disciple whom Jesus loved. For of all his followers, John was the one nearest to Jesus. Long afterward, John wrote one of the most precious books in the Bible, the Gospel according to John, which shows us more than any other book the inmost heart of Jesus. The other young man was named Andrew. He thought at once of his older brother Simon, who was also a follower of John the Baptist. He went to find Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah of whom the prophets have spoken. He spoke in the Hebrew tongue, which was the language of his people. If he had spoken in Greek, the tongue in which the New Testament was first written, he would have said, We have found the Christ, that is, the King. Andrew brought his brother Simon to Jesus, and as soon as Jesus looked at him, before Andrew had spoken his name, he said, Your name is Simon, and you are the son of Jonas, but I will give you a new name. In the time to come, you shall be called the rock. In the Hebrew language, the word meaning rock is Cephas, or Kephas. In Greek, it is Peter. 
After this, Simon was sometimes called Cephas, but more often Peter. He became a leader among the followers of Jesus, and many years later wrote one, perhaps two, of the books in the New Testament. Jesus had now three followers who believed in him as their Lord and King, and the next day he found a fourth. This man was named Philip, and he came from a place called Bethsaida on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus said to Philip, Follow me. And he too joined the little company of the disciples or followers of Jesus. Philip at once thought of a friend of his own, a very good and pure man who he thought would be glad to join him as a follower of Jesus. He went to look for him and found him standing under a fig tree. He said, We have found him of whom Moses wrote in the law, and of whom the prophets spoke, the Christ. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph, and he comes from the town of Nazareth. Now, Nathanael's hometown was Cana, only a few miles from Nazareth. Nathanael thought of Nazareth as a mean place. He could not believe that the great king of Israel, the Christ, should spring from such a village. He looked for him to come from some great city like Jerusalem or from Bethlehem, David's town. He did not know that Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. In fact, he had never heard of Jesus, and he said, Do you tell me that anything good can come out of Nazareth? Now, Philip was not wise enough to tell Nathaniel the reasons why he believed in Jesus. It is hard to put into words some of our deepest thoughts, but he gave to Nathaniel a very wise answer. Well, said Philip, come and see Jesus for yourself. Jesus had never seen Nathaniel before, but as he drew near, Jesus said to those who were standing by, Look, here comes a true Israelite, a man of God, one whose heart has in it nothing evil. Nathanael was greatly surprised at these words of Jesus. He said, How is it that you know me? Before Philip spoke to you, answered Jesus, while you were standing under the fig tree, I saw you. Teacher, said Nathanael, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, Do you believe because I said I saw you underneath the fig tree? You will yet see greater things than these. In truth, I say to you that you shall see the heaven opened and the angels of God going up and coming down upon the Son of Man. By the Son of Man, Jesus meant himself. He used those words to show that while he was the Son of God, he was also a man among men. Jesus had been preaching or talking to a few men about the kingdom of God, and already he had gained five followers. There may have been others, for not long afterwards we find James, the brother of John, among his disciples. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Fatima da Silva. Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Herbert. The Water Turned to Wine. Soon after Jesus met the men who became his first followers, he left the river Jordan, and with these men walked to the land of Galilee, to the village of Cana, about six miles north of Nazareth. This was the town where Nathaniel, one of the first five followers of Jesus, lived. At Cana, a marriage was to be held, and Jesus, with all his followers, was invited. In that land, at a marriage, a feast was always given, and all the friends of the newly married couple, with their friends also, and almost everybody in the village, were expected to come. The feasting and dancing and merrymaking often lasted through a whole week. Before the feast was over, they found that the wine, which in those times everybody drank freely, was used up, and those who were giving the feast had no wine to set before their guests. This filled them with alarm, for at such times the wine was expected to flow freely, and not to have wine for the company at the feast was considered almost a disgrace. The mother of Jesus was there as a friend of the family. She thought of a way to help those who were giving the feast, and called her son aside from the crowd and said to him very quietly, They have no wine. She knew what very few knew, that Jesus was the Son of God, 
and that all power was in his hands he had not yet done any of those wonderful works of curing the sick making the blind to see and making the deaf to hear which he did so often afterward but mary believed that he could do them if he chose she thought that perhaps he would use his power to give the wine that was needed it was with this hope that she said to him they have no wine the answer that jesus gave was not such in its words as to encourage her woman said he what have you to do with me in this matter my time is not yet come his speaking to his mother as woman instead of saying mother as a young man would among us was not lacking in respect it was the usage of that time for a son to say woman and not mother she saw in his face a look showing her that she had not spoken in vain so she turned to the servants who were standing near whatever he tells you to do she said do it one of the usages of the jews was to wash their hands before they sat down to a meal this washing was not merely to make their hands clean it was a sort of religious service and the jews were very strict in doing it when so large a company met for a feast a great deal of water was needed in the hall were standing six large jars for water each jar of a size to hold nearly twenty gallons they were nearly empty because all the guests had washed their hands before sitting down at the feast jesus pointed to these jars and said to the servants fill all those jars with water they obeyed him and filled all the jars up to the brim then jesus said again now draw out from the jars and carry what you take out to the ruler of the feast wondering the servants dipped their pitchers into the great jars which only a few moments before they had filled with water how surprised they were to find each pitcher as it came out full of red wine they carried it to the ruler of the feast he tasted it and saw that it was wine of the very best kind he did not know how it had been made but supposed that it had been brought suddenly from some wine merchant he called the young man who had been married and in whose honor the feast was being held and said to him everybody serves his best wine at the beginning of his feast and afterward when people have been drinking some time he brings wine that is poorer but you have kept your best wine until now the only ones who knew whence the new wine had come were the servants but they soon told others and the word was passed around the company that jesus of nazareth mary's son had wrought this wonderful work his followers the five or more disciples who had come with jesus to the wedding feast now believed more fully than before that their teacher was more than a mere man that the power of god was upon him and that whatever he should say was the word of god such a work as that of turning the water into wine a work that no man could do without god's power was called a miracle it showed that the one who wrought it was a man sent from god doing god's will and speaking god's word this was the first miracle or work of wonder that jesus wrought but after this we shall read of many miracles from the wedding feast jesus went down the mountains of galilee to the city of capernaum which stood on the shore of the sea of galilee on the northwest with jesus on this visit to capernaum were his mother some of his younger brothers and his followers end of chapter 18Chapter 19 of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Herbert. The Lord in His Temple. The springtime of the year came when the people from all parts of the land went up to Jerusalem to attend the great feast of the passover you remember that this feast was held to keep in mind how more than a thousand years before god had led the israelite people out of egypt where they had been slaves 
It was called the Feast of the Passover, because on the night of their going out, the angel of death had passed over the houses of the Israelites, when he brought death to the Egyptian homes. On that night, too, they went out of Egypt in such haste, that the women did not have time to wait for the bread to rise before baking it, and all the bread eaten at that time was unleavened bread, or bread made without yeast. To keep in mind that the great day, the day when Israel became a nation ruling itself, in the spring of every year all the people gathered in Jerusalem and for one week ate unleavened bread, that is, bread made without yeast. Great services were held in the temple on every day of this feast, and on one evening a special dinner of a roasted lamb was eaten by everybody, to keep in mind the last meal which the Israelites ate in the land of Egypt, with their heads on their heads, with their cloaks on their shoulders, and their shoes on their feet, all ready to march away. Jesus and the little company of his disciples or followers went up to Jerusalem, walking, as many times before, down the Jordan Valley to Jericho, and then climbing the hills to the holy city. For many years Jesus had been coming to the feast of the Passover, but never before had he come as he came now, in the power of the Spirit, as the Son of God. Around the house of God was a great open court, called the Court of the Gentiles, where foreign people were not Jews came to pray, since none but Jews or Israelites could enter the inner courts. But the Jews held all Gentiles or foreign people in contempt. They did not look upon the part of the temple buildings where foreigners prayed as holy, and they had turned this court, the court of the Gentiles, into a marketplace. Here Jesus found everywhere sheep and oxen brought there for sale, cages full of doves, which were sold to the poor people for offerings upon the altar. Counters were set men changing the money of people from other lands into the coins of Judea. There was nothing of the quiet and peace which should be in a place of prayer. All was noise and confusion, the lowing of oxen, the voices of men buying and selling, the jingling of silver on the tables. These sights and sounds stirred the heart of Jesus. He felt that such work as went on around him was unfit and was wicked in a place set apart for the worship of God. He picked up a piece of rope from the floor and untwisted its cords until it seemed like a whip. Then, standing before the buyers and the sellers, he called upon them to stop their trading. They looked up amazed at this stranger whose face glowed with the power as though he were a king. Alone, without help from anyone, he drove all these people out of the court. He bade them lead away the sheep and the oxen. He commanded those who sold the doves to carry out their cages. He overturned the tables of the money changers and sent their silver rolling upon the floor. Take all these things away, he cried out. This is the house of my father. You shall not make it a house for buying and selling. Even the little company of his disciples, Peter, John, Andrew, and the others, stood still in wonder as they saw their master alone, armed only with a piece of rope, driving out the gates this crowd of men, who were frightened at the kingliness of his look and fled before him not for one moment daring to resist his will. But soon came the priests and rulers of the temple. They ought not to have allowed these men to trade in the temple court and to make it a marketplace. But some of them took a share of the money that was made in that place. One high priest, it said, owned all the cages of doves and pigeons that were kept in the temple for sale. These rulers were very angry to have the trading stopped and their gains taken away. What right have you to come here, they said to Jesus, and make trouble? Who are you that you should undertake to rule in this place? Show us some sign or proof that you are master here. The time is coming, said Jesus, when I will show you a sign of my power, but not now. And when that sign comes, you will not believe it. Then, making a motion of his hands, as though pointing to himself, He added, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. The Jews were horrified at these words, for they thought that he was speaking of the building on Mount Moriah, and in their mind to speak of pulling down the house where God dwelt was a terrible thing. But Jesus was speaking of himself, 
as the Son of God, and was buried by the Spirit of God, far more than the building, where men cheated and did evil deeds. Jesus himself was the house of God. The rulers said, This temple has taken forty-six years to build, and it is not finished yet. And will you rise it up in three days? Nearly fifty years before, King Herod had begun to rebuild the temple, which in his time had become old and decayed. The repairs were made very slowly, and in the time of Jesus the building was still far from being finished. It was not finished until more than twenty years afterward. We know what Jesus meant by those words, that three years afterward, those very men would cause him, the Son of God, whose body was God's dwelling place, to be put to death, and within three days after his death, he would rise from his tomb, to be the temple of God again and forever. The disciples of Jesus heard these words, but at the time did not know what they meant. Jesus stayed for some time in Jerusalem and talked to the people about the kingdom of God. He also did some wonderful works, such as curing the sick, and the people who saw these acts believed his words, as from one whom God had sent to men. But the priests and the rulers hated Jesus, because he spoke against their wicked lives, and they did all that they could to turn the people away from him. Among the rulers, whoever were a few men who listened to Jesus and believed his words. One of these was a man named Nicodemus. He wished to have a talk with Jesus and learn more of his teachings. But he was afraid to be seen with Jesus in the daytime, knowing that the other rulers were so strongly against Jesus. So he went quietly one night, unknown to everybody, and had a meeting with Jesus. Nicodemus began by saying, Teacher, We all know that you have been sent by God to speak to us, because no one could do these wonderful things that you are doing unless God were with him to give him power. Jesus said to him, Let me tell you and all your people one thing. No man can have any part in the kingdom of God unless he is born again from God. Nicodemus did not know what this meant, and he said, How can a man be born again after he's grown up? Every man, said Jesus, must become a new man and have the Spirit of God dwelling in him, if he's to come into the kingdom of God. Don't be surprised that I say to you, you must be born anew. There are many things that you cannot understand. Listen to the wind blowing. You can hear it, but you cannot tell from what place it comes, nor to what place it goes. Just so is it with everyone who is born of God's Spirit. What Jesus meant in these words was that everyone who would be a follower of Christ needs to have a new heart and to live a new life. And this new heart and new life God alone can give to him. One great sentence was spoken by Jesus at this time. Here it is. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believed on him should not perish, but have eternal life. End of the Lord in his temple. Recording by Jakub Tuček. Chapter 20 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com. Org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 20 At the Old Well. After the Passover, Jesus went teaching through the villages in Judea, the province or part of the land around Jerusalem. As Judea was the largest of the five provinces, it gave its name also to the whole land, which was called both Judea and the land of Israel. John the Baptist was still preaching and baptizing, although the crowds which now came to hear him were not so great as before. While John was near the Sea of Galilee, Jesus stayed in Judea, 
so that none might think that he was trying to draw the people away from John. But after a time, Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison by Herod Antipas, the wicked ruler of Galilee and Perea. Herod had stolen from his brother Philip his wife named Herodias, and was living with her. John said to him, It is against the law of Moses and of God for you to take away your brother's wife. This made Herod angry with John and Herodias even more angry. She wished to have John put to death for his bold words. But Herod, though he was not a good man, was unwilling to have John slain, and partly to keep him safe from the hate of his wife, he ordered that he should be put into prison. To a man like John, used to the free life of the wilderness, and not even willing to live in town or village, it must have been hard to be shut up in a prison cell, within four walls, and to be able only to see the outside world through grated windows. As soon as Jesus learned that John the Baptist was shut up in prison, he ended his work in Judea, and with his disciples started for Galilee, his old home in the north. On this journey he did not go the way of the river Jordan, but took the most direct road which would lead him through the land of Samaria. He knew that the Samaritan people who lived in that land hated the Jews and often robbed them when they traveled through their country. Still, Jesus made up his mind to go through Samaria. Leading the little company of his followers, he walked northward from Jerusalem, past Bethel, where long before Jacob, lying on his pillow of stone, had his wonderful dream of the ladder reaching up to heaven, past Shiloh, where once the holy ark of God had been kept in the tabernacle in the days of Samuel, and over mountains where battles had been fought and victories won. Early one morning, after walking in the night, Jesus and his disciples came to an old well, about two miles from the city of Shechem. Nearby was a little village named Sychar, which could be seen from the well, and although it was a Samaritan village, the followers of Jesus went to it to buy some food. This well was very old. It had been dug by Jacob, the early father of all the Israelite people, more than 1,800 years before Jesus came to that place. And it is still there, a well dug out of the solid rock nearly 100 feet and even now having water in it ten months of the year, but apt to be dry in the summer. That well is now nearly four thousand years old, yet every traveler who visits it may look down into its depths, may see a bucket of water drawn, and may have a drink from it. In that time a well did not have with it a pump for bringing up the water, nor was there even a rope to let down into it. But each one who came to draw water, and it was generally a woman, brought a rope and a water jar. As Jesus sat beside the well, very tired and hungry and thirsty, he had nothing with which to draw water. As the Son of God upon the earth, he could have made the water come to him. But he would not, for you remember that in the desert Jesus would do no wonderful work, no miracle merely for his own need. Suddenly Jesus heard the sound of someone coming. He looked up and saw a woman with her water jar and rope standing by the well. From her dress he knew that she was not a Jewish but a Samaritan woman, and being the Son of God he saw more. He knew at once all her life, which had not been a good life, but he looked into her heart and saw that she had a longing after God and after good. He said to her, Will you give me a drink of water from this well? The woman glanced at Jesus, and knowing from his dress and his manner of speaking that he was a Jew, said to him, How is it that you, who are a Jew, ask drink from me, a Samaritan woman? 
the Jews looked down upon the Samaritans, never asked any favors of them, and would not drink from a cup or pitcher that a Samaritan had handled. The woman knew this, and was greatly surprised that this strange young man of the Jewish race should speak to her. Jesus answered her, If you knew what God's free gift is, and who he is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him instead, and he would have given you living water. As Jesus said these words, very thoughtfully, the woman, looking and listening, felt that this was no common man. She thought that he might be a prophet, a man whom God has sent to do mighty works and speak the words of God. She said, very respectfully, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is very deep. Where can you get your living water? Are you a greater man than our father Jacob, who dug this well and gave it to us, and drank of its water himself, with his sons and his sheep and oxen? Jesus answered her, Anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but anyone who drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst any more. The water that I will give him will turn into a well of water springing up to everlasting life. Oh, sir, said the woman, give me some of your living water, so that I need not be thirsty, nor come all this road to draw water. Jesus looked earnestly at the woman's face and then said to her, Go home, call your husband, and come here again. The woman's face clouded. Her eyes dropped, and she looked as if she felt ashamed, while she answered in a low voice, I have no husband. Jesus looked at her steadily and said, You have spoken the truth. You have no husband, but you have had five husbands, and the man with whom you are living now is not your husband. You spoke the truth in those words. The woman was filled with wonder as she heard the stranger speak. She saw at once that here was a man who knew everything. She was sure that God had spoken to this man and given him this knowledge of her. Sir, said she, I see that you are a prophet of God. Tell me then whether our people or the Jews are right. Our fathers have worshipped God on this mountain, but the Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where all should go to worship God. As she spoke, she pointed to the mountain that was standing near, Mount Gerizim, on the top of which was the temple of the Samaritans. Woman, believe me, answered Jesus, there is coming a time when men shall worship God in other places besides this mountain and Jerusalem. The time is near. It has even now come when the true worshippers everywhere shall pray to the Father in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, dwelling everywhere. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming, the Christ, sent from God to be our king. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus said to her, I who am now speaking to you am he, the Christ. Just at that moment the followers of Jesus, John and Peter, and the others, came back from the village with the food which they had bought. They were surprised to find their master talking with a woman, but they said nothing. The woman had come to the well to draw water, but in her interest in this wonderful stranger, she forgot all about her errand. Leaving her water jar, she ran back to the village and said to everybody whom she met, Come with me and meet a man who told me everything I have done in all my life. Is not this man the Christ whom we are looking for? After the woman went away toward her home, the disciples urged Jesus to eat some of the food which they had brought. A little while before, Jesus had been hungry, but now in talking with the woman and leading her mind to the truth, he had forgotten his own needs. I have food to eat, said he, that you know nothing of. They looked at each other and said, Can it be that someone has brought him something to eat? But Jesus said to them, 
My food is to do the will of my Father who sent me into the world, and to finish the work that he gave me to do. Do you say that there are four months before the harvest time will come? I tell you, look on the fields and find them already white for the harvest. You shall reap and gain a rich harvest, gathering grain for everlasting life. Jesus meant that this woman, bad though she may have been before, was now eager to hear his words and to come to God. So his disciples would soon find the hearts of men everywhere, like a field of ripe grain, ready to be won and to be saved. Soon the woman came back to the well with many of her people. They all asked Jesus to come to their village and teach them. He went to the town of Sychar and stayed there two days, talking to the people about the kingdom of God and showing them how they might enter into it. Many of the people in that place and near it believed in Jesus as the Christ, the King sent from God, and they said, Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is really the Savior of the world. End of chapter 20 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Chapter 21 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cy Young, Jr. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. Chapter 21. The Nobleman's Boy. After staying two days in Sychar, the village near Jacob's well, Jesus and his disciples went on their way northward to the land of Galilee. They walked across the great plain where so many battles had been fought in the old times and climbed the mountains beyond it. Nazareth, where Jesus had lived for so many years, was on his way. But Jesus did not, at this time, stop there, for he had in his mind to visit a few weeks later. With his followers, Jesus came for the second time to Cana, the place where, a few months before, he had turned the water into wine. When Jesus was at Cana at his first visit, very few people had heard his name. But now everybody was talking about him, for all the people who had come home from the feast of the Passover told their friends and neighbors of the wonderful young prophet who had been preaching in Jerusalem and had driven the men buying and selling out of the temple and had wrought wonders in curing the sick. About 20 miles from Cana was the city of Capernaum, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. At Capernaum was living a man of high rank, an official of King Herod Antipas. This nobleman was in deep trouble, for his son was very ill with a great fever, and lying at the point of death. The news that Jesus was again in Galilee, and only 20 miles away, brought to the nobleman a hope that, perhaps this prophet might be willing to come down from Cana to Capernaum and cure his son. At once he made up his mind to go to Jesus and ask him to come and help him. It was a hard journey from Capernaum to Cana, 20 miles of mountain climbing, but this anxious father started very early in the morning and came to Cana at about one o'clock in the afternoon. He found Jesus, told him how ill his son was, and begged him to come to Capernaum and cure him. Jesus did not seem very willing to go. He said to the nobleman, Unless you people are always seeing me do wonderful works, you will not believe in me. Oh, sir, pleaded the troubled father, do come down quickly, or my son will die. There is no need for me to come, said Jesus. You may go home, for your son will live and will get well. These words would make a heavy trial to this man's faith in Jesus. For how could he know that his son would be well without any sign given him by Jesus. And how could he understand that Jesus, by a word, could cure someone who he had not seen and who was 20 miles away? But the father at once believed the promise of Jesus. He did not even hurry home to see if his boy was cured, but waited until evening before starting upon his journey. The next day, as he was nearing home, his servants met him with the glad news, your son is living and is very much better. At what time, said the nobleman, did he begin to improve? 
It was yesterday, they told him, at about one o'clock when the fever left him. The man was not surprised, for it was just as he had expected. That hour, one o'clock, was the very time that Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. This miracle, or work of wonder, was much talked about and led not only this nobleman, but all his family with him, to believe that Jesus was the Savior and the King of Israel, who had been promised so long. End of chapter 21. Recording by Cy Young, Jr. Chapter number 22 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Scudder. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. The Carpenter in His Hometown. Soon after the visit to Cana and the cure of the nobleman's son, Jesus walked over to his old home at Nazareth, which was only six miles away. He thought of his sisters in that city, who were now grown women with children of their own, and he longed to see them. He thought, too, of the boys with whom in other days he had played and had sat in the school, now men with families, of his former neighbors, whom he had not seen for nearly a year. His heart was full of love for his own people, and he felt that out of the power God had given him, he could speak to them words that would do them good. Of course, the people of Nazareth had heard wonderful stories about their former townsmen, that he had suddenly come forth as a great teacher, speaking truths such as never been heard before, and especially they had done wondrous deeds of curing the sick at Cana and at Capernaum. All these reports were surprising to the people of Nazareth, because among them Jesus had never shown any signs of greatness. He had sat in his seat in the church, but had never spoken from the pulpit, and they had known him as a good young man, kind and gentle toward all, and an honest, skillful workman at his trade. But they had never thought of him as a teacher or a prophet bearing a message from God, or as a worker of wonders, such as they had heard of his doing in Cana and Capernaum. It was expected that Jesus on the Sabbath day would speak in the church at Nazareth. They called their church the synagogue, a word that means a meeting of the people. And everybody was present to see him and to hear him. In a gallery on one side were his sisters looking and listening, but unseen, because the women's gallery in all Jewish churches was covered with a latticework. There on the floor, seated on rugs or mats, were his neighbors and the people who had seen him grow up from a boy to a man. They were present not to learn, but to listen and judge his words, and especially to see what great things he might do. Jesus walked up to the platform, and the officer in charge handed him the rolls on which were written the lessons for the day. The officer was at the same time the janitor or keeper of the building, and the teacher of the school held there during the week. The man may have been the teacher who had taught Jesus as a boy to read. One of the lessons for that day was in the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah the prophet. A part of it read thus, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath set me apart to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to say that the prisoners shall be set free, that the blind shall have their sight again, that the poor and suffering shall be given freedom, that the time of favor from God has come. While Jesus was reading from the Bible, he stood up, and all who were present also stood, for the Jews showed the respect for the Bible by standing whenever it was read. When he had finished the reading, he folded up the roll, handed it back to the officer, and sat down, and the people also sat down likewise. Often the man who preached in the synagogue or church was seated while speaking. Jesus began by saying, Today this word of the prophet has come to pass in your hearing. And he went on to tell in simple, gentle words how he had been sent to preach to the poor, to set the prisoners free, to give sight to the blind, and to bring the news of God's goodness to men. At first the people listened with the deepest interest, 
and their hearts were touched by his kind and tender words. But soon they began to whisper among themselves. One said, Why should this carpenter try to teach us? And another, This man is no teacher. He is only the son of Joseph, the carpenter. We know his brothers and his sisters are living here. And some began to say, Why does he not do here some of the wonderful things that they say he has done in other places? We want to see some of his marvelous cures with sick people. Jesus knew their thoughts, but he would not do wonders merely to be seen by men. He said to them, I know that you are saying, let us see some wonderful work, like that on the nobleman's son in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, that no prophet or teacher has honor among his own people. You remember that in the days of Elijah the prophet, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and no rain fell, there was a great famine in the land and a need for bread. At that time there were many widows in the land of Israel, yet Elijah was not sent to any of these, but to a widow named Zarephath of Zidon, a foreigner and a Gentile. And in the time of Elisha the prophet after Elijah, there were many lepers in the land of Israel, yet none of these was made clean of his leprosy, but only Naaman the Syrian. These words, telling how God had chosen foreigners instead of Israelites for his works of wonder, made the people in the church very angry, for they did not care for the words of Jesus. They only wished to see him do some miracle or wonderful act. They would not listen to him. In their rage and fury, they leapt from their seats. They rushed upon the platform. They seized hold of Jesus and dragged him out of doors. They took him up to the top of the hill above the city and would have thrown him down the steep side to his death. But the time for Jesus to die had not yet come. By the power of God, Jesus slipped quietly out of their hands and went away. He walked away very sadly from Nazareth, where he had longed to bring the good news of God's blessing, first of all, to his own people. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of Hurlbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria de Fatima da Silva Hurlbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbert Four Fishermen Called the place which Jesus chose for his home after being driven away from Nazareth was Capernaum. This was a large city on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Only one city beside the lake was larger, Tiberius. That was a new city built by Herod, the ruler of Galilee, and named after the emperor Tiberius at Rome. But Tiberius was not a Jewish city. It contained temples to idols, its people were foreigners, and very few Jews were willing to live within its walls. Then, too, Herod Antipas lived there in a palace which he had built, and Jesus did not wish to be near Herod. But Capernaum was a Jewish city, and Jesus felt that his work was to be among the Jews. At least four of the early followers of Jesus lived in Capernaum, Two pairs of brothers, Simon and Andrew, the sons of Jonas, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. These four men were partners with Zebedee in the fishing trade. They owned a number of fishing boats and had men working for them. The lake was full of fish, and many people all around it lived by fishing. The fish in the Sea of Galilee were good food and were sent to all the nearby cities. It is said that one emperor at Rome, not long after this time, had sent to him every week a barrel full of fish from the Sea of Galilee for his table in the palace. The people of Capernaum had heard of Jesus, for all those who went up to the feasts in Jerusalem brought home reports of this wonderful teacher and heal of the sick. Wherever Jesus went, crowds gathered around him to listen to his words, and especially eager to see if he would do any of his wonderful works. One morning, while Jesus was walking on the beach, he met some of his followers. 
Having now come to their own home, these men had gone back to their old work as fishermen, and their boats were lying upon the shore. The men had been fishing in the night before, and they were now washing their nets upon the beach. Jesus spoke to one of his followers, Simon Peter, to push his boat a little way out into the water. He did so, and then Jesus sat down in the boat while a great crowd stood on the shore, but within reach of his voice. Then from the boat, as a pulpit, he talked to the people on the shore. What he said at that time was not written down, but it was very much like his teachings as given in the Sermon on the Mount, which may be read in the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters of the Gospel by Matthew. There is no doubt that in his talks in many places to different crowds, Jesus often gave the same teachings over and over again. After Jesus had ended his speaking to the people, he said to Simon, who with the other fishermen was standing beside him, Push out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch of fish. Master, answered Simon, We worked all last night and caught not a single fish. However, if you tell us to try again, I will let down the nets. They did so, and now their nets took in a great shoal of fish, so large a number that the nets began to break. Then they beckoned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and helped pull up the nets and to empty the fish into the boats. So many were the fish that they filled both the boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw all this, he was struck with wonder and with fear, for he felt that this had been done by the power of God. He fell upon his knees in the boat to Jesus, saying, O oh Lord, I am full of sin, and am not worthy of all this. Leave me, O oh Lord. But Jesus said to him, and to the other three men with him, Do not be afraid, come after me, and from this time you shall be fishers of men. He meant that they were now to leave their nets and their boats to stay with him, and after learning from him, they were to go out and show men the way out of sin into the kingdom of God. As soon, therefore, as they had brought their nets and their fishes to the land, they left them with Zebedee, the father of James and John, and with the hired men. From that day, these four men stayed with Jesus and went with him on all his journeys, listening to his words, until from hearing them often, they learned them and could repeat them to others. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria de Fatima da Silva. Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Herbert. Jesus in the church, in the house, and in the street. The story of the great catch of fish was told abroad, for many saw the boats loaded with the fish brought to the shore, and we may be sure that all who ate a breakfast of those fish spoke of the wonder. Partly as a result of this report, when the Sabbath day came, the church in Capernaum was crowded with people to see and hear this new rabbi. Rabbi was the name that Jews gave to men who taught the law in their churches. Although Jesus had never taken the course of study at Jerusalem, which would give him that title, he was generally called Rabbi by the people. The people listened with wonder to the words of Jesus, for his teaching was very different from that of the scribes who taught the law. He spoke on great things, the kingdom which God was soon to set up and how the people would be made ready for his coming. Then, too, he spoke with power, as Lord of all, and the listeners felt that these were the words of one who had been sent by God. While Jesus was speaking in the church, the service was stopped by the loud screaming of a furious man who had come in. This man was suffering with a terrible evil, worse than any disease. 
into his body had come in some way an evil spirit, a demon. This demon controlled the man and drove him to wild acts and words. The words which were spoken by this man's tongue were not his own, but the words of the wicked spirit within him. The spirit, using the man's voice, shrieked aloud, Ha! Ah, you Jesus of Nazareth, let us alone! What business have you with us? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's Holy One. But Jesus at once said to the wicked spirit in the man, Be still and come out of him. At these words, the demon threw the man down upon the floor, as if to kill him, and then went out of the man suddenly, leaving him almost dead. Soon they found that the man, whom everybody had feared before, so fierce had he been, was now perfectly well and quite free from the evil spirit. Then surprise and wonder came upon all. They talked about it to one another, saying, What does all this mean? What new teaching is this? Why, this man speaks to the evil spirits with power, and they obey him and come out. As the people left the church, they told everyone whom they met of this mighty act of Jesus. These men and women told others, and soon the news of Jesus' power went through all the towns and villages in that part of the land. After the service in the church was over, Jesus went home to dine in the house of Simon and Andrew, and with him went also the two brothers, James and John. In the house they told him that Simon's mother-in-law, the mother of his wife, was very ill, having a high fever. He came, stood by her bed, leaned over her, and took her by the hand as if to raise her up. As he touched her, she felt a new power shoot through her body. Instantly the fever left her. She rose up from her bed perfectly well and helped to make ready the dinner and serve it. Jesus stayed in Simon's house that afternoon. When the sun went down and the Sabbath was ended, they found a crowd of people filling the street in front of the house. From all parts of the city they had brought people that were sick or had evil spirits like the man whom Jesus had cured in the church. As he came out of the house, he laid his hands upon these sick people one by one, and as soon as he touched them, they rose up well. The evil spirits in some of the men tried to speak to him, but he would not allow them, and gave them command at once to come out of the men in whom they were. They dared not to disobey Jesus, came out and went away. On that night, while everybody was sleeping, Jesus rose up long before day, while it was still dark, and went out of the city. He found a quiet place, with no houses or people near, and there for hours he prayed to his father. In the morning he was missed, and Simon Peter, with the others, went out to look for him. They found him and said to him, Master, come back to the city, for everybody is looking for you. But Jesus said, I was sent not only to your city, but to other places also. Let us go out and visit the towns that are near. It was for this purpose that I have been sent by my father, to preach everywhere the good news of the kingdom of God. End of chapter 24Chapter number 25 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Scudder. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. The Leper and the Palsied Man. From the city of Capernaum, Jesus went forth and visited all the villages on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee and on the mountains nearby. He took with him his disciples or followers that they might see his works and listen to his words. Great crowds of people came to hear him during this journey, and everywhere he cured all kinds of sickness and cast out of men evil spirits that were ruling them. At one place a man came to Jesus who was covered with a dreadful disease called leprosy and was called a leper. 
No one ever touched a leper or even came near him, for they feared that a touch might cause the disease. A leper was driven out of his home to live with other lepers in a camp outside the city. When he saw anyone coming near, he must stand at a distance, must cover his mouth with his garment, not to let his breath reach anybody, and must call out, Unclean! Unclean! so that no one might take his disease. Many lepers were in the land when Jesus was preaching, and lepers may still be seen in that country. This leper who saw Jesus came as near to him as he dared. He knelt down before Jesus, touching his head to the ground, and called out to him, Oh, sir, if you choose to do it, you can take away my leprosy and make my flesh pure and clean. Jesus was not afraid to touch the leper. He went to him and placed his hand upon him. Then he said, I do choose, be clean. And at once all this man's leprosy passed away. His skin lost its waxen deadly whiteness. His eyes were bright. His deformed hands became perfect. And his voice was no longer hollow and cracked. He was no more a leper, but was a man in perfect health. Jesus said to him, Do not tell anyone of your cure. But go to the priest in the temple, let him see that you are clean, and make the offering of thanksgiving to God. Let the priest give you a writing to show that you are well, and then go to your own home. Jesus knew that if this man should tell very many of his cure, there would come such a crowd of people having diseases of all kinds, seeking to be made well, that he could have no time nor chance to preach the gospel. And his great purpose was not to cure disease, but to teach men the way to God. It is better to be saved from sin than to be cured of sickness. But this man was so happy at being made well that he could not be still. Everywhere he went, he told people of his wonderful cure and roused such a desire among the people to see Jesus that Jesus could not go to the cities, for so great were the crowds that he could no longer preach. Everybody was eager to be cured of some illness or to see Jesus cure others. Jesus was driven to seek the open country where few people lived, and even there the crowd sought him, coming from many places. After some time, Jesus came again to Capernaum, which was now his home. As soon as the people heard of his return, they gathered in great crowds to see him, to hear him, and to be cured of their diseases. He stood on the porch of a house where every room was full of people, and a company was in front of him, crowding the court of the house to its utmost corner. In this throng were some who were ready to believe in Jesus. But there were also some men who had come from Judea to see who Jesus was, what he was teaching, and what he was doing. These men did not believe in Jesus, but were there to find some fault with him. They belonged to a class called the Pharisees, who claimed to be better than others, because they carefully kept all the rules of the Jewish law, but in their hearts they were far from good, and they were bitterly opposed to Jesus. While Jesus was speaking, four men came, carrying on a bed a man who was sick with the palsy, a disease which makes one helpless, unable to use his hands to walk or to stand alone. They were very eager to bring this man to Jesus to be cured, but on account of the crowd they could not come into the house or even into the yard in front of it, they were bound, however, in some way to get this palsy man to Jesus. They climbed up to the roof of the house and pulled the sick man up. Then they broke open the roof, never minding the dust and litter that fell upon the heads of the people below. When they had made an opening large enough, they let the man down, wrapped in a blanket and lying upon a mattress, right in front of Jesus. All this showed their faith in Jesus. They believed that he could cure the palsied man, and were ready to take any trouble to bring him before the Savior. Jesus looked at the man and said to him, My son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. Some of these Pharisees, the enemies of Jesus, were sitting near, and as they heard these words, they thought in their own minds, though they did not speak it aloud, What wicked words are these? This man speaks as though he were God. No man has the right to forgive sins. That belongs to God alone. What wickedness for this man to pretend to have God's power. Jesus knew their thoughts, for he could look into their hearts. He said to them, Why do you think wicked things in your hearts? Which is the easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise up and walk? 
But I will show you that while I am on the earth as the Son of Man, God has given me the power to take away sin. Then he turned to the palsied man lying on the couch and said with a voice of power, I tell you, rise up, take up your bed, and go to your house. In an instant, a new life came to the palsied man. He stood upon his feet in full strength, rolled up his blanket, took up the mattress upon which he had been lying, placed it upon his shoulder, and walked out through the crowd, which opened to make a way for him. Through the streets, the man went to his home, praising God for his cure. By this act of healing, Jesus had shown that he was a son of God with the right to forgive the sins of men. These Pharisees, the enemies of Jesus, could find nothing to say, but in their hearts they hated him more than before, for they saw that the people believed on Jesus. Wonder filled the minds of those who saw this cure. They praised the God of Israel and said to each other, We have seen strange things today. End of chapter 25。Chapter 26 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 26 How the Tax Collector Became a Disciple. So great were the crowds gathering from all parts of the land to see and hear Jesus that no place could be found in the city of Capernaum large enough to hold the multitudes. The church was far too small, and there were no open places in the city where so great a company could meet. So every day Jesus went out of the city to the seaside, sometimes sitting in Peter's boat, sometimes upon the shore, while all the people stood upon the grass-covered hillside with the blue sky above them, and the blue lake before them, while Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God and showed how every man could enter into the kingdom by turning from his sins and doing God's will. Among these crowds of people, Jesus noticed one man standing who listened closely to every word. This man was named Levi Matthew. He was an officer of the government called a publican, and it was his work to gather the taxes which the Roman rulers had laid upon the people. Everybody was called upon to pay money to the Romans, who were the rulers of the land. The people hated the Romans, who held the land under their power, and hated also these tax-gatherers, who were often selfish and unjust men, making the people pay more than they should, robbing the poor, and taking much of the money for themselves, instead of paying it to the Roman treasury." Because many of these tax-gatherers or publicans were cruel and selfish, all of them were looked upon as wicked. They were called publicans and sinners, and the people despised them. One day Jesus was passing the office where Levi sat at his table, receiving the tax-money from the people. Jesus looked at the publican and said to him, Come, follow me. At once Levi Matthew rose up, left his clerks and helpers to care for the money on the table, and went after Jesus. From that hour he was no longer a tax collector. He became a disciple of Jesus and followed him wherever he went, 
listening to his words and keeping them in his mind and memory. Many years afterward, when Jesus was no longer among men, Matthew wrote a book telling what Jesus said and did. That book is the Gospel according to Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, and it tells what Matthew remembered of the teachings and acts of the Lord Jesus. So it was well for the people who lived after the time of Jesus, and for the people who through the ages since have read that gospel, and for the millions all over the world who now read it, that Matthew, the tax gatherer, became a disciple of Jesus. But for this man's prompt obedience to Christ's call on that day, that precious book would never have been written. Matthew wished his fellow publicans to meet Jesus and hear his words. He gave a supper at his house to Jesus and invited all the publicans or tax gatherers in that part of the country to come. Many of them came and with their friends sat down to the supper with Jesus. The Pharisees, who were enemies of Jesus, looked scornfully at Jesus sitting at the table with all the tax collectors around him. They said to the disciples of Jesus, Why does your teacher eat with those publicans and sinners? They told Jesus of these words, and he answered, those who are well and strong have no need of a doctor, but only those who are sick. I did not come to call those who think themselves good, but those who know that they are sinners and want to be saved. But let those Pharisees learn the meaning of the text where God says, I prefer those who show kindness and mercy to those who make sacrifices upon the altar. This pointed to the Pharisees themselves, for while they were careful about fasting and saying their prayers and making their offerings in the temple, they were often unjust and hard toward the poor. End of chapter 26。Chapter 27 of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Patterson of Monmouth County. New Jersey. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 27 The Cripple at the Bath. The time came for another feast at Jerusalem, and as on the year before, Jesus went to attend it. We do not know whether his disciples were with him on this visit, for in the story, as given by John in his Gospel, they are not mentioned. On one Sabbath day, while Jesus was in the city, he walked past a public bath not far from the temple. It was a large pool or cistern, where several could bathe at once, and beside it were five porches forming an arched-over platform. These porches, when Jesus came to the pool, were crowded with people, all suffering with disease. Some were blind, some were lame, and some had legs or arms, all withered and palsied. At certain times the water in this bath used to bubble and rise up. Then it would go down again and be quiet. The people believed that this bubbling up of the water was caused by an angel, whom no one could see, going down and stirring up the pool. They believed, too, 
that at such times when the water bubbled up, any person who was ill would be cured by taking a bath in the pool. We know that there are many springs whose water will cure diseases, and this pool may have been one of these health-giving springs. Jesus saw lying there upon a mat beside the bath one man who had been helpless, unable to walk for almost forty years. Jesus, who knew all things, knew that this man had been ill for a long time. He said to him, Would you like to be made well? This man had never seen Jesus before and did not know who he was. Sir, he answered, there is nobody to put me in the bath when the water rises. But while I am trying to crawl down and get into the water, somebody who can walk steps in ahead of me. Jesus said, rise, take up your mat and walk. The crippled man had never heard words like these, but as soon as they were spoken, he felt a new power shooting through his body. He stood up for the first time in 38 years, picked up his piece of matting, rolled it up, and put it upon his shoulder. Then he started to walk toward his house, carrying his burden. You remember that it was on the Sabbath day that this took place. The Jews were exceedingly careful in keeping the Sabbath. God had said to their fathers many years before, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the Jews had added to this commandment many useless rules. They could not light a fire on that day, for that would be working. They could not hold a pen, for that would be carrying a load. These little rules had not been given by God, but had been made by the scribes or teachers of the law. Some people saw this man carrying his roll of matting through the street. They said to him, Stop! Don't you know this is the Sabbath day? You have no right to be carrying your bed. The man did not lay down his load. He said, A man saw me helpless by the pool for I was nearly forty years a cripple. This man made me well, and he it was who said to me, Take up your mat and walk. Who was this man? said the Jews. Who told you to carry your bed on the Sabbath day? The man who had been cured did not know who it was that had cured him, for many were standing near, and after healing the man, Jesus had walked away without being noticed. Soon after, the man went up to the temple to give thanks to God for his cure, and there he met his healer and learned for the first time his name. Jesus said to him at that time, You are now free from the disease which for so many years has made you helpless. Do not sin any more against God, or something worse will come to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had cured him. The leaders among the Jews, the priests, the scribes and the Pharisees were very angry at Jesus because he had made this man well on the Sabbath and because he had told the man to carry his mat on that day. The rulers tried to stir up the people against Jesus, saying that he was a Sabbath breaker and nobody should listen to his words. But Jesus said to them, My father works on all days doing good to men, and I do only what he does. He meant to show them that God sends his sunshine and his rain every day in the week, causing the grass and the grain and the flowers to grow as much on the Sabbath as any other days, and that it was right for him and for every man to do good works, helping men and curing their sickness on the Sabbath day. But his words only made the Jews all the more angry, because he had spoken of God as his father, making himself they said, equal with God. They would have killed him if they could, so great was their hate against him. Jesus did not stay long in Jerusalem at this visit. Soon after the feast, he went again to his home at Capernaum. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Patterson.
Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 28 The Lord of the Sabbath The question whether Jesus was a Sabbath breaker or not arose again soon after he came back to Galilee. On a Sabbath day Jesus was walking with his disciples through the fields of grain. Some of the disciples were hungry, and as they walked, picked the heads of the wheat, rubbed them in their hands, blew away the chaff, and ate the kernels of grain. The law of the Israelites allowed anyone walking by a field of grain to help himself to all that he wished to eat, but forbade him to take any to his home. But to the Pharisees, who were very exact in their rules of keeping the Sabbath, to pluck the grain was the same as reaping it with a sickle, to carry it in the hand was the same as bearing a load, and to rub it in the hands was the same as thrashing, and to do these on the seventh day of the week was breaking the Sabbath. These were the rules, not given by God, but made by the scribes. And Jesus had already taught his disciples to pay no attention to them. The Pharisees were constantly watching Jesus and his followers to catch them, if possible, in doing or saying something that might be thought wrong. They said to Jesus, Do you see that your disciples are doing what is forbidden on the Sabbath day, picking the ears of grain, carrying handfuls of them, and rubbing them in their hands? Have you never read, answered Jesus, what David did when he was flying from King Saul, how he went into the house of God and took away the holy bread, laid it on the table as an offering to God, which was to be eaten by the priests only, ate it himself and gave it to the men that were with him. And do you not know that the priests in the temple do all kinds of work, killing animals for the offering, placing wood on the altar, and many other things? Yet they do right, for these things are necessary, and whatever is needful may be done on God's holy day. The Sabbath was made for the good of man and not man for the Sabbath. I tell you that one greater than the temple is here, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath day, Jesus went into the church to worship God and to preach the word. A man was there whose hand was withered and helpless. The Pharisees watched Jesus to see if he would cure this man on the Sabbath. They hoped he would cure him, not because they cared for the poor crippled man, but because they were eager to find something to say against Jesus. Jesus spoke to the man with a withered hand. Stand up and come forward. The man stood up before them all, and then Jesus, looking straight at his enemies, said, Is it against the law on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm? to save a life, or to try to kill a man, as you are trying to do. If one of you men owns a single sheep, and he should happen on the Sabbath day to find it fallen into a pit, would he not take hold of it and lift it out? And how much more is a man worth than a sheep? Thus it is right to do a kind and helpful act on the Sabbath. He looked around sternly at his enemies, being sad and grieved because their hearts were so hard. They did not have a word to say, and after waiting a moment, he turned to the man with the withered hand and said, Stretch out your hand. He reached out his arm, and the withered hand was at once made well and strong, as sound as the other. Jesus went away, but the Pharisees were filled with anger against him. They talked together, seeking some way to kill Jesus, and they called upon the friends of King Herod, the ruler of Galilee to see if they could not persuade the king to order that Jesus should be put to death. But Jesus went on teaching and curing those that were sick, paying no attention to the plans of his enemies. He told those whom he cured not to go out and speak to others about him, but to stay quietly at home, for the crowds coming to hear him were already great, and he did not wish them to be any greater. So many people came together from all parts of the land, and even from places outside the land of Israel, from the country of Tyre and Sidon on the north, and from Edom or Idumea on the south. They thronged around Jesus and pressed upon him, so that he spoke to his disciples to have a little boat at hand, to wait upon him and take him out into the lake for quiet and rest. End of chapter 28「Chapter 29 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Jesus on the Mountain. About twelve miles southwest from Capernaum, and six miles west of the Sea of Galilee, stands a mountain which can be seen many miles away. It is now called Kern Hatton, which means the double horns of Hatton. The name is given because the mountain has two tops, one at each end, and a wide hollow between them, its form making it look somewhat like a saddle or a camel, with two humps. Near this mountain, roads ran to almost every part of the land of Israel, so that from every place it could be reached. The word went throughout the land that Jesus was coming to this mountain, and a great multitude of people gathered in the hollow place between its two crowns, all waiting to see Jesus. He came to the mountain and went up alone to one of its hilltops. All night Jesus was there in prayer with his heavenly Father, for he had an important work to do, and before any great work Jesus prayed to God. In the morning he called forth out of the vast company of people before him twelve men, who were to be with him all the time, go with him wherever he should go, listen to his teachings, and learn them by heart, and be ready to preach his words when he should send them out. These twelve men Jesus afterward called apostles, which means men sent out, but they were generally named the twelve. They are also spoken of as the disciples, although the word disciples is also used of all the followers of Jesus. Most of the twelve men had been called before, and had been for some time with Jesus. Others were new men whom Jesus called now for the first time. Their names are arranged in prayers, two of them together. They were Simon Peter and Andrew his brother, James and John the sons of Zebedee, Philip and his friend Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel. Thomas and Matthew, who had been tax collectors, James, the son of Alphaeus, another Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who afterward became the traitor and sold his lord to his enemies. About most of these men we know very little, but some of them in later years did a great work for the Church of Christ. Simon Peter was always a leader among the twelve, being a man of quick mind and ready words and John, long after that time, wrote the Gospel according to John, one of the most wonderful books in the world. In the sight of all the people, Jesus called these men to stand by his side. Then he came down from the mountain top to the hollow place between the two summits. He sat down with his twelve chosen men around him, and beyond this a great crowd of people. To the twelve and to the listening multitude, Jesus preached that great sermon, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew wrote it down, and you can read it in his Gospel, the first book of the New Testament, in the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters. How fortunate it was that Jesus called the tax-gatherer to be one of his disciples, a man who could remember and write his great sermon for all the world to read. We give here only a few parts from this Sermon on the Mount. Jesus began with words of comfort to his followers. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he spoke to his disciples of what they were to be among men. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, and to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. He went on, perhaps pointing to a town not far away, built on the top of the hill, and seen everywhere around. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on the stand, and it giveth light to all the house. Even so let your light shine before men, 
that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He told his disciples how they should feel and act toward those who had done wrong to them. Ye have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who do you wrong, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the bad as well as the good, and sins reign alike on the just and on the unjust. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Why, the tax gatherers whom you despise do as much. And if you speak only to your friends, wherein are you better than others? For even the Gentiles do the same. You should be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He also spoke of the aims which men should seek in their lives. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, who is the God worshipped by this world. Therefore I say to you, do not be anxious for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor for your body what ye shall put on. Surely life means more than food. Surely the body means more than clothes. Look at the birds flying above you. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than the birds? And why should you be anxious about your clothing? Look how the lilies of the field grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet Solomon in all his glory was never robed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the fields, which blooms today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, O you who trust God so little? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we have to eat? Or what shall we have to drink? Or how can we get clothes to wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek the kingdom of God, and do right according to his will. Then all these things will be yours. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Each day's own trouble is enough to be anxious over. Here is what Jesus said to the ending of his sermon. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them is like a wise man who built his house upon rock. The rain fell, the floods rose, the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall, for it was founded upon rock. And every one that hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods rose, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were filled with wonder at his way of teaching. He spoke with the authority of a master, unlike their own scribes. Most of the scribes, when they were teaching, would speak in the name of earlier teachers and say, Rabbi Jonathan said this, or Rabbi Hillel said that. But Jesus spoke in his own name, saying, I say this to you. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of Hilbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Slick. Hilbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hilbert. The Good Army Captain. At Capernaum there was an officer of the Roman army, a captain, having under him a company of one hundred men. This man was not of the Jewish people, but a Gentile, which was the name that the Jews gave to all people outside of their own race. All the world, except themselves, the Jews called the Gentiles. 
This army captain was a good man, and he was very friendly to the Jews, because through them he had heard of the true God and had learned to worship him. Out of his love for the Jews, he had built for them with his own money a church and had given it to them. This may have been the very church in which Jesus taught on the Sabbath days. The army captain had a young servant, a boy whom he loved greatly, and this boy was very sick with the palsy and near to death. The army captain had heard that Jesus could cure those who were sick, and he asked the chief men of the church, who were called its elders, to go to Jesus and ask him to come to the captain's house, that he might lay his hands on the boy and make him well. The elders spoke to Jesus soon after he came to Capernaum, after preaching on the mountain. They asked him to go with them to the captain's house and cure his servant, and they added, He is a worthy man, and it is fitting that you should help him. For though a Gentile, he loves our people, and he has built for us our church. Then Jesus said, I will go and cure him. But while Jesus was on his way to the captain's house, and with him the elders and a company of people who hoped to see another wonderful cure, he was met by some friends of the captain who brought this message. Lord, do not take the trouble to come to my house, for I am not worthy to have one so great as you are under my roof, and I sent to you because I am not worthy to speak to you myself, but speak only a word where you are, and my servant shall be made well. For although I am myself a man under authority and rule, I have soldiers under me to carry out my will. I say to one man, Go, and he goes. I say to another man, Come, and he comes. I tell my servant, Do this, and he does it. You too have power to command and be obeyed. Only speak the word, and my servant shall be cured. When Jesus heard this, he wondered at this man's faith. He turned to the crowd that followed and said, In truth I say to you all, I have not found such faith as this in all Israel. And I tell you further, that many like this man who are not Israelites shall come from places in the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But many of those who are of the children of Israel, because they have not believed, shall never enter into God's kingdom, but shall be thrust forth into the darkness outside. And Jesus said to those who came from the captain's house, Go back, and say to this man in my name, As you have believed, even so shall it be done to you. They went to the captain's house and found his servant who had been at the point of death, now free from his palsy, and brought back to perfect health. End of the Good Army Captain Recording by Slick Chapter 31 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. By Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 31 How Jesus Stopped a Funeral. Jesus went on a journey for preaching through the southern parts of Galilee, as before he had visited the villages among the mountains near the sea. He walked out of Capernaum with the twelve disciples and a crowd of followers which grew larger as he went on. They passed by Mount Tabor and just before sunset they came to a small city at the foot of another mountain, the hill Moray. This place was named Nain. Outside the gate, Jesus and his followers paused to allow a funeral procession to pass by. In front were women wailing aloud, flinging their arms up and down and chanting a song about the young man who had died. The body was wrapped in long strips of linen and was lying upon a couch, carried by bearers. After it walked an old woman, the young man's mother, who was a widow, burying her only son. And with her were many of the people in the city, showing their sorrow for the widow at the loss of her son. 
When Jesus saw this weeping mother, he felt a great pity for her, and said to her, Do not weep. He stepped forward and touched the couch on which the body was lying. The men who were carrying it stood still with wonder at the coming of this stranger, whose look showed power. Standing beside the dead young man, he said, Young man, I say unto you, Rise up. Instantly the young man sat up and began to speak. Jesus took him by the hand and gave him to his mother. She received him into her arms and found his cold body now warm with life, the dull eyes now bright. Her son that had died that day was alive once more. The people who were looking on now felt that indeed a marvelous work had been done. Many of them had seen Jesus before and knew him, and even those who had not seen him had heard of him, and said, This must be that great teacher from Nazareth. Many fell on their faces before him, and some said, A great prophet has come among us, and others said, Surely God has visited his people. The news that Jesus had raised a dead man to life spread through all the land and even to the countries around. More and more people after this sought to see Jesus and to hear his words. While Jesus was slowly journeying through southern Galilee, visiting the towns, teaching the people, and curing the sick, two men came asking to see him. These men were followers of John the Baptist who was still in the prison where Herod had sent him. In his prison, John heard of the works that Jesus was doing, and of the teaching that Jesus was giving. It may be that John was expecting Jesus to set up his kingdom at once, instead of merely going up and down the land as a teacher. Perhaps also John, shut up in prison, had grown discouraged and doubtful. In other days he had said to all the people that Jesus was the coming king, so high above him that he was not worthy to tie his shoestrings. But now these two men had brought from John this question to Jesus. John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the coming one, the promised king of Israel, or are we to look for another? Jesus did not at once answer this question. He acted for a time as though it had not been asked, and left these two men standing, while he turned to the people around him. At the Savior's feet were many suffering people, the sick brought upon couches by their friends, the blind crying for sight, the deaf and dumb holding out their hands toward him, the lepers with all their horrible sores, the wild people in whom were evil spirits. Jesus attended to the needs of all these sufferers. He laid his hands upon the sick, and they rose up well. He touched the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, and gave them their sight and hearing. He gave each leper a new, pure, perfect body, and he cast out the evil spirits by his words. Then he went on and made his usual talk to the crowds about the kingdom of God and how any man might come into it. When at last his morning's work of healing and teaching was over, he turned to these two message-bearers from John the Baptist and said to them, Go back and tell John in his prison what you have seen and heard. Here are men once blind who now can see lame men who now can walk, leprous men who have been made clean, deaf men made to hear, men having in them evil spirits who are now free from their power. You have heard, too, of dead men raised to life, and you have listened while the gospel has been preached to the poor. You go and tell John all these things that you have seen and heard, then let John think about these things, and judge whether I am not the one whom he promised would come. That was a far better way to bring John the Baptist back to believing fully in Jesus as the promised King of Israel and the Savior of the world 
than to send the answer back, Go and tell John that I am the Savior. For John's faith would be the stronger, because he would now have the proofs that Jesus was the promised Lord. After these messengers from John the Baptist had left, Jesus began to talk to the people about John. Some may have thought that in sending this question to Jesus, John had showed weakness and a change of his mind. Jesus said to the people, What was it that you went out to the desert to see? Was it a reed swayed to and fro by the wind? No, this man John was no weak, wind-shaken reed. Did you go out to look at a man clothed in the robes of a prince and eating delicate food? No, that skin-clad man in the desert was no such princely person. To see such people you go to the palaces of kings. Come, what did you go out to see? Was it a prophet? A man sent from God? Yes, I tell you, John the Baptist was indeed a prophet, and more than a prophet. He was the king's messenger to prepare the way for the king himself. Of a truth I tell you all, that no greater man was ever born into this world than John the Baptist, and yet he that is least in the kingdom of God is higher even than John. Jesus meant that those who could come into the kingdom of God, as those who heard the gospel might come, were higher than even the greatest of those who prepare the way for the kingdom. End of chapter 31 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Chapter 32 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by JennyVoice.com. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 32 The Sinful Woman Forgiven. While Jesus was passing through southern Galilee, in one place, a Pharisee named Simon invited him to his house for dinner. The Pharisees, you remember, were people who were supposed to be very religious because they carefully followed all the rules about praying at regular hours every day, whether on the street or in their homes, fasting or not taking food on certain days, going to church three times every week, and doing many things to be seen by others, while they were often sharp and hard in their dealings with men. They seemed to be good, but often were not as good as they seemed. Everywhere the Pharisees were, at heart, enemies of Jesus. They watched him, but in no friendly spirit. This Pharisee, Simon, wished to know Jesus and to talk with him, although he did not believe in him. But he felt that Jesus, being only a common carpenter who had turned rabbi or teacher, was below himself in rank, and he did not treat him with respect. When a great man came to the house, the servants took off his sandals and washed his feet. They dressed his hair and poured fragrant oil upon his head. None of these things had Simon done to Jesus. He merely invited him to his house, and without even giving him water to wash his feet, all dusty with walking, he pointed him to his place at the table. In that land, people did not sit down upon chairs at dinner. Around the table were placed couches or lounges, and on these the guest reclined, half lying and half sitting, their heads toward the table and their feet away from it. They could reach the table and help themselves to food or drink. Very little meat was eaten, and before being placed upon the table, it was always cut into small pieces so that the guests needed no knives or forks. After each course of the meal, a servant passed around a bowl of water and a towel and washed the hands of the guests. While Jesus and perhaps his disciples with him were at the table during the dinner, people were coming in and going out freely. Soon a woman came in, looked around, saw Jesus, and went toward the couch whereon he was lying. In her hand was a jar of fragrant oil. She broke the jar, not waiting to take out the stopple, and poured the oil upon his feet. 
she wiped his feet with her long flowing hair. She wept over them, dropping her many tears upon his feet, and she kissed them over and over again. All of the people of that place knew who this woman was and knew the life that she had lived. She had not been a good woman, but had been wicked and was despised by all respectable people. Simon the Pharisee wondered that Jesus should allow such a woman to touch him. He thought within himself, though he did not say it aloud, This man cannot be a prophet as they say he is. For if he were a prophet, he would know what a vile creature this woman is, and he would not permit her hands to touch even his feet. Jesus read the thoughts of the Pharisee, for he could look down into his mind. He said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Well, teacher, answered Simon, say it. Then Jesus said, There was a lender of money to whom two persons owed a debt. One owed him five hundred pieces of silver, and the other owed him fifty. Neither of these two men could pay his debt, and so the money lender let them both go free. Tell me now, Simon, which of those two men will love this man the most? I suppose, answered Simon, the man who had the most forgiven. You are right, said Jesus. Then he turned toward the woman and went on, still speaking to Simon. Do you see this woman? When I came into your house, you never even gave me water for my feet. But see, she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them dry with her hair. You never gave me a kiss of welcome. But this woman, ever since she came in, has been pressing kisses upon my feet. You never anointed my head with oil, but she has poured perfume over my feet. Therefore I tell you, Simon, that many as her sins have been, they are forgiven, for her love is great, while he to whom little is forgiven loves only a little. Then he spoke to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. Those at the table began to whisper to one another, Who is this that claims the right to forgive sins? But he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. After this he went on visiting villages and telling the people the good news of the kingdom of God. With him were his twelve chosen disciples. Besides these men were some women whom Jesus had cured of different diseases. One was Mary Magdalene, from whom Jesus had cast out no less than seven evil spirits. Another was Joanna, the wife of a nobleman named Cusa who was a high officer in the court of King Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee. Another was named Susanna, and with these were a number of other women. Some of these were rich and gave freely of their money to help Jesus. End of chapter 32 Recording by JennyVoice.com Chapter 33 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 33. Jesus and His Enemies. After his journey through southern Galilee, which was the second of his preaching journeys in the land, Jesus came again to Capernaum. With him came a great multitude of people who had listened to him and longed to hear more of his words. For everyone who met Jesus was drawn to him in love and desired to be with him. Nearly all who heard him loved him, but not all. Both the scribes, who were the teachers of the people in the law of Moses, and the Pharisees, who pretended to a religion which was false and not real, hated Jesus more and more, and spoke evil of him to the people. They declared that a wicked spirit was in him, and that his power to work wonders came from Satan, the evil one. One day there was brought to Jesus a man in whom was an evil spirit, and the spirit had taken away both his sight and his hearing, so that he could neither see, nor hear, nor speak. Jesus spoke to the evil spirit in the man, saying, Come out of this man, O wicked spirit, and never enter into him again. 
the evil spirit left the man's body and for a moment he lay on the ground as though he were dead but soon he rose up entirely well and able to see to hear and to speak all those who saw this cure were filled with wonder and many said is not this the son of david whom the prophets promised should come and be our king but when the pharisees and scribes heard of this wonder they said this fellow casts out the evil spirits because the chief of all the evil spirits is in him and gives him this power jesus knew their thoughts and he said any kingdom that is divided into two sides that are fighting each other will soon fall in pieces and any family where people are quarreling will soon come to naught if satan the evil one is casting out evil spirits then satan's kingdom will soon fall for it is divided against itself but if by the power of god i cast out the bad spirits from men then you may be sure that god is among you but this report that jesus was possessed by evil spirits went abroad among the people and some believed it it came to the brothers of jesus who at that time did not fully believe in him and it came to mary his mother filling her with alarm she feared that her son working without any rest and bearing such heavy loads of care had lost his mind some said that the family of jesus should take him home and not allow him to disturb the people for they said he is beside himself mary and her sons came to the house where jesus was talking to the people and curing the sick so great was the crowd around the door that they could not get into the house and they sent word inside that the mother of jesus and his brothers were out in the street and wished to speak with him they told jesus your mother and your brothers are outside and they wish to speak with you but he answered the man who told him who is my mother and who are my brothers he turned to his disciples stretched out his hands and said here are my mother and my brothers whoever will do the will of my father in heaven that one is my brother and my sister and my mother jesus meant by this that dear as his mother was to him those who were ready to follow his teachings were dearer still some of the scribes and pharisees spoke to jesus saying teacher show us some sign that you have come from god they wished him to work some miracle some wonder in their sight but jesus never would do any of his great works merely to be seen he cured the sick and cast out evil spirits out of pity for people in trouble but not as a show of his power he said to these people it is a wicked and unfaithful time when people seek for a sign i will give you no sign now but after a time you shall see a sign though you will not believe it it will be the sign of the prophet jonah for as jonah was three days inside the great fish so i the son of man will be three days under the ground and like jonah will come forth living the people of nineveh to whom jonah preached will rise up in the day when god shall judge the world and they shall show that they were better than the people of this time for when jonah preached to them they turned from their sins and sought god and one greater than jonah is here yet they will not listen to him the queen of sheba will rise up in the day of judgment with the people of this time and will prove them to be unfaithful for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wise words of solomon and one greater than solomon is here yet you will not listen to him end of chapter thirty three jesus and his enemies chapter number thirty four of hurlbut's life of christ for young and old this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Scudder. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. The Storyteller by the Sea. Soon after his journey through southern Galilee, Jesus began to teach in a new form that of telling stories to the people. 
Everybody likes to listen to a story, and sometimes a story will go to the heart when the plain truth will fail. Storytellers have always been very abundant in the East where Jesus lived. Even today may be found everywhere men who go from place to place telling stories, and the people flock around them and listen to their stories from morning until night. But the stories that Jesus told were different from those of Eastern storytellers. His stories were told to teach some great truth, and on that account were called parables. A parable is a story which is true to life, that is, a story which might be true, not a fairy story, and which also has in it some teaching of the truth. One day Jesus went out of the city of Capernaum and stood on the beach by the Sea of Galilee. A great crowd of people gathered around him, for all the opposition of the scribes and Pharisees could not keep the common people away from Jesus. The throng was so great crowding around Jesus that, as before, he stepped into a boat and told his disciples to push it out a little from the shore. Then he sat down in the boat, fronting the great multitude that filled the sloping beach. He said to the people, Listen, once a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some of it fell on the path where the ground had been trodden hard. The seed lay there on the path until the birds lighted upon it and picked up all the kernels so that none of them grew. Some of the seed fell on places where there was a thin covering of earth over stones. There the kernel grew quickly, just because the soil was thin. But when the hot weather came, the sun scorched the tender plants, and they all withered away, because they had no moisture and no root in deep earth. Some of the seeds fell among briars and bushes, and there was no room for the grain to grow up. It lived, but it did not bring forth heads of grain because it was crowded and choked by thorn bushes all around it. But there were some other of the seeds that fell into ground that was soft and rich and good. There they grew up and brought forth fruit abundantly. Some kernels gave thirty times as much were sown, some sixty times and some a hundred times. Jesus did not tell the people what the teaching of the parable was. He only said, Whoever has ears, let him hear what I have spoken. He meant, that they should not only listen, but think and find out for themselves the meaning. When Jesus was alone with his disciples, they said to him, Why do you speak to the people in parables? What do you mean to teach in the story about the man sowing seed? Jesus said to them, To you who have followed me, it is given to know the deep things of the kingdom of God, because you seek to find them out. But to many these truths are spoken in parables, for they hear the story, but do not try to find out what it means. They have eyes, but they do not see, and ears, but they do not hear, for they do not wish to understand with the heart, and turn to God to have their sins forgiven. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Listen now to the meaning of the parable of the sower. The sower is the one who speaks the word of God, and the seed is the word which he speaks. The seed on the roadside, the trodden path, means those who hear but do not take the truth into their hearts. Then the evil spirit comes and, like the birds, snatches away the truth so that they forget it. The seeds on the rocky soil are those who hear the word and seem to take it gladly into their hearts, but they have no root in themselves. Just as soon as they meet with any discouragement or trouble or find enemies to the truth, they are turned away and their goodness does not last. That which is sown among the thorns and briars are those who listen to the word, but the worries of life and the desire for money and the pleasures of the world crowd the word in their hearts, and the gospel does them but little good. But the seed sown on the good ground are those who listen to the gospel and understand it, who take the word into honest and good hearts and keep it and bring forth fruit in their lives. End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Major Toast, Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter thirty five. More Stories Told by the Sea. Here is another parable story that Jesus told to the people as he sat in the boat and the people stood on the shore. 
This is the parable of the wheat and the weeds. There was a man who sowed good wheat in his field, but while people were asleep, an enemy came and scattered the seed of weeds over all the ground. Then the enemy went away, leaving his seed to grow up. When the sprouts of grain began to form into heads of wheat, the men saw that everywhere in the field the weeds were among them, for weeds always grew faster than good seed. So the servants of the farmer came to him and said, Did you not, sir, sow good seed in your field? How comes it that it is full of weeds? He said to them, Some enemy of mine has done this. Shall we go, said the servants, and pull up the weeds that are growing with the wheat? No, answered the farmer, for while you are pulling the weeds, you will root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, When you have cut down all the crop, then take out the weeds and put them into bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus gave to the people another parable about the growing grain. He said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should throw seed upon the ground. The sower will sleep every night while the seed will spring up. He cannot tell how. The ground bears fruit of itself. First the little shoot, then the ear of grain, and then the full head of grain. But when the heads of grain are ripe, he puts in his sickle and reaps, because the harvest is come. The next parable was the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven, said Jesus, is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. This is the smallest of all seeds, but it grows up to become a bush so large that it is like a tree, putting out great branches, and the birds light upon them and rest under their shadows. Jesus gave one more parable, the leaven or yeast, he said is like the leaven or yeast that a woman uses when she makes bread. She mixes up a very little yeast in a large mass of dough and leaves it to rise. Presently all the dough is changed by the yeast and made into good bread. So it is with the truth to those who take it into their hearts. After Jesus told these five parables, the sower, the wheat and the weeds, the growing grain, the mustard seed, and the leaven, he sent the crowd away and went into a house with his disciples. When they were all alone, they said to him, Tell us what is the meaning of the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Jesus answered them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, whom God has sent into the earth. The field is the world. The good wheat are those who hear his word and are the children of God. The weeds are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, Satan. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels of God. Just as the weeds are gathered from among the good grain and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all that do evil and cause harm and shall throw them into the furnace of fire. There men will weep and wail, and gnash their teeth. But in that day the children of God, the true wheat, shall shine like the sun in the kingdom of their heavenly Father. Then to his disciples, not to the crowd, Jesus gave three more parables. The first was the hid treasure. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a heap of money, which a man found while he was working in a field, he hid it again, and told no one about it, but went home, sold all that he had, and gladly bought that field, that the treasure might be his own. The next parable was that of the pearl. There was a man who went into many places to find pearls, which he bought to sell to others. In one place he found a pearl of great price, far more precious than any that he had seen before. He went and sold everything that he had, and with the money bought that pearl. The last of these parables was the dragnet. 
Once more, said Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net that was cast into the sea and took in fishes of every kind, large and small, good and bad. When the net was full, they drew it to the shore. There they sat down and took the fishes out one by one. They looked them over and put the good fish, those that were fit to be eaten, into baskets, but those that were useless were thrown away. So it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and take out the people that are wicked from among the good, and shall fling them into the furnace of fire. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. After Jesus had finished telling these parables to his disciples, he said to them, Have you understood all these? They said to him, Yes, we have. And he said to them, Every teacher is like a man who brings out of his store some things that are new and some things that are old. End of chapter 35 Read by Major Toast Chapter 36 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut, Chapter 36 Sailing Across the Sea After the day of teaching in parables, when the evening came on, as the crowds were still pressing upon Jesus and giving him no time to rest, he said to his disciples, Let us sail across the lake to the other side. So they made ready the boat and took Jesus on board. Some of the people were so eager to be with Jesus that they also went into other boats and sailed with him. Jesus was very tired after his day of teaching, and he lay down in the rear end of the boat, resting his head upon one of the cushions. In the steady motion of the oars and the gentle rippling of the waves, Jesus soon fell asleep while the boat moved onward over the lake. Soon the night came, and the disciples rode on in the darkness. On the Sea of Galilee, storms often arise very suddenly. The water may be perfectly calm for a time, and then in a few minutes lashed into fury by the wind. So it came to pass, while Jesus was sleeping, a great wind arose, the waves rolled high and dashed into the boat, but Jesus slept on peacefully. At least four of the twelve disciples, and we know not how many more, were fishermen. They knew how dangerous these sudden storms might be, and as they saw the boat filling with water and beginning to sink, they were frightened. Coming to Jesus, they awoke him, crying out, Master, master, we are lost. Help us, or we shall drown. The storm, with all the noise of creaking sails and roaring winds and dashing waves, had not wakened Jesus, but the cries of his frightened disciples aroused him from his sleep. He looked around, saw the dashing waves, and said just these words, Peace, be still. At once the wind ceased, the waves smoothed down, and there was perfect calm upon the sea. Then Jesus spoke to his disciples, saying, Why are you so fearful? Have you so little faith in me? They might have known that whether their master was awake or asleep, they were safe if he was with them. They wondered at this new proof of Jesus' power, and said to each other, Who can this be that can speak to the winds and the waves, and they obey his words? They were sailing from Capernaum in a direction southeast, and after rowing about seven miles, they came to the eastern shore of the lake, where was a village called Gerasa. 
This region was called the country of the Gadarenes, from a large city, Gadara, not far away. It was a part of Decapolis, a name given to all the country on the east of the Sea of Galilee. The word Decapolis means the ten cities, and because in that land were ten large Roman cities, the whole country was called the country of ten cities. It must have been very early in the morning when Jesus and his disciples brought their boats to the shore at Gerasa. Just as they were landing, a man came running down the hill to meet them, and from his wild acts they saw that he was one of those wretched people who were under the power of evil spirits. This man wore no clothes, he would not live in any house, but stayed in the caves in the hillside which were used as burial places. They had tried to bind him with ropes and chains, but when the evil power was on him, he would break all his bonds and even snap his chains apart. He stayed all the time among the tombs, crying, moaning, and gashing himself with sharp stones. This wild man ran toward Jesus and fell at his feet. As soon as Jesus saw the state he was in, he spoke to the evil spirit within the man. Come out of this man, you vile spirit. The spirit answered Jesus, crying out, Jesus, son of the most high God, what business have you with us? In the name of God, I call upon you not to make us suffer. Jesus saw that this man's state was far worse than even most of those who were ruled by evil spirits. He said to the spirit, What is your name? My name is Legion, answered the evil spirit, meaning that in the man was not only one, but many of the evil spirits, a whole army of them, for the word Legion means an army. The demons or evil spirits begged Jesus not to send them far away. On the top of the hill was a herd of many hogs feeding. The Jewish people were not allowed to keep hogs, nor to eat their flesh, so this drove of hogs must have belonged to foreign people, whom the Jews called Gentiles. The evil spirits asked Jesus if, when they left the man, they might go into these hogs, and Jesus allowed them. Then the demons, or evil spirits, went out of the man, leaving him lying upon the ground, naked but well. They went into the drove of hogs, and the hogs instantly became wild and could not be controlled. They rushed in a great mass down the steep side of the hill and into the water. They were all drowned, about two thousand in number. The men who kept the hogs ran to the town nearby and told all the people what had happened, how the demons at the command of this stranger had left the man, had gone into the drove of hogs, and had caused them to drown in the waters. The people of the city came out to see for themselves what had taken place. They saw the man in whom had been the fierce evil spirits, now sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind, calm and peaceful. These gathering people evidently knew nothing of Jesus and the many good works that he had done. They were filled with dread of his power, and scarcely looking at the man whom Jesus had helped so wonderfully, thought only of the hogs which they had lost. They begged Jesus to go away from their land and not to come to their town. Think what blessings Jesus might have brought to them in curing their sick, giving sight to the blind, and hearing to the deaf, besides the good news of his teaching. But with no knowledge of these good gifts, they asked Jesus to leave them. And Jesus took them at their word. Sadly, he turned away, went down to the beach, and stepped into the boat. The man who had been set free from the evil spirits begged most earnestly to be allowed to go with Jesus. 
He may have feared that the people of the city would be angry with him because the demons in him had killed their hogs. Or he may have thought that the evil spirits might come back to him if he was left alone without his mighty helper near. He knew that he would be safe if he were with his Lord, and he asked again and again that he might go away with Jesus wherever he might go. But Jesus would not grant his prayer. He said to the man, Go home to your own people and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has taken pity on you. The man went through all the country of Decapolis and told everybody whom he met what great things Jesus had done for him. When they heard this, they all wondered, and no doubt many wished that they had welcomed Jesus instead of sending him away. End of chapter 36 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Chapter 37 of Hurlbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbert Chapter 37 The Sick Woman Made Well and the Dead Girl Brought to Life a great crowd of people were on the shore at Capernaum, looking earnestly over the sea. On the evening before, they had seen Jesus with his disciples in their boats, pushing off from the beach and sailing out into the lake, and now they were watching for their return. Close by the water was standing one man, whose face showed that he was in great trouble, as he gazed anxiously in every direction over the sea. This man was named Jairus. He was the chief elder over the church in the town, which they called the synagogue. At home, his little daughter, twelve years old, was lying very ill and likely to die at any moment. Jairus knew that if Jesus should come ashore in time before his daughter would die, he could save her life. So with hope and fear mingled, he stood on the shore watching for Jesus to come, but fearing that he might come too late. At last, he could see the large boat rising in sight and drawing nearer with other smaller boats around it. Before Jesus could step ashore, Jairus fell down upon his face before him and cried out, Oh, Master, come to my house just as soon as you can. My little daughter is lying at the point of death. I pray you, come and lay your hands upon her so that she may live and be made well. Jesus went with him and all the crowd followed, pressing closely upon him, some showing pity and hope for Jairus in his trouble, but more of them wishing to see Jesus do one of his wonderful works. In the edge of the crowd was standing a poor woman, wasted by sickness and as pale as death. She had a running sore, which for twelve years had drained away her blood. She was very eager to go to Jesus, for she believed that he could cure her sore, although many doctors had tried in vain to help her. She had spent all her money upon the doctors, one after another, but no one of them had done her any good, and she was all the time growing worse. Jesus was in the middle of this great crowd, and this woman was very weak. But by making a strong effort, she was able to get near enough to Jesus, not to speak to him, but to reach her hand between those who were walking nearest to him and to touch his clothes. Suddenly, a great hope arose in her heart. She said to herself, I really believe that if I could just touch the master's clothes, I will be made well. She reached out with trembling hand and touched the outer robe of Jesus. In an instant, she felt a strange power come into her body, and she knew that that sore was cured. She was well and strong. At that moment, Jesus stopped in his walk, while Jairus was trying to hurry him onward. 
He stood still, looked all around, and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples were beside him, and Peter answered, Why, Master, the crowd is all around, pressing close upon you, and yet you say, Who touched me? (laughs) Well, people are touching you all the time. But Jesus said, I am sure that somebody touched me because I felt that power had gone out from me. As he stood still and looked all around to see who had done this, the woman came forward out of the crowd and fell down at his feet, trembling with fear, afraid that she had offended him. She told of what she had suffered, how she had touched his clothing and had been made well. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your sickness. But while Jesus was delaying for these few moments, Jairus was standing by his side in growing alarm, for to him and his dying child every minute was precious. Just then, someone from his own house came up to him through the crowd and said, Your daughter is dead. What is the use of asking the teacher to come any further? Not even he can help her now. These people had not heard how Jesus, some weeks before, had raised to life the widow's son at Nain, for that village was at least twenty-five miles from Capernaum. But Jesus spoke encouragingly to the sorrowing father. Have no fear. Only believe, and she shall yet be well. They went to the house of Jairus, and the crowd would have followed him inside, but Jesus forbade them. He allowed none to go with him into the house except the father and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. The house was full of people, weeping and wailing, playing on flutes, and making a great noise, as the manner was then and is even now in that land. Men and women are paid to come to the house where one is lying dead, and to scream and cry aloud, so that all in the town may know of the death and of the sorrow of the family. Jesus said to the people in the house, Why do you make such a noise? The little girl is not dead, but only sleeping. Jesus meant by these words that we need not be filled with sorrow when our friends die, for death is only asleep until the time when God shall awaken them. But this they did not understand, and they would not be comforted, for they knew that the child was dead. Jesus ordered all these hired mourners to leave the house. He went into the room where the dead child was lying on the bed, taking with him only her father and mother with his three chosen disciples. Standing beside the dead body, he took its little hand into his own and said, Little girl, I say to you, rise up. And instantly the girl stood up, looked around, and began to walk. How happy were that father and mother as they clasped in their arms their little girl, no longer dead, but living and well. All were filled with wonder. They would have told everybody about this mighty work, but Jesus said to them, Give the child something to eat, but do not talk about her being brought back to life. Tell no one of it. End of chapter 37 Recording by M. L. Wise Chapter 38 of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Slick. Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Herbert. Sight to the Blind and Voice to the Dumb. As Jesus was coming out of the house where he had raised to life the young girl, two blind men met him. The news of his return to Capernaum had gone abroad, and these two men, eager to obtain their sight, at once set out to find Jesus. They followed Jesus on the street, crying out loud, Have mercy on us, O son of David! You know that Jesus came from the family of which David had been the head long before. All the people looked for him as sprung from David to take David's throne, and like David, become king over all the land. 
The people who believed that Jesus was to be king often called him son of David. These two blind men followed Jesus, crying to him until he went into the house where he was staying, which may have been the house where Simon Peter lived. The blind men came into the house after Jesus. He said to them, Do you believe that I can do this which you desire? They answered him, Yes, Lord, we believe that you can. Then Jesus placed his hands upon their eyes, first on one man and then on the other. As he touched their eyes, he said to them, As you believe, let it be done to you. At once their eyes were open and they could see. Jesus spoke to them very strongly and gave them special orders, saying, See that nobody knows of this. He did not wish always to have crowds around seeking for miracles of healing, for he felt that he had a greater work to do in preaching to the souls of men than in curing their bodies. These men went away and told all whom they met what a wonderful thing Jesus had done for them. It was not strange that they should speak of it, even though he had forbidden them, for all who had known them before as blind men saw the great change in their looks now that they could see and asked them how it had come to pass, so that it was not easy to avoid telling people about it. But wherever it was told, people who had any disease, or were blind, or deaf, and dumb, or lame, were filled with desire to find Jesus and be made well. Soon after these two men left Jesus, cured of their blindness, another man was brought to Jesus. This was a dumb man, in whom lived an evil spirit. Jesus always cast out the evil spirits without waiting to be asked whenever he found them ruling over men. He spoke to this evil spirit, and it left the man. Then all at once the man began to speak, for it was the evil spirit in him that had made him dumb. All the people wondered and said to one another, Such power as this has never before been seen in the land of Israel. But the scribes and Pharisees, who were enemies of Jesus, said again, as they had said before, This man casts out the evil spirits because Satan, the prince of the evil spirits, helps him. End of Sight to the Blind and Voice to the Dumb Recording by Slick Chapter 39 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 39 Twelve Preachers Sent Out Jesus had now preached in nearly all parts of Galilee, except in the middle portion, the region around Nazareth, the home of his younger days. You remember that when he had tried to speak in Nazareth, soon after coming from Judea, the people refused to listen to him, thinking that one who had been only a working man and not a rabbi or scribe could not teach them anything. But Jesus loved those people in Nazareth, for many of the men had been with him boys at school and his own sisters lived there with their children, boys and girls, who were his nephews and nieces. He longed to see them all, and made up his mind to go again to Nazareth and see if its people would this time listen to him. On his earlier visit he had been alone, and the men of Nazareth, in their anger, had tried to kill him by throwing him down a very steep hill. But now Jesus had with him his twelve disciples, and many more who followed him from place to place. On this visit, the men of Nazareth did not venture to do him harm because of his many friends around him. As before, Jesus went to the village church on the Sabbath day and preached. Again the people listened to him with wonder at his words, but again they said, Is not this the carpenter who used to make plows and hoes and tables for us? How can he teach us? He could only do a few of his great works because the people would not believe in him. He did indeed lay his hands upon a few that were sick and made them well, but he could only wonder at the hardness of heart in those among whom he had lived so many years. 
leaving Nazareth with a sad heart, he went around the villages in Middle Galilee, teaching in the churches and curing sickness of all kinds. As he saw how poor the people were, how little they knew of the truth, and how greatly they longed for it, he felt a great pity for them. They seemed to Jesus like sheep that were lost and wandering, not having any shepherd. He said to his disciples, The harvest truly is rich, but the workers in it are very few. Pray very earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, that he may send out workers to gather in his harvest. Jesus knew that the time of his work in Galilee was nearly ended. There were other parts of the land of Israel where he had not yet preached, and he wished to visit them. He knew, too, what none but himself knew, that in a year he would be taken away from the earth, and his disciples would be left alone to carry on his work and preach to all the people the news of God's kingdom. He made up his mind to send out his twelve disciples, whom he named the Apostles, and to let them begin their work by preaching in the villages of Galilee, which he had not found time to visit. So he called together his twelve disciples, and divided them into pairs, sending two men together, that they might help each other. He poured upon them some of his own power to cure diseases and to cast out evil spirits from men. He gave them commands about their work, to whom they should go and how they should act. He said, Do not go to any city of the Gentiles, the foreigners, and keep away from the villages of the Samaritan people. Your work just now is to be among the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go to the Jews throughout the land and tell them that the kingdom of God has come and that they may enter it. Cure the sick, raise the dead to life, cleanse the lepers, cast out the evil spirits from men, give freely without being paid, for you have received the gift of God freely. Do not take with you any money of gold or silver or copper in your girdle, nor a bag to carry food for the road, nor two shirts, nor a pair of shoes, but go wearing only sandals on your feet. For God's workman deserves his food, and it will be given to him. When you come to a village, ask for some good man, go to his house, and stay there while you are in that village. Do not go visiting from one house to another. When you come to a house, say, Peace be to this house. If the people dwelling in that house are worthy of your peace, then peace shall be given to them. If they are not worthy, your peace shall come back to you. And if in any place the people will not hear you, nor give you welcome, then as you go out of that house or that city, take off your sandals and shake the dust of that place from them as a sign. I say to you in truth, that in the day of judgment it shall be worse for the cities that have refused you than for Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities upon which God rained down fire. You are sent forth like sheep among wolves, so be wise like serpents, yet harmless like doves. But you must watch against evil men, for they will seize you and hand you over to courts to be judged. You will be beaten in their courtrooms. You will be brought before governors and kings, because you are my followers. Now, when they bring you up for trial, do not be anxious about what you shall speak, or how you shall say it, for what to speak shall be given you when you need it. For it is not you that speak but the Spirit of your Father in heaven that speaks in you. Many more words Jesus spoke to his twelve disciples, and at the end of his charge he said this, Whoever receives you and listens to you, it is the same as though he received me, your teacher. And whoever receives me, receives my Father who sent me. He that receives a prophet because he is a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a good man, because he is a good man, shall receive a good man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple of mine, 
I tell you truly, he will not lose his reward. After giving his commands to the twelve disciples, Jesus sent them out to preach, while he himself went to other places telling the people the good news of the kingdom of God. End of chapter 39 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Chapter 40 of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Slick. Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Herbert. A Dance and How It Was Paid For. During nearly all the year of Jesus' teaching and preaching in Galilee, John the Baptist was in Herod's prison, at a lonely place called Machaerus, on the east of the river Jordan, near the Dead Sea. You remember that John was put into prison because King Herod's queen, Herodias, became angry against him when John said to Herod that it was not right for him to take away his brother's wife and have her as his own. Herodias hated John and tried many times to have him killed, but Herod held John in high respect and would not suffer him to be slain. But at last, the chance came for Herodias to carry out her purpose. On King Herod's birthday, he held at Machaerus, which was not only a prison but a palace, a great feast to his lords, the captains of his army, and the chief men of his kingdom. At this feast, the daughter of Herodias, a young girl came in and danced before the company. Herod and the guests with him were so delighted with the young girl's dancing that the king made her a very foolish promise. He said to her, You may ask for anything that you please, and I will give it to you. He went further and even swore with an oath to her, I will give you whatever you choose, even to half of my kingdom. The girl went to her mother and said to her, What shall I ask? And Herodias hissed out the words, You ask for the head of John the Baptist. The girl went in haste to the king and said, I want you to give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was greatly displeased and very angry. He knew that his wife Herodias had led the girl to make this choice, and he would have liked to break his promise, but because he had given his word and was ashamed to call it back before all the nobles at his feast, he gave orders, very unwillingly, to his guards to have her will carried out. They went into the prison, and with a sharp sword, cut off the head of John the Baptist, the best and noblest man in all his kingdom. The head was laid on a platter and given to the young girl, who carried it to her mother. So the man whom Jesus called a prophet, and more than a prophet, was slain to satisfy the whim of a dancing girl and her wicked mother. The few followers who had still clung to John the Baptist and visited him in his prison took up his headless body and buried it. Then, they went to Jesus and told him all the sad story of John's death. But Herod was not yet done with John the Baptist. Soon he began to hear wonderful stories of the new prophet, Jesus the Nazarene, who had risen up in John's place. He heard that amazing powers were shown by Jesus, that the sick were cured, the lepers were made clean, the blind were made to see, and most wonderful of all, the dead were raised to life. People were saying to each other, who is this great prophet that is working all these wonders? Some said, this is the old prophet Elijah who has come to earth again. Others said, if he is not Elijah, it may be Jeremiah or some other prophet of the old times. But Herod was filled with a terrible fear, for his conscience troubled him on account of his wicked deeds. He said, I know who this is. It is John the Baptist, whose head I had cut off. He has come to life again. 
It is on his account that all these wonderful things are taking place. Thus, the bloody head of John the Baptist, like a terrible ghost, rose before the sight of Herod the king. End of A Dance and How It Was Paid For Recording by Slick Chapter 41 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 41. The Boy with His Five Loaves The news that King Herod had slain the holy prophet John the Baptist sent a thrill of horror to all who heard it. It came to the twelve disciples, who were just completing their work of preaching in the villages of Galilee. They feared that Herod might seize them and put them in prison, but they were more alarmed for their master. Having slain John, who had made Jesus known to the people, they feared that Herod might now try to kill Jesus himself. They all hastened to Capernaum, where they found Jesus, and gave him the report of the places which they had visited, the work which they had done in healing and helping people, and the message which they had given everywhere about the kingdom of God. The disciples found the crowds around Jesus greater than ever before, for not only had the preaching of these disciples aroused an interest in Jesus and led many to leave their homes and seek him, but the Passover, the greatest of all Jewish feasts, was to be held soon, and the city of Capernaum was thronged with people who were on their way to Jerusalem, for as you know, this feast was held only in that city, and from every part of the land people went up to Jerusalem to attend it. So many were the people coming and going, and those who were looking for Jesus and seeking his power to cure their diseases, that Jesus and his disciples could scarcely find a place to eat. The crowds were constantly pressing upon them. He said to his disciples, Come, let us take the boat and go across the lake to some quiet place, away from the crowds, and there rest for a time. They went into the boat and started to row over the lake, but the people saw them going, and many tried to follow them. Those who had boats sailed in them after the course in which they saw the boat with Jesus and his disciples. And the others, a great multitude, walked and ran around the head of the lake, waded across the river Jordan where it enters the Sea of Galilee, still keeping Jesus' boat in sight, and were at the beach to meet Jesus when he landed near the town of Bethsaida, which was on the northeastern shore. Here Jesus was safe, for Bethsaida was outside the rule of King Herod, and in the land governed by Herod's brother Philip. When Jesus stepped out of his boat on the shore near Bethsaida, there he found a great throng of people, more than five thousand men, besides some women and children. When Jesus saw how eager they were and how glad to meet him, his heart of love and pity went out toward them. He cured some sick people that they had brought, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. The day began to draw to its close, and the sun was almost sinking below the hills of Galilee, when the disciples said to Jesus, It is getting late, and will soon be night. These crowds of people came so suddenly that they have brought with them nothing to eat. Send them away, so that they may go to the city of Bethsaida and the villages around, and buy food, and find places to stay through the night. We are here, you see, in a desert place, where there is neither food nor lodging for them. But Jesus said to his disciples, There is no need for them to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, Shall we go into the town and buy thirty dollars worth of bread, so that each one of them may have a little? 
Jesus turned to Philip, one of his disciples, and asked him, Philip, where shall we find bread that all these people may eat? Jesus said this to try Philip's faith, for he himself knew already what he would do. Philip looked over the crowd gathered upon the level ground, and he answered, Thirty dollars worth of bread would not be enough to give each one even a little piece. Jesus said to his disciples, How many loaves have you? Go and see. Just then another of the disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, came up to Jesus and said, There is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two little fishes, but what use would they be among so many people? Jesus said, Bring them to me. So they led to Jesus this boy with his lunch basket, in which his mother had placed five large flat biscuits of barley and two small salted fishes. Jesus said to his disciples, Go out among the people and tell them to arrange themselves into companies with fifty or a hundred in each company, and to sit down upon the grass. The disciples did as Jesus ordered, and soon all the crowd was divided up into groups of fifty or a hundred people, all seated on the ground. On the green grass, arranged in rows and squares, with their clothes of different colors, they looked like beds of flowers. Then, in the sight of all the people, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fishes. He waved his hand for silence, and while all were still, looked up to heaven, gave thanks to God for his gift of food, and blessed it. He broke the loaves, which were like large flat crackers or biscuit, and gave to each of his disciples a piece, and also a piece of dried fish. The disciples went among the people, breaking off pieces of the loaves and fishes, and handing them out. As they were broken, the loaves and fishes grew in their hands, until every one in the company had enough to eat. Then Jesus said, Go and gather up the pieces of food that are left, so that nothing may be wasted. Each of the twelve disciples carried a basket among the people, and took from them all that was left. When they came back to Jesus, all the twelve baskets were filled with the pieces left over of the loaves and fishes. There had been in the beginning only five loaves and two fishes. Of these, five thousand men, besides women and children, had eaten as much as they wanted and now came back twelve baskets full of bits left over, much more at the end after all had eaten than at the beginning. When the people saw that here was one who could give them food, all that they wanted, they said to each other, This is the man we want for our king. He can give us bread to eat without our working for it. Let us break away from the rule of the Romans and make Jesus our king. Jesus knew their thoughts, and what they were saying to each other, for he knew all things. He knew, too, that he was a king, but not such a king as they wished. His kingdom was to be in the hearts of those who loved him, not a kingdom won by armies and by swords. Jesus found that his disciples were pleased to find the people so eager at once to crown Jesus as their king, for that would mean high rank and offices for themselves. Jesus, therefore, began by sending away his disciples. He compelled them, much against their will, to get into the boat and to row over the lake toward Capernaum. After sending away his disciples, he sent away the multitudes, who were also unwilling to go, for they could not understand why Jesus should refuse to be made king. When all were gone away, and quiet was around him, and the night had come on, Jesus went to the top of a mountain nearby, and spent some hours in prayer to his heavenly Father. He needed prayer, for he saw in this attempt to make him king another effort of Satan to bring Jesus under his power by giving him a worldly kingdom instead of a heavenly. End of chapter 41
Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Chapter 42 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Beth Leary. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 42 How the Sea Became a Floor. On the night after the multitude was fed with the five loaves, while Jesus was praying alone on the mountain, his disciples were rowing over the lake toward Capernaum. It was very dark, and soon after midnight a terrible storm arose, as storms often come very suddenly upon the Sea of Galilee. From his mountain top, through all the darkness and miles away, Jesus could see them struggling with the waves and in great danger of losing their lives, for he could see all things. While the disciples were pulling hard with their oars, suddenly they saw someone walking upon the waves and drawing near their boat. They were more alarmed when they saw this form walking over the waves as though the waters were a solid floor than they had been at the storm threatening to swallow them up. For they thought that surely this was a spirit from the world of the dead coming to give warning that death was awaiting them. They cried out in their terror, but soon heard a voice speaking to them above the roaring of the wind and the dashing of the waves, a voice which they knew well. It was the voice of Jesus saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they knew that it was no spirit or ghost from the grave, but their own Lord and Savior coming to help them. What a load of fear was lifted from them when they heard that voice. But one of the disciples, one who was always putting himself in the front, thought that if Jesus could walk on the water, he would like to do the same. You would know that this one was Simon Peter, a good man, but very quick in his impulses. He cried out as Jesus drew near, Lord, if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. And the Lord said, Come. Then Peter leaped overboard from the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But after a few steps on the sea, he saw how heavy the storm was and was afraid. And at that moment, he began to sink. He shouted out, Lord, save me. Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and kept him from sinking, saying to him, How little you trust me. Why did you doubt my word? When Jesus, holding Peter's hand, came with him into the boat, the wind stopped and the sea became calm. They found that they were close to the land. Then all the men in the boat fell down at the feet of Jesus and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. Soon the daylight came, and they saw that their boat was beside a plain reaching into the lake a few miles south of Capernaum called the Land of Gennesaret. They went ashore and drew up their boat on the beach. The people of that place knew Jesus, for many of them had heard him in Capernaum. They were glad to have him come to their land and sent word through all the plain that Jesus, the great teacher and healer, had landed on their shore. From all the country around, they brought on their beds those that were sick and laid them before Jesus, begging him to cure them. Many came near his side and asked him if they might only touch the border of the mantle which he wore. And all who touched it 
were made perfectly well. So strong was their faith in Jesus. End of chapter 42. Chapter 43 of Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria de Fatima da Silva. Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Herbert. The Bread of Life. On the morning after the day when Jesus had fed the five thousand people with the five loaves, the crowd came together once more, hoping again to see Jesus, and some of them expecting to have the miracle or wonder work repeated. On the evening before, they had seen the twelve disciples go out upon the lake in their boat, and had noticed that Jesus did not sail with them. They thought that Jesus must still be there, and looked all around for him, not knowing that in the night he had walked upon the sea to help his disciples in the storm. Failing to find Jesus, they thought that he must have gone back to his home in Capernaum. They found some other boats upon the shore, and in these they crossed the lake to Capernaum. They found Jesus at the church in Capernaum, and said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? I tell you the truth, answered Jesus, it is not on account of the signs of power which you saw that you are looking for me, but because you ate of the bread which I gave you and had your fill. You should work not for the food which does not last, but for that which endures to everlasting life. That bread the Son of Man will give you, for upon him the Father has set his seal of power." Jesus wished them to understand that the truth which he could give them was more to the soul than food was to the body, for it would give the life of God, which never passes away. In what way, they asked him, can we do the work that God would have us do? The work that God would have you do, answered Jesus, is to believe in him whom God has sent to you as his message bearer. Well then, they said to Jesus, show us the sign that will prove that you have come from God, then we will believe in you. What is the work that you are doing? Our fathers under Moses in the desert ate the manna that Moses gave them. You remember that it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. You see, the people wanted Jesus to show his power again by repeating the miracle with the loaves and giving them more bread in the same way. In truth, I tell you, replied Jesus, it was not Moses who gave your fathers the bread from heaven. It was my father, the Lord God. And my father does give you now the real bread from heaven. For God's bread is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Master, they said, give us that bread always. I am the life-giving bread, answered Jesus. He who comes to me shall never be hungry, and he who believes in me shall never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe in me. All those whom the Father gives me will come to me, and no one who comes to me will I ever turn away. For I have come down from heaven, not to carry out my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And his will is this, that I should not lose even one of all those whom he has given me, but shall raise them up to life at the last great day. For it is the will of my Father that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have everlasting life, and I myself will raise him up at the last day. The Jews who heard Jesus began to find fault with him for saying, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? They could not understand his words, and they were angry with him because he would not again 
work the miracle of giving them bread. Also, they now found that Jesus was not willing to be a king such as they wanted, one that would sit on a throne and live in a palace, would raise an army to drive away the Romans and make the Jews a ruling people upon the earth. It was, as we have seen, the time of the Passover, and one reason for the great crowds around Jesus was that all were expecting him to lead the people to Jerusalem and take his place as the king of Israel. But this year Jesus did not go, as he usually did, to the feast in Jerusalem, for he had other plans for himself and his disciples. When the crowd following Jesus found that he would not be a king according to their desires, that he would not do wonders for them to look upon, and that his words were such as they could not understand, nearly all of them turned against Jesus. They went away, leaving the twelve disciples alone with him. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you too wish to leave me? Simon Peter answered for them all, Lord, to whom shall we go if we leave you? You have the words that will give us everlasting life. And we believe and are certain that you are the Holy One of God. These men did not understand all the words of Jesus, but they had learned to love him and to believe that he was the promised king. They were ready to stay with him until death. Did I not choose you to be the twelve, said Jesus, and yet even among you there is one who is doing the devil's work. They did not know of whom he was speaking, but he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the one of the twelve disciples who a year afterward was to give up his master to death. At that time Judas himself did not know this. Jesus, who could read the hearts of men, saw in Judas the signs all unknown to himself that he would do this dreadful deed. End of chapter 43「Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 44 Jesus in a Strange Country. With his sermon on the bread of life given in the church at Capernaum, Jesus finished his work among the people of Galilee. He had lived in that land for more than a year. He had traveled through every part of it. He had spoken in most of its villages and cities and had sent out his disciples to preach in many other places. Everybody in Galilee had either heard Jesus or had heard about him. If they did not believe in him and his gospel, it was because they would not. There was another and important work which now lay before Jesus. That was the training of his twelve disciples. These men, the apostles, as they were called later, had been with him for nearly a year. They had listened to his preaching and had heard his sermons many times over and over again. For in different places Jesus gave the same talks to the people. But those talks and parables the twelve heard in each place, as Jesus wished those men to hear his words until they knew them by heart and could give them as his message to others who had not heard Jesus himself. One reason why we have in the four Gospels by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John so many of the teachings and parables of Jesus is that the disciples heard them so many times, learned them, could tell them to others, and thus, at least thirty years after Jesus passed away from earth, his words were remembered and could be written down. But besides the public teachings of Jesus, such as the Sermon on the Mount and his parables, there were other great truths of the gospel that could not be given to the people, for they were not ready for them 
and could not understand them. We can see how the common people were puzzled by his words about the bread of life. Jesus saw that it was needful for him to take the twelve disciples apart by themselves, that he might teach them some of the deeper truths of his gospel. In Galilee he could not be alone with these men, for wherever he might go there would always be many sick people coming to be cured and others leading men held in the power of evil spirits begging Jesus to cast them out. Then, too, in every place were the Pharisees and scribes bringing their questions, asking for miracles, and trying to stir up the people against Jesus. Wherever Jesus was, a crowd was always around him, and he could find no time to teach his disciples some truths needful for them to know. He made up his mind to go away from Galilee to some quiet place, where no one would know of his coming. On the northwest of Galilee was a narrow land on the other side of the Lebanon mountains beside the great Mediterranean Sea. It was called Phoenicia, from the people who lived there, the Phoenicians, and also called the land of Tyre and Sidon from its two leading cities. The people who lived in that country were not Jews, and few of them even spoke the Jewish language. Jesus thought that this would be a quiet place where he could talk alone with his disciples. Jesus and the twelve quietly left Capernaum and walked over the mountains to this land of Tyre and Sidon. There they found a house and went into it, intending for a time to live there. Jesus wished nobody to know of his coming, but he could not be hidden. A woman of that country heard of him and at once went to Jesus, threw herself at his feet, and begged him to come and cast an evil spirit out of her daughter. This woman was not of the Jewish people. She was a foreigner of a mingled Syrian and Phoenician race, a people called Canaanites. She cried aloud and kept on crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David! My little daughter is terribly troubled with an unclean spirit. Will you not please come and help her? At first Jesus did not answer her one word, but his disciples said to him, Oh, Master, send this woman away, for she is making a great noise and disturbing us. To them she was only a Gentile, a heathen woman, and the Jews, even those who followed Jesus, looked with great contempt on all such people. They do not know that Jesus was sent to save not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles. Jesus wished to teach his disciples a lesson, that a Gentile could have the same faith as a Jew. He said to the woman, I was not sent to your people, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman kept on following him. She knelt down before Jesus and said, Master, help me. He said to her, Let the children be satisfied first of all. It is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That is true, Lord, said the woman. Yet the little dogs under the table do pick up some of the children's crumbs. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. Your prayer is granted as you wish. The evil spirit is gone away from your daughter. The woman believed the word of Jesus. She hastened to her home and found her daughter well and resting upon her bed. End of chapter 44 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Chapter 45 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. 
Chapter 45 In the Land of the Ten Cities Jesus soon found that if he wished to be alone with his disciples, he must leave the land of Tyre and Sidon. For after he had cured the woman's child of her evil spirit, the people were coming to him for other mighty works. He made up his mind to go farther away, and, taking his disciples, he went to Sidon, north of Tyre, and then not through Galilee, but around it to the river Jordan, north of the Sea of Galilee. He crossed the Jordan, and on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee came to a country called Decapolis, or the Land of the Ten Cities, from ten large places in that region. While they were on this journey, few people saw them, and as they walked together, he talked to his disciples and taught them many things. The place to which Jesus came was not far from the town where some months before he had cast out from a poor man a whole army of evil spirits and had sent them into the drove of hogs. At that time, you remember, the people had come to Jesus and had begged him to go away with them, for they had seen his power but knew nothing of his goodness. But after that miracle, the man who had been cured went all through this land of the ten cities, telling the people everywhere of the good work Jesus had done to him and how much they had lost in sending him away. On the second visit of Jesus to this land, the people were ready and eager for his coming. They gathered around Jesus with great joy and came from near and from far to see him. He went up into a mountain and sat down with his disciples, hoping to be alone. But the people came to him in great crowds, bringing with them those that were lame and ill with different diseases. They laid these suffering people at his feet and asked him to cure them. He made them all well. They all wondered as they saw the dumb talking, the cripples made sound, the lame walking about and the blind seeing, and they all praised the God of Israel. At this time they led to Jesus a man who was very deaf, and who stammered so that people could scarcely understand his words. They asked Jesus to place his hand on this man and cure him. But Jesus would not do this in public, with a crowd of people looking on. He led him away out of the throng to a place where they could be by themselves. He put his fingers into the man's ears, and then moistening one finger upon his own tongue, with it touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven with a sigh, he said, Be opened. The man's ears and his tongue were at once set free. He could hear and could speak plainly. Jesus forbade the man and his friends to tell anyone about the cure, but contrary to his command, they made it known everywhere. All who saw this man were astonished, and they said of Jesus, He has done everything well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. The crowd clung to Jesus and followed him for three days. By that time, whatever food the people had brought with them had been eaten, and yet they stayed with Jesus, never thinking of their needs. Jesus called his disciples together and said to them, my heart is touched on account of all these people, for they have now been with me three days, and they have nothing to eat. Some of them have come from distant places, and I cannot bear to send them away hungry for fear that they may break down by the way. Where can we? the disciples asked him. In a lonely place like this, with no towns near, find bread for such a crowd as this. How many loaves have you? asked Jesus. We have in all seven loaves, they answered, and with them a few small fishes. Jesus told all the crowds to sit down upon the ground, and when they had done so, he held up the loaves and the fishes and gave thanks to his heavenly Father for them. Then he broke the loaves into pieces, also the dried fish, and gave them to the disciples. The disciples distributed them among the people, and everyone had all that he wanted to eat.
After the meal, the disciples went around with large baskets and picked up of the food left over seven baskets full. At this time, the people who were fed by Jesus were 4,000 men, besides women and children. When all were satisfied, Jesus told them to go back to their homes. Then with his disciples, he went into the boat and sailed across the Sea of Galilee. End of chapter 45 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Chapter 46 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 46 Again on the Sea of Galilee From the land of the Ten Cities, Jesus and his disciples sailed straight across the Sea of Galilee and on its southwestern shore they came to a city called Magadan, or Magdala. One of the women who went with Jesus on his journeys in Galilee, Mary Magdalene, that is, Mary of Magdala, was from this city. Jesus came to this place for rest and for quiet talking with his disciples. But as soon as he landed, he was met by some Pharisees and others who did not believe in him. They said to him, Teacher, show us some sign from heaven that you are a prophet, or one whom God has sent. They wished Jesus to do some miracle or wonderful work, not that they might believe in him, but only that they might see what he could do. Everywhere the Pharisees, who looked upon themselves as leaders, were opposed to Jesus and stirred up the ignorant people against him. We have already seen that Jesus never gave any cures or wonderful works merely to be looked upon. He would help those who were in need or in trouble, but he would not merely satisfy an idle desire to see a miracle. He answered these Pharisees as he had answered others. I will give you a sign from heaven. In the evening at sunset you say, It will be fine weather, for the sky is as red as fire. But in the morning, if the sky is red, you say, It will be a stormy day, for the sky is red as fire, and threatening. You learn to read the signs in the sky, yet you do not know how to read the signs of the times. If you would look, you might see whether I come from God or not. It is a wicked and a disobedient people who continually ask for signs. No sign shall be given to this people except the sign of the prophet Jonah. He did not even tell them how Jonah was to be a sign or token to them. Perhaps a few months later, when these people heard that Jesus had been slain and buried, then after three days had risen again to life, just as Jonah had come forth alive after being buried for three days in the great fish, they would then understand how Jonah had been as a sign of Jesus. Jesus saw at once that this was no place to find quiet and a chance to teach his disciples. So he went into the boat again with his disciples and sailed away up the lake. They left in such haste that the disciples did not think, while they were ashore, to buy some bread. And they had with them in the boat only one loaf for Jesus and twelve men. While they were rowing over the sea, Jesus said to them, Take care, and be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They thought that he was speaking to them about their having failed to bring more bread, and they began talking among themselves. Jesus noticed this, and he said, Why are you talking to one another about your being short of bread? How little trust you have in me. Do you not remember the five loaves with which I fed the five thousand? 
in the twelve baskets full of pieces that you picked up afterward? Have you forgotten about the seven loaves among the four thousand, and the seven baskets full that you picked up? How is it that you do not see that I was not speaking to you about bread? No, be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And warning his disciples against the leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus meant their pride and pretense of religion and exactness at obeying rules, while failing to serve God with the heart. By the leaven of Herod, he meant the spirit of living for the world, of guilty pleasure, without a thought of doing God's will. They came to Bethsaida, and as soon as the people saw Jesus, they brought to him a blind man, and begged him to touch him, hoping to see Jesus give him his sight. But Jesus would not let them look on the curing of the man. He took him away from the crowd, and outside the town to a lonely place. There, after spitting upon the man's eyes, he laid his hands upon him and asked him, Can you see anything? The man looked up and said, Yes, I can see a little, but not very clearly. I see men moving about, but they look like trees. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. He looked around and now could see everything distinctly. Jesus said to him, Now go directly to your home, and do not go into the town, where men will see you and ask how you received your sight. Jesus and his disciples did not stop in Bethsaida, for he felt that he must find some quiet, lonely place where he could teach his disciples the great truths of which they knew nothing, truths, too, which it would be hard for them to believe and to understand. So from Bethsaida he went on, following a road beside the river Jordan to the foot of Mount Hermon, far in the north. End of chapter 46 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 47 of Hurlbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria de Fatima da Silva. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. The Great Confession From Bethsaida by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus led his twelve disciples northward to the very end of the land of Israel at the foot of Mount Hermon. Here, at one of the great springs from which the river Jordan flows, was the city of Caesarea Philippi, or Philip's Caesarea, so-called because it was in the land ruled by Herod Philip, the brother of Herod Antipas, who was ruling in Galilee. Jesus did not go into the city of Caesarea Philippi, but into one of the villages near the city, for he wished not to have a crowd around him, but to be alone with his disciples. The time had now come for the disciples to know more about Jesus, who he was, the work that he was to do, and what he was soon to suffer. His plan of teaching them was not to tell them, but to lead them on by questions so that they might learn the truth by finding it out themselves. One day, after he had been alone praying to his father, he asked his disciples, Tell me, who do the people say that I am? Some say that you are John the Baptist, raised up from the dead, answered the disciples. Others say that you are Elijah, the prophet, come to earth again. And still others say that you are the prophet Jeremiah or some other one of the old prophets. But you, who do you say that I am? asked Jesus. At once Simon Peter answered, for he was the one among the twelve always ready to speak. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know that the Jews everywhere were looking for a king to rule over them, set them free from the Roman power, and make of them a great conquering nation. This king, in their own language, they called the Messiah, which means 
the anointed one for in israel a new king was chosen by having oil poured upon his head the word messiah in the greek language which was spoken everywhere was christ also meaning the anointed one peter in speaking those words thou art the messiah the christ meant to say that jesus was the king of israel for whom all the people were looking you are a blessed man simon son of jonah answered jesus for no human being has made this known to you but my father who is in heaven yes and i say to you your name is peter a rock and on this rock i will build my church and all the powers of the underworld shall not succeed against it also simon peter i will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven whatever you forbid on earth shall be forbidden in heaven and whatever you allow on earth shall be allowed in heaven because simon peter was the first to make this confession of jesus as the messiah christ the king he was given special honor among the followers of the lord you remember that more than a year before when jesus met simon for the first time beside the river jordan he gave him the new name peter which means a rock then jesus told the disciples that they were not to speak to any of the people of what peter had said that jesus was the christ the king for the time had not yet come to make it public but now since they knew that he was to be a king and rule over israel he began for the first time to speak of certain other things which they found very hard to understand very soon said jesus we are going up to jerusalem and there i must endure great suffering from the rulers of the people the chief priests and teachers of the law i must be slain and buried and on the third day i shall rise again the disciples could not understand how if he was to reign as king of israel it could be possible for him to suffer these things and to die peter took jesus aside where he could speak with him alone master said peter you must not speak of such things god will not allow these things to come to you you are not going to be put to death in jerusalem you are going to jerusalem to sit on the throne of david and reign over the land but jesus turned his back upon peter and looking upon his disciples said get away from me satan you would turn me away from doing god's will for you look at things not as god looks at them but as man does jesus saw that in peter's mind was the view of the kingdom that satan had shown him in his great temptation on the mountain not as a kingdom of god but as a kingdom such as men were expecting a kingdom like those of the world then jesus called to his disciples and to the people that were around them and said if any man has the will to come after me and be my disciple let him give up his own will and take up his cross and follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it and whoever for my sake loses his life shall find it what good will it do to a man to gain the whole world if in gaining he loses his own life what will a man give that is worth as much as his life for the son of man is coming in the glory of his father with his angels and then he will give to every man what his acts deserve and i tell you truly there are some standing here who will not die until they have seen the son of man coming to reign in his kingdom end of chapter 47「Chapter forty eight of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter forty eight The Vision on the Mountain. At one time, while Jesus was staying in one of the villages at the foot of Mount Hermon, in the far north of the land, he took with him three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and went up the mountain to pray. It was in the afternoon when they walked up the mountain, and when night came on he was still in prayer. 
the three disciples were tired from climbing the mountain and fell asleep for a little time when they awoke they were filled with wonder at the change which had come over their lord although it was night they saw the face of jesus shining as brightly as the sun at noon with a dazzling glory so great that they could not bear to look upon him his clothes too were shining white and glittering not only his face but his hands his feet and even his body beamed through his garments with brightness they saw standing beside jesus in his splendor two men who had lived long before on the earth and were now living no more how the disciples knew them we are not told perhaps the knowledge flashed upon their minds given them by god or it may have been that as they listened to these two men they learned from their words who they were one was the great prophet moses who had led the israelites out of egypt and died on mount nebo the other was the prophet elijah who spoke bold words to the wicked king ahab and was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire both these men had passed from earth many hundred years before as the three disciples looked and listened they could hear what these two prophets of the old times were saying they were talking to jesus about his death which was to take place at jerusalem so these two great men of the past knew already what jesus had tried to tell his disciples and what they were so slow to believe that he was soon to die peter was always eager to speak and he spoke now though he scarcely understood what his words meant master he said this is a good place for us to stay in if you are willing i will make here three tents one for you one for moses and one for elijah he thought that the two prophets moses and elijah had come back to stay upon the earth and that if tents were made for them they would live upon that mountain while peter was speaking a bright and glorious cloud came over them all over jesus over the two prophets and over the three disciples who were filled with fear as they found the cloud around them and the greater fear came upon them as they heard the voice of god out of the cloud saying this is my son the beloved in whom i delight listen to him and as they heard these words knowing that god had spoken them they fell down upon their faces in great terror jesus came to them and touched them gently saying rise up and do not be afraid then they looked up the bright cloud had passed away the two prophets were no longer to be seen and jesus was standing alone over them some of the glory still remaining upon his face as they were walking down the mountain jesus said to his three disciples peter james and john tell no one what you have seen this night until the son of man has risen from the dead so much as they wished to tell their fellow disciples of this wonderful sight they obeyed their master and said not a word about it while jesus was still with them they said to jesus how is it that the teachers of the law say that the prophet elijah must come before the messiah king appears elijah does come answered jesus and he prepares the way for the coming of the king and i tell you that elijah has already come but the people have not known him they would not listen to him and have done to him as they pleased and just as it was with him so it will be with the son of man he shall also suffer at the hands of men then the disciples understood that jesus was speaking to them of john the baptist who like elijah had lived in the wilderness wore a mantle of skin and fed on desert food and who like elijah gave god's message to the people preparing the way for the coming of jesus christ end of chapter forty eight read by elijah fisher chapter forty nine of hurlbut's life of christ for young and old this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 49 The Boy with the Dumb Spirit 
when jesus and his three disciples came to the village at the foot of the mountain they found a great crowd gathered around the other nine disciples and some of the jewish teachers of the law the scribes talking with them very earnestly some of the glory of the last night still lingered upon the face of jesus and as the people looked upon him they were filled with wonder and bowed down before him out of the crowd came a man running whose face showed that he was in great trouble he knelt before jesus and cried out teacher i brought to you my son in whom is an evil spirit which has made him dumb i pray you have mercy on him and cure him for he is my only child often the spirit seizes him and dashes him down it makes him foam at the mouth and grind his teeth he is wasting away and i fear will die unless help comes to him i brought him here hoping to find you but you were away and i spoke to these men your disciples they tried to cast out the evil spirit but they could not now that you have come will you not help me o oh, you people who will not believe and who turn away from god said jesus how long must i be with you how long must i have patience with you bring your boy to me they brought the boy to jesus but no sooner did the boy see him than the wicked spirit threw him into a spasm he fell on the ground his body twitching and tearing and rolled about foaming at the mouth how long has he been like this asked jesus of the boy's father ever since he was a little child the man answered and it has many times thrown him into fire and into water almost killing him if you can do anything do take pity on us both and help us if i can said jesus taking up the man's word you not know that all things can be done for the one who believes i do believe cried out the father of the boy o oh, master help my lack of faith jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering around and he spoke to the evil spirit deaf and dumb spirit he said i command you at once come out of this boy and never again trouble him with a loud cry the evil spirit threw the boy into a violent spasm of pain and then left him the boy lay on the ground looking like a corpse in fact many who were standing near as they saw him said the boy is surely dead but jesus took his hand lifting him from the ground the boy stood up and walked away well free from the evil spirit and able to speak when jesus was alone with his disciples in the house they asked him why was it that we could not drive out the evil spirit from the boy it was because you have so little faith i tell you that if your faith were only the size of a grain of mustard seed you could say to this mountain move from this place to that and move it would for nothing would be impossible to you but he added an evil spirit of this kind is harder to drive away than most only by special prayer can it be cast out soon after this jesus left that place at the foot of the mountain and led his disciples toward the south they saw that he was now going in the direction of jerusalem and were quite sure that there he would set up his throne and kingdom but jesus knew what they were thinking of and he said to them listen carefully to my words the son of man is to be given into the hands of his enemies they shall kill him and three days after he has been killed he shall rise again to life but the disciples could not understand these words for they would not believe that he was to die and they were afraid to ask him what these sayings meant End of chapter 49 Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter 50 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 50 The Last Visit to Capernaum while jesus was passing through galilee for the last time he wished not to do in the land any more wonderful works or to give any further teachings in public he desired not to have crowds around him 
but to be alone with his disciples for there were many things to be told them before he should be taken away from them as they were on their way to capernaum which had been his home during the year before he saw that his disciples as they walked were having some dispute or quarrel he well knew what they were saying to each other for he knew all things but at the time he said nothing he came to capernaum for the first time followed by no crowd but with his twelve disciples only in the evening as they sat together in the house he said to them what was it that you were talking about to-day as we were walking on the road the disciples looked at each other a little ashamed and at first did not speak finally one of them said we were asking each other who of us should hold the first place in your kingdom although jesus had more than once told these men that he must suffer and die they did not believe it they saw that he was on his way toward jerusalem and like all the people who believed in him they thought that when he came to that city he would take his kingdom and rule and each of his disciples wanted a place for himself next to the throne the first place answered jesus if any of you has the will to be the first in the kingdom of heaven that one shall be the last of all and shall serve all the others a little child was playing near him for the children were never afraid of jesus and loved to be with him jesus reached out his hand took the child in his arms and held it close to him then he said to the disciples i tell you unless you change your spirit and become like little children you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven at all whoever of you will become humble and gentle like this little child not seeking great things for himself that is the one who shall be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and any one who helps even a little child to be one of my followers is helping me but if any one puts a snare or stumbling block in the way of one of these little ones to keep him from following me it would be better for that man to have a great milestone hung on his neck and to be thrown into the deep sea woe to the world on account of snares and hindrances keeping men away from god and from salvation there must be these snares and hindrances that cannot be helped but woe to the man who puts them in the way if your hand or foot becomes a snare to you keeping you from god you must cut it off and throw it away it is better for you to enter into life a cripple and with only one hand than with two hands or two feet to go away to everlasting death and if your eye would lead you to forsake god pluck it out and throw it away it is better for you to be saved having only one eye than to be lost having two eyes i tell you never despise or think lightly of one of these little ones for i say to you their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven then john one of the disciples said teacher we saw a man who is not one of your followers using your name to cast out evil spirits and we told him not to use your name since he is not with us do not forbid him said jesus there is no man who will do a mighty work in my name and be able also to speak against me whoever is not against us is for us why if any one will give you even a cup of water to drink because you belong to christ i tell you truly that man shall not fail of having a reward at that time jesus told his disciples how to treat those who had done them any wrong he said if your brother does wrong go to him and speak to him about it when you are alone with him if he listens to you then you have won your brother but if he will not listen take with you one or two others and talk with him again that there may be at least two witnesses in every case if he will not listen to these men speak to the church and if he refuses to listen to the church then have nothing more to do with him but treat him as a stranger as the people treat those who collect taxes for the romans i tell you my disciples that whatever you forbid on earth shall be forbidden by those in heaven and whatever you allow on earth shall be allowed by those in heaven i tell you another thing if two of you shall agree on earth upon anything that they ask in prayer it shall be done for them by my father who is in heaven for 
where two or three days have come together in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came up to Jesus and asked him a question. It was this, Master, how often should I forgive my brother when he has done me wrong? Shall it be as many as seven times? Seven times, said Jesus. No, I say seventy times seven. For the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to have his servants pay him the debts which they owed him. When he had begun to make up their accounts, one servant was brought before him who owed him more than a million dollars. He could not pay his debt, and his master ordered that he should be sold, and his wife and children with him, and everything that he had, toward the payment of his debt. The servant fell down upon his face before him, and said, Only have patience with me, my lord, and I will pay it all. His master knew that he could never pay so great a debt. He felt a pity for him, and let him go free, forgiving him all that he owed. But as he was going away, that servant met one of his fellow-servants, who owed him a small debt, only about fifteen dollars. He took him by the throat and said, Pay me what you owe me. The man threw himself on the ground and begged for mercy, crying out, Have patience with me. Wait a little while, and I will pay all that I owe you. But he refused to have mercy. He took him into the court and had him put in prison until he should pay the debt. When the other servants saw him sending this man to prison, they felt troubled and told the king what he had done. At this the king became very angry. He sent for that cruel servant and said to him, You wicked servant, when you asked me for mercy, I gave to you all your great debt and let you go free. Should not you also have shown the same kindness to your fellow servant that I showed you? Then his master, being very angry, handed him over to the jailer to be kept in a dungeon until he should pay the whole debt. So also will my father in heaven do to you, unless you forgive your brother with all your heart. While Jesus was at this time in Capernaum, the officer who collected from the Jews the tax for the temple came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay the temple tax? Yes, answered Peter. But when he went into the house, before he could speak, Jesus said to him, Tell me, Simon, from whom do the kings of this world take taxes? From their sons, or from foreigners? From foreigners, answered Peter. Then their own people are free from being taxed, are they not? We are the sons of God, and we should be free from the tax of the house of God. However, in order not to displease them, do you go to the sea, throw in a hook, and take the first fish that comes up, open its mouth, and you will find in it a piece of silver money. Take that and give it to the tax collectors for you and me. End of chapter 50 Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter 51 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut Chapter 51 Goodbye to Galilee While Jesus was still in Capernaum, the fall of the year came on, and with it the time drew near for the Jewish Feast of Tents, or Feast of Tabernacles. In the Bible the word tabernacles always means tents. This feast was called the Feast of the Tents, because every year the people who went up to Jerusalem to attend it lived for a week in little tents or huts made of green branches, to keep in mind the forty years long before, when after coming out of Egypt, the Israelites lived in the desert in tents, moving from place to place. The younger brothers of Jesus, the sons of Joseph and Mary, heard that Jesus was in Capernaum, and they came to see him. At this time these brothers of Jesus did not believe in him as their king and savior, although afterward they were among his followers. These men said to Jesus, Why do you not go to Judea and Jerusalem and let your disciples see there what you can do? No one who wishes to be known stays in a place apart from the people. Since you can do these great works, you should show yourself to the world. 
my time said jesus has not come yet but your time is always here the world is not against you but it is against me because i speak against its evil deeds go yourselves up to the feast i am not going as yet up to the feast because my time has not yet come jesus did not wish to have as his companions at the feast who did not believe in him even though they were his brothers so while his brothers went on to jerusalem he stayed a little longer in galilee before he left the city of capernaum he gave one last call and warning to its people and those in the cities nearby he spoke to those who lived in chorazin the town only a few miles from capernaum and those in bethsaida five miles away at the head of the lake he said to these cities woe unto you Terzin, and woe to you bethsaida if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in the cities of tyre and sidon long before this time they would have turned from sin to god weeping in rough garments with ashes on their heads i tell you that when god comes to judge the lands it will be harder for chorzan and bethsaida than for tyre and sidon and you o capernaum shall you be lifted up to heaven no you will seek down to death for if the great works that were done in you had been done in sodom that city would have lasted until to-day but i say to you it will be easier for sodom in god's day of judgment than for you o capernaum at the time jesus spoke these words also i thank thee o father lord of heaven and earth for hiding these things from the wise and the learned and for making them known to those who are childlike in spirit yes father i praise thee that this has been the way that thou hast chosen all the power has been given to me by the father and no one can fully know the son except the father and no one fully knows the father except the son and he to whom the son will make him known come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden with your troubles and i will give you rest take upon you the yoke that i bear and learn from me how to live for i am gentle and low-minded and you shall find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my loads is light with these words jesus left capernaum and galilee for the last time end of chapter fifty one read by elijah fisher chapter fifty two of hurlbut's life of christ for young and old this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 52 Passing Through Samaria. After most of these who were going up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tents had left Capernaum, Jesus began his journey with his disciples. All who saw him going toward Jerusalem, and even his disciples, thought that he was now surely on his way to take his throne and rule the people as king of israel just as they were starting a man who was one of the teachers of law came to jesus and said master i will follow you wherever you may go he thought that by following jesus he might have some high place in his kingdom but jesus saw that this man was following him only for gain he said to him you will gain nothing by following me the foxes have holes and the wild birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has not a place where he can lay his head. To the method man Jesus said, Follow me. The man answered, First let me go bury at my father. Jesus said to this man, Let those who are dead bury their dead, but do you go and spread everywhere the news of the kingdom of God. Jesus meant by this that such matters as the burial of the dead could be cared for by others even though they did not have a knowledge of the truth which gives life but jesus wanted this man to go at once and preach his gospel there was another man who said to jesus i will follow you but let me first go and say good-bye to my friends at my home whoever looks back 
answered Jesus, after he has put his hand to the plow, and is of no use for the kingdom of God. For his work, Jesus wanted men who were single-hearted, giving up all, that they might follow and serve him. On his journey to Jerusalem, Jesus did not take the road down the Jordan Valley, the way it usually followed. He made up his mind this time to go through Samaria, perhaps because he did not wish to have a crowd of people with him, and few of the Jews went to Jerusalem by way of Samaria. As he drew near a Samaritan village, he sent some of his disciples to find in it a lodging place. But the Samaritan people would not allow Jesus and his disciples to come into their village, because they saw that they were Jews on their way to Jerusalem. The Samaritans and the Jews hated each other, and would not show kindness to one another. James and John, two of his disciples, were exceedingly angry at these people, who would shut out their master. They said to him, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven, as the prophet Elijah did, and burn up that wicked village? But Jesus said to them, Your spirit is not right. I did not come to destroy the lives of men, but to save them. Let us go to some other village. While he was still on the border of Galilee and Samaria, as he was going into a village, he met ten men who had the terrible disease of leprosy. They stood at a distance, for lepers were not allowed to come near people, and they cried out aloud, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Go, answered Jesus, and show yourselves to the priests. And in the temple was a room where a man went who had any disease like leprosy, with a breaking out upon his sin. At this room he was kept for a time, and it was found that his disease was not leprosy. After certain offerings and washings, he was allowed to go home and be among men. Those men stared for their temple, those who were Jews, for the temple in Jerusalem, any that were Samaritans, for their temple on Mount Gerizim, near the city of Sheshem. As they went, and by going, showed their faith in Jesus, they found all at once that their leprosy was gone, and they were entirely well. Nine of these ten men, after they were cured, went on their way toward the temple. But one of them, when he found that he was a leper no longer, stopped with a loud voice, praised God, and ran to Jesus' feet, and fell on his face before him, giving him thanks for this cure. This man was a Samaritan. Where there not ten men cured, said Jesus, but where are the nine? Was there only one to turn back and give thanks to God, and that one a stranger? And Jesus said to this grateful Samaritan, Rise up, and go your way. Your faith has made you well. End of chapter 52 Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter 53 of Herbert's Life of Christ For Young and Old This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Maria Fatima da Silva Herbert's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Herbert The Scribe's Question and Mary's Choice While Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, one of the teachers of the law, whom the Jews called scribes, came to him with a question. These Jewish scribes were everywhere enemies of Jesus and were continually asking him questions, not that they might learn, but that in some way they might give him trouble. This scribe said to Jesus, Teacher, what shall I do that I may have the life everlasting? What is said in God's law, answered Jesus, what do you read there? He answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and you must love your neighbor as yourself. That is a right answer, said Jesus. Do that and you shall live. But the scribe, wishing to make an excuse for himself, 
and thinking to puzzle Jesus, said, But who is my neighbor? Then Jesus told to this man the parable or story of the Good Samaritan. There was once a man, said Jesus, who was going down by a lonely road from Jerusalem to Jericho. The robbers who hide among the mountains in that region rushed at this man, stripped him of everything and beat him near to death, then ran away and left him almost dead on the roadside. It happened that a priest was going down the same road. He saw the man lying there, but instead of coming to help him, walked past him on the other side of the road. Then a Levite, one of those who helped the priests in the services of the temple, came to that place, and he too went by on the other side, carefully keeping away from the suffering man. But soon after, a Samaritan, one of those people whom all the Jews hate and despise, came down the same road. This man, when he found the poor man lying in the road, got off from the ass on which he was riding and stood over the man. He felt a pity for the sufferer and put bandages on his wounds after pouring into them a little oil and wine. Then he lifted up the man and carefully placed him on his own ass and walking by his side brought him to an inn and cared for him all that night. On the next morning he took out from his purse two pieces of silver, handed them to the innkeeper and said to him, Look after this man until he is well, and if you spend more than this, I will repay it to you when I come this way again. Now, asked Jesus, which one of these three men, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, do you think showed himself a true neighbor to the poor fellow who fell among the robbers? The scribe answered, the one who showed kindness to him. Jesus said to him, Then go and do as this man did. He meant to show the scribe that our neighbor is the one who most needs our help, whoever he may be. When Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, he did not at once enter the city and find a lodging place within its walls, for he knew well that it was filled with his enemies, and that the priests and rulers would try to seize him and put him to death. He expected after some months to die at Jerusalem, as he had so many times told his disciples, although they could not believe it. But the time for his death had not yet come. For a home while attending the Feast of Tents, he went to a village about two miles from Jerusalem, on the east of the Mount of Olives. This village was called Bethany, and in it, was living a family, all of whom were strong friends of Jesus, Martha, her sister Mary, and their younger brother, Lazarus. With this family, he stayed while he was visiting Jerusalem. Martha was the older sister and the head of the house. She gave Jesus a hearty welcome and made herself busy in attending to his needs. But Mary, her younger sister, left everything and seated herself at the feet of the Lord, eager to listen to his words. Martha, somewhat worried by her many cares, especially making ready a dinner for Jesus, was not pleased at her sister's conduct. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, do you think it right for my sister to leave all the work to me? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, replied the Lord, you are anxious and trouble yourself about a great many things. Only one thing is really needful. Mary has chosen the best dish, and she will not be dragged away from it. Jesus meant to say that Martha need not prepare dinner with many dishes, for he needed only a simple meal, and that Mary had chosen well, instead of food, the words that he was speaking, which were really a feast to her soul. At one time Jesus was praying in a certain place. It may have been on the Mount of Olives, between Bethany and Jerusalem, for Jesus went there often to pray. When his prayer was over, the disciples came to him and said, Master, John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. Will you not also give us a prayer that we may use? 
Jesus said to them, I will give you this prayer. When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. Jesus also gave to his disciples a parable or story about earnestness in prayer. He said, Suppose that one of you who has a friend should go to his house in the middle of the night and should knock at his door loud enough to wake him from his sleep and should say to him, Friend, please do get up and let me have three loaves of bread. A friend of mine has suddenly come to my house and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose the other should answer him from inside the door. Don't bother me. The door is locked and I am in bed with my children. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give you anything merely because you are a friend of his, if you keep on knocking long enough, he will at last rise and give you whatever you want, because you persevere in seeking after it. So, I say to you, ask, and the gift shall be yours. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He that seeks, finds. And to him that knocks, the door shall be opened. Is there a father among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? If he is asked for a fish, will he give his son a snake? Or if asked for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, even not as good as you should be, are willing to give good things to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give this Holy Spirit to his children, the task him. End of the scribe's question and Mary's choice. Chapter 54 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Beth Leary. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 54 Jesus at the Feast of Tents. At the time when Jesus came to Jerusalem, the Feast of Tents was half over. Many had been looking for him, for all through the land he was talked about. At the feast, the people were saying, Where is he? Has he come up to the feast? Some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he cannot be a good man, for he is leading the people away from the law of Moses. But no one spoke freely about him for fear of the rulers and the people of Jerusalem, whose minds had been set against Jesus by the priests and the scribes, or teachers of the law. From his home in Bethany at Martha's house, Jesus came quietly into the temple and began teaching the people who gathered there during the feast, going out at evening to Bethany. All who heard him wondered at his words, and every day the crowds around him grew. People said to each other, How did this man get all his knowledge? He has never studied in the college of the scribes. My teaching, said Jesus in answer, is not my own, but it comes from him who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do God's will will know whether I speak in God's name or whether I am talking in my own name. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you honestly tries to keep the law. If you did try to keep the law, you would not try to kill me. The crowd replied to Jesus, You are crazy. Who is trying to kill you? But Jesus knew that he was speaking the truth, for he knew what was in the minds of the rulers and of many in Jerusalem. He said to the crowd, I will be with you only a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am going, you cannot come. Where is this man going, said the Jews, that we cannot find him? Is he going among our people in foreign lands to teach the foreigners? What does he mean by words like these? 
Jesus meant that after they should kill him and he should rise from the tomb and live again, he was going back to his home in heaven, a place to which they could never come. The last and greatest day of the Feast of Tents came. On that day they brought water into the temple and poured it out amid great rejoicing, calling to mind how God had given water from the rock to the Israelites in the desert. In the midst of the pouring out of the water, Jesus cried with a very loud voice so that all heard him. If anyone is thirsty, he said, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, out of him shall flow rivers of living water. Some of the people, when they heard this, said, This must be really the prophet who is to come. Others said, This is the Christ, the King of Israel. But there were those who said, No, this cannot be Christ the King, for this man comes from Galilee, and the Bible says that Christ is to come from the line of King David and from David's town of Bethlehem. These people knew that Jesus came to them from Galilee, but they did not know that he had been born in Bethlehem and belonged to the royal line of David. They were divided over Jesus. Some thought that he was their promised king, while others wanted to seize him as a teacher of falsehood. The rulers sent out officers to make him their prisoner, but somehow no man dared to lay hands upon him. When the officers came back to the chief priests and leading men, they were asked, Why did you not bring this man with you? The officers answered, No man ever spoke as this man speaks. What? Has this man led you astray too? said the rulers. Have any of the leading men or the Pharisees believed in him? As for this crowd who know nothing of the law, they are of no account. Nicodemus, that one of the rulers who a year before had come by night to talk with Jesus, said to them, Surely our law does not allow any man to be treated as guilty before hearing what he has to say and finding out what he has done. Are you too from Galilee, like all the followers of this man? They answered him. Search, and you will find that no prophet ever comes from Galilee. In the evening, all the people went to their homes, and Jesus went over the Mount of Olives to his friends at Bethany. End of chapter 54、chapter、55 Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman. Hurlbut, Chapter Fifty Five, Jesus and the Sinful Woman. After the Feast of Tents, Jesus stayed near Jerusalem, making his home in Bethany, for nearly two months until another feast came, the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple. About two hundred years before that time, the Temple had been held by enemies who had stopped the services. Had set up images in the building, and had done many things to make it vile. At last, the enemies were driven away, and then the Jews made the temple clean again, destroyed the images, and began once more the regular service. After this, every year they kept the day of the reopening of the temple as the feast of the dedication. At this, the temple was lighted up every night very brightly, and on that account. The feast was also called the Feast of Lights. During the days of his stay, Jesus went off into the temple and sat down in a room called the Court of the Women, because on one side of it was a gallery where the women worshipped, looking down on the services at the altar. It was also called the Treasury, on account of the gift boxes on its walls, where people dropped in their money for the poor and for the support of the temple. In this court, which was very large and open to the sky, without a roof, the Jewish teachers held their classes for the study of the law, and many came to Jesus to listen to his words. One morning, the teaching of Jesus was interrupted by a noise in the court. Some of the scribes and Pharisees, who were enemies of Jesus, 
planned to get him into trouble with the Roman rulers. They came, dragging in a poor woman who had done a wicked deed, and bringing her forward directly in front of Jesus. Teacher, they said, this woman was caught in a wicked act. Now, Moses in the law commands that any person committing that crime shall be stoned to death. But what do you say should be done with her? Jesus very well knew they had brought this question to him, hoping, whatever he said, to make trouble for him. If he should say, let her go free, they would declare that Jesus was a breaker of the law and cared nothing for crimes. If, on the other hand, he said, let her be punished, they could say to the Roman rulers, this man is acting as a judge and claims to be the king of Israel, and this might cause the Romans to put him to death. So, whatever Jesus might say, they could find some reason to accuse him. But Jesus seemed to pay no attention to their words. He stooped down and began to write with his finger on the floor. But as they kept on asking him the same question, finally he rose up, looked his enemies full in the face, and said, Let the one among you who has never done wrong throw the first stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing with his finger. They stood silent for some time, and then began quietly to go away, the oldest men first, and the younger men later. After a while, Jesus looked up and saw the woman standing alone before him. He rose up and said, Woman, where are those men? Does no man say that you are guilty? She answered him, No man, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I call you guilty. Go away and never sin again. Then Jesus went on with his teaching, which had been stopped by the bringing in of the woman by his enemies. He said, I am the light of the whole world. He who follows me and obeys my words will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Many other things Jesus said to the people at that time, and some of those who heard him began to believe that he was a teacher come from God. To those who believed, he said, If you stand faithful to my words, you are truly my followers, and you shall understand the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What do you mean by those words? You shall be made free, said the people. We are sprung from Abraham, and have never been slaves. How can we be made free? In very truth, I tell you, answered Jesus, every one who sins is a slave. Now the slave does not stay in the home always, but the son stays, for it is his home, and he has a right to be there. So if the Son of the Heavenly Father sets you free from sin, ye will be free indeed. As Jesus went on speaking, the people who listened became very angry. At last he said, Your great father Abraham longed to see the day when I should come to the earth, and he saw it coming and it made him glad. Why, the Jews said, you are not fifty years old, and do you say that Abraham saw you? I tell you truly, answered Jesus, before Abraham was born, I was living. At this, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself from them and left the temple. End of chapter 55 Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 56 of Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hurlbut's Life of Christ for Young and Old by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Chapter 56. The Blind Man at the Pool of Siloam. On a Sabbath morning, which was not Sunday but Saturday, the Jewish day of rest and church-going, Jesus and his disciples were on their way to the service in the temple, when they passed a blind man. They had seen this man before, and knew that he had been blind all his life. 
he had come into the world without eyesight to the great sorrow of his father and mother and he lived upon the little coins that people gave him as they were on their way to the temple the jews believed that every disease was caused by some act of sin that if a man became ill it was because he had done some wicked deed and was being punished for it and if a child was born blind or dumb or crippled it must have been because either its father or mother had sinned against god's law some of the scribes who were the teachers of the law said that each soul lived many times on the earth that when a man died his soul went into a body that was born at that moment and if the new-born baby was blind or diseased it was because it had done wrong in some life before that one none of these things are believed now since christ has taught men but they were held by nearly all people while jesus was on the earth as the disciples were passing by this blind man one of them said to jesus teacher whose sin was it that caused this man to be born was it the fault of his parents or was it his own fault it was through no fault of his nor his father or mother that this man was born blind answered jesus it was that god might show a wonderful work in him while daylight lasts we must be doing god's work the night will soon come when we can work no longer as long as i am in the world i am the light of the world and give light to men as he said this he spat on the ground and mixed the spittle with dust making it into mud and smeared it on the man's eyes he said to the blind man now go down to the pool of siloam and wash the pool of siloam was a large tank or reservoir on the southeast of the city where the valley of the brook kedron and the valley of himon meet to go to that place the blind man with two blotches of mud on his face must walk across the city of jerusalem passing all the crowds on their way to worship he went down to the pool of siloam climbed down its steps to the water and washed the mud from his face in a moment his white sightless eyes flashed with a new light he looked up and for the first time in all his life he could see as he went to his father's house everybody who saw him noticed how differently he looked all had known him as a blind man groping his way to the place where he used to sit as a beggar the people asked each other is this the same blind man that begged in the street some said yes this is the same man but others said no this cannot be the man but he is one who looks somewhat like him he said i am the same man then how did you get your sight they asked the man whom they called jesus he answered made some un and put it on my eyes and said go to siloam and wash your eyes so i went and washed them and my sight came to me where is this man who cured you they asked i don't know he answered they took the man who had been blind to the pharisees who were the leaders of the people we have seen that the pharisees were always enemies to jesus so the pharisees asked him to tell again how he had gained his sight and he told him the man named jesus smeared some mud on my eyes and i washed them and now i can see some of the pharisees said this man jesus cannot be from god because he does not keep the sabbath the scribes had made a rule that mixing up mud on the sabbath day was working that carrying it from one place to another was bearing a load and that to give any treatment to a sick man on the sabbath unless it was necessary to save his life was sabbath breaking so to their eyes jesus in curing the blind man had broken the sabbath rules in more than one way but some others said how can a bad man do such wonderful works is not this work of cure a sign that god is with him so there were two parties among them in their opinion about jesus they asked the blind man again what do you say of this man who has opened your eyes i said that he is a prophet from god answered the man many of the jews however would not believe that this man had been born blind and had gained his sight until they sent for his father and mother 
is this your son they asked the son who you say was born blind how is it that now he can see this is our son the, his parents answered and he was born blind of that we are sure but how is it that he can see now we do not know nor do we know who opened his eyes ask him he is old enough he can speak for himself his parents spoke in this way because they were afraid of the jews for the rulers had agreed that any one who said that jesus was the christ should be turned out of the church that was why they had said he is old enough ask him so the pharisees again sent for the man who had been blind and said to him give god all the praise for your sight we know that this jesus is a bad man i know nothing about his being a bad man one thing i do know that once i was blind and now i can see what did he do to you they asked how did he open your eyes i have told you all about it already he replied and it seems you do not listen why do you want to hear it again do you intend to be his disciples then they were in a rage at him and said you may be his disciple but we are disciples of moses and we obey his laws we know that god spoke to moses but we do not know where this fellow comes from well this is very strange answered the man you do not know where he comes from and yet he has opened my eyes we know that god does not listen to bad men but if any man is god-fearing and does god's will that man god will hear since the world began no one ever heard before of a man that could open the eyes of one born blind if this jesus were not of god he could do nothing are you trying to teach us they answered you who were born a sinner then they turned him out of the church they forbid him to sit in the meetings or go into the temple and after that none of them would so much as speak to him jesus heard that he had been put out of the church he sought him out and when he had found him he asked do you believe in the son of man tell me who he is said the man and i will believe in him you have seen him answered jesus and it is he who is now speaking to you the man said i do believe lord and he fell on his face before him and jesus said i came into the world to put men to this test in order that those who cannot see and know they are blind as this man was might be made to see and that those who think they could see should remain blind some of the pharisees who heard this knew that it was a rebuke to them because they failed to see in jesus one sent from god they said then we are blind too if you were really blind said jesus then you would have no sin to answer for but as it is you say we can see and so you, your sin remains against you again the jews were divided over the words of jesus some said he is crazy why listen to him but others said these are not the words of a crazy man can a cr man who is crazy open the eyes of a blind man End of chapter 56 Read by Elijah Fisher